so uh, Okay, folks, we are live. Let me just start with a quick introduction. Uh, this is the second meeting of the California State Bar uh, Malpractice Insurance Working Group, uh, and I am Randy Miller and chair of that group. We are live now on a webcast. We will be throughout the day unless Tom, our AV videographer, tells me otherwise. So we will be live for um, perhaps participation. Uh, by others. So let me first of all welcome all the committee members back today. I know there's been a lot of work in between our first session and today. Uh, we are going to move along fairly quickly. You'll hear and you know from the agenda and materials that today we're going to hear from the mandatory insurance committee and the wing of that that is going to make a presentation through speakers and discussion is uh, what we're calling the open market portion of that. And uh, they have a bunch of speakers. I will, in essence, turn it over to Heather as the chair of that committee and have her take us through the paces of the uh, group discussion uh, and participation, and we'll have open discussion uh, later on. And we're also gonna start out with, and uh, Heather will make the introduction with Judge Paul Hain, who is, in my view, probably has the foremost appreciation of the history of these issues as they've bounced along in California for the last 40 years or so now. Uh, we uh, have uh, room for public comment, but we're going to do that at 2 p.m. Is there anybody here who cannot be available at 2 p.m. who wants to participate in public comment? If you can't, let me know now. Great, great. Hearing nothing, then we'll have all the public comment at 2 p.m. We're going to uh, limit the public comment to three minutes per speaker uh, so uh, we can move on with our agenda. But we welcome that participation, of course. So uh, Linda and I have uh, created uh, an agenda for today. Hopefully you've looked at all those materials. It's primarily going to consist of Heather and her uh, committee to make the presentation with respect to open market. Is there anything anybody wants to say before we get underway with the open market committee? Anything else? Okay, good. I note that we have uh, uh, members attending uh, in, in the back and we welcome you here today. So anything else, Linda, that you want to say to start us off? Okay. Uh, if you looked at the agenda materials, we have a, a, a packed uh, set of issues to, to deal with throughout the day. There will be time for us to participate in group discussions. There will be time for us to stretch our legs and get some coffee, uh, but we'll pace us along at a, at a fairly robust uh, pace throughout the day. So, Heather, can I turn it over to you now to introduce uh, your speakers? And uh, Heather knows this because she does a lot of this, but those of you who aren't used to being in a big room like this, in front of you is a speaker. If you push the button uh, that says push, and that little green light in the middle lights up, that means your mic is live and you can speak and you'll be heard and you'll be your voice will be broadcast. When you stop talking, it would be great that you could mute yourself by pushing that button again. You'll see the light go off. That way we won't be able to, we won't pick up all the other uh, ambient noise in, in the room. So uh, with that, uh, Heather Rosen. Thank you. Um, well, our uh, subgroup is very excited to put on the presentations today. We anticipate that they will be quite informative and hopefully help us uh, make our decisions in terms of our ultimate reg uh, recommendations to the State Bar and ultimately to the Legislature and Supreme Court. Um, our subgroup, and we have conducted our discussions through um, open meetings uh, since the time of the last uh, overall committee meeting, is myself, um, Scott Barabesh, um, Glenn Olson, Mark Abelson, and Connie Broussard. Is Connie here? No. Okay, so Connie should be arriving, but it is the five of us. And uh, as Randy stated, our, the job of our five-person group was to put on two sessions 
about different models of mandatory malpractice insurance. And we divided it up into two subsets. Number one, uh, the open market model, which is a model where um, insurers would be free to enter the California market and attorneys would purchase insurance from the different people who offer insurance on the California market. And then the fund model, and the fund model is similar as I understand it to what's done in Oregon and what's done in Canada as well as other foreign jurisdictions. Randy gave us an excellent overview of that during the first meeting that we had as a working group. Um, so today we are focusing on the open market model, and I believe November 9th is the second presentation of our working group, and uh, Glenn and Mark will be in charge of that and they will be presenting on the fund model. So this is part one of a two-part series by our working group, today, June 4th, and then on November 9th. Um, so we uh, decided that we would present to you um, three, four different groupings today, and I'll review it very, very quickly so we can turn it over to Judge Colhane in short order. We're, we're very pleased to have him here today. But we decided that it was a good idea, and, and Randy was the one who made this connection, so I, I credit him with it entirely. Uh, it was a good idea to present the background of the State Bar's uh, Insurance Committee, which was known as Copley, it's now disbanded. Uh, Judge Colhane is the former co-chair of that, Randy is the former chair of that. And Judge Colhane is going to talk about the entire background of this committee at the State Bar, and previous efforts of the State Bar and California to study mandatory malpractice insurance. Uh, then we are going to go into an hour and a half panel discussion, and I'm very excited about this as well. Uh, we have representatives from two different states, uh, Diane Minnick from the Idaho State Bar and Jean Leverty from the State Bar of Nevada, both who have uh, decided and either implemented or begun to implement mandatory malpractice insurance. So that's Idaho and Nevada. Again, Randy gave that overview um, last time. And, and luckily, Diane and Jean, as I've learned, are, are colleagues and friends, and they uh, recommended the inclusion of Chris Newbold, who is the Executive Vice President with ALPS Lawyers Malpractice Insurance. So, and, and as I understand it, Diane and Jean have worked with Chris. So the three of them will be giving a panel presentation um, along with Q&A for the next hour and a half from 10.45 until our brief lunch break at 12.15. Several people have asked about lunch. Uh, we're giving you 15 minutes. It's an aggressive schedule today indeed. Um, Scott Barabesh then has uh, arranged for Bob Hille. Is that the correct pronunciation? Bob Hille. Bob Hille um, from the New Jersey State Bar Association to come in. And they considered mandatory malpractice insurance and decided not to implement mandatory malpractice insurance. He will be appearing via webinar. And then finally, at 1.15, we have another very exciting panel to present to you. It's Professor Andrew Cusera and Cynthia Chandler. And they will specifically be talking about attorneys who engage in pro bono and low bono practice. Um, these are small firm solo practitioners, many of them, though not all of them, from rural areas. And the idea is to present an overview of the potential impact of the imposition of mandatory malpractice insurance on the um, on the uh, this particular demographic of attorney. This, of course, re of course relates to access to justice issues. And thank you to Kathy Sargent for uh, particularly recommending uh, Cindy. Uh, Chandler, who we will introduce later. Then, as Aunt Randy indicated, we will go into public comment. I know that you're very excited and um, pleased to hear any and all public comment. The public is a very important part of this process. And then we will go straight into our discussion. Importantly, though, um, to the extent that our committee members today do have questions uh, during the presentations, please raise your hand and ask them during the presentations. Um, because we will not have all the speakers here through 4 p.m. So if you don't ask your questions, you will lose these speakers who have literally flown from, you know, across the country to be with us here today. Well, I guess Idaho and, and Nevada aren't really across the country, but you know, some <laughs> different states. Um, so please raise your hand and um, we'll make sure to take those questions. So that's the overview of today. Any questions on the overview? Okay. So we'll start right with uh, um, Judge Colhane. He's sitting right there, I see him. And I had the pleasure of meeting him just recently, a couple of weeks ago, at a Sacramento 
uh, community legal event. And let me just give you his background very briefly. Uh, by way of history, he actually was a partner at a Sacramento law firm for 32 years. I read this from your bio, hopefully that's correct. Uh, handling uh, trials and appeals, engaged basically in complex litigation, um, including, as I understand it, uh, litigation in the professional liability arena. Um, he also was the vice president of the State Bar. So Judge Culhane has a deep history with the State Bar of California, like many people in this room. Um, as I understand it, he was also the chair of Copley, the co-chair of Copley, which was the, uh, man the, the committee at the State Bar that's, that um, Randy can describe it better than I, and Judge Culhane will certainly describe it, but the committee that uh, studied and ultimately recommended a professional liability insurance program for the State Bar. Um, most critically, um, while he was on Copley, I understand that there was a study of mandatory malpractice insurance, which he will share with you. Uh, Judge Culhane was elected to the bench in 2008. In 2015, he was selected as the presiding judge of the Sacramento Superior Court. Um, he also has been a teacher at the University of Pacific McGeorge School of Law, as I understand it, for 40 years. Is that right? This, tonight is 41 years. 41 years. Congratulations on that. And um, Judge Culhane has so many <coughs> accolades that it would be uh, take up too much time to list them all. But he has received the Judicial Council Distinguished Service Award, and he has served on many, many Judicial Council committees. So he also brings the Judicial Council perspective today. Uh, Judge Culhane, we are very pleased to have you here today, and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Oh, you got to push the button. Please. Thank you, Joe. All right, well, uh, thank you for having me. My name is Kevin Colhane, and uh, you know, as I look around the room, uh, uh, there's many people that you know I've known in other iterations and other lives that are present here. I don't know how long Mark Abelson and I have known each other, but longer than either one of us can remember. And I saw Dick O'Regan sitting behind me. And, uh, of course, I work with uh, Judge Perkins every day. I go up and he, I ask him questions, and he tells me how to do it right most of the time. But, the way it goes, uh, Joanna's here, Sergeant's here from Lawyers Mutual. Uh, and of course, I've known Randy, I don't know how long, uh, at least 20 years, I think. Well, just a few years ago when we were in our 20s. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, thank you for having me once again. Uh, uh, I, I uh, finished, uh, finished law school and started practicing with a firm and teaching uh, at McGeorge in Sacramento, and um, uh, in 1986, I don't re honestly remember how it happened, but uh, I was elected as a member of the Board of Governors of the State Bar. In those days, you were elected from uh, districts, uh, and so my district was District 2, 14 counties, sort of Sacramento along Highway 80, uh, down here to San Francisco, but jumping over San Francisco, actually Marin County was in my district, but San Francisco was not. And uh, uh, so I served on the Board of Governors from 86 to 89, uh, and uh, that's only material because uh, uh, this was a uh, time where I pretty quickly found myself uh, involved uh, in uh, complete top to bottom revamping of the disciplinary structure of the State Bar here in California. And this is going to lead to the insurance that we're here to talk about. Uh, fundamentally, it took three years I became chair of the discipline committee. Uh, I, I would say that the effort was to professionalize that process. That sort of captured everything we did. In those days, a disciplinary case was heard by a volunteer lawyer in their office whenever they could kind of get around to it wasn't very credible as a consumer protection agency. Uh, and uh, the uh, San Francisco Chronicle had just finished a long series called The Brotherhood, about 5,000 discipline cases that had sat untouched for up to 10 years in the closet that I learned was the tank. I actually replaced uh, Alan, one of your partners, because uh, uh, I was, Joe Gray was on the board of governors, became a judge, and I was the new Joe Gray. He went out and I came in. And uh, when I got elected to the board, I was uh, 31 years old. Uh, it was more than half my life ago, so it's not material to much of what you think today. Uh, uh, the young lawyer representative on the board was older than me. Uh, and the second young lawyer 
to put it in context with Stuart Rice, who today is the president of CJA. He came kind of right when I was going out the door, just a little kid, basically, uh, in the law. But anyway, uh, uh, this involved establishing the Office of Trial Counsel as a real life sort of quasi-prosecutorial agency. Uh, it involved establishing a real life court. I interviewed every member of the original Supreme uh, State Bar Court and the appellate panel had to recommend names to the Chief Justice for the first six judges and then the three appellate judges. Uh, partly material to much of what has happened in the State Bar since, uh, very few people remember that one of those appellate judges had to be a non-lawyer. And we got a terrific one. Uh, I had to go to every bar association in California to get them to support the amount of dues that were going to get paid for that. I did it. They did. They all came to Sacramento uh, and uh, supported the revamping, supported taxing themselves, supporting public participation everywhere uh, in the new uh, system. And the backlog was eliminated in a couple years. Uh, and I have the newspaper articles to prove it. And everything was brought current. I only mention that because I'm sitting in a building where sometimes you hear, well, uh, you know, the trade association and regulatory don't go together. Uh, that die has been cast. From my own personal perspective, it's not true. Because I saw the bars come to Sacramento and support. It actually was the legislature that took away the non the non uh, public judge, the non lawyer judge. Uh, so all that going on, it uh, took three years to do. There were two bills. Uh, one was Bob Presley's. He had the structure. Willie Brown carried the money bill to fund all this. A huge undertaking. And uh, uh, I remember that at the tail end, and I promised to get the insurance in 20 seconds, uh, one of the authors, uh, the speaker, came to me and said, uh, the last day, uh, I think that the legislature ought to appoint some of these judges namely me, and the Speaker Pro Tem, and the Governor. And um, it led to a discussion that went on all night in Capitol Park with every member of the Board of Governors, and it put me at the Bull Market, Allen, uh, with the Speaker the next morning, telling that was not going to happen. This was a judicial branch function, and we'd rather just let it go uh, than to do it wrong. Ten years later, of course, uh, the bar, when, when, one, when a legislator wanted to have this a staffer who had killed his wife admitted to the bar and the public judge wrote the opinion saying no. That was the end of the public judge. Hmm. Went all the way to the California Supreme Court, I lost four to three on whether that was a violation of separation of powers or not. While this discipline restructuring, which was really the focus of my life, was going on, we were also looking at uh, uninsured losses uh, and the public protection aspects of insurability and, and uh, availability of insurance is part and parcel of the regulatory model. Uh, and uh, uh, at the time, there were only two carriers. So I don't know how many people in this room will remember this, but there were two carriers writing malpractice coverage in California uh, uh, at, at the time. Uh, one was Lawyers Mutual. Uh, which came out of the Barcal program originally, and the other was home, that Dick worked for. Uh, there were special, you know, you could buy it at Lloyd's if you were a huge firm. Uh, it's not really insurance, as you all know, but you could get insured that way. Uh, but there were only two, so it was a very hard market. Prices were, you know, prohibited uh, for uh, uh, various types of practice and various types of lawyers. Uh, so that uh, put us into a discussion as part of the discipline or regulatory structure reform as to how to uh, uh, try to provide a better model for consumer protection at the insurance end, because this is really where the interaction between clients and lawyers happen. Uh, and uh, it turned out, and as you saw in one of the footnotes to the material, a large study of this had been done in 75 and 76 looking at responses to a hard insurance market. That was way before my time uh, at 
the Board of Governors. Uh, but uh, uh, there were, was a committee put together uh, uh, on mandatory insurance, commission actually, on mandatory malpractice insurance. I want to say this is about 1987, uh, right in the middle of the discipline revamp, and as part of the discipline revamp. Pretty high, uh, for me, a pretty high uh, powered commission. Uh, Bob Chick was there, was on it from Lawyers Mutual. Les Rawls was there from the Oregon Plan. Uh, folks from uh, various bars, committees, uh, uh, insurers, folks that you know have been in the insurance markets uh, uh, for many years. Uh, 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 Jed Hurley, who some of you will remember, was uh, probably the most uh, knowledgeable individual. He's deceased now that I ever met on claims frequency and severity and markets and actuarial data and uh, uh, the effort and there was a legislation and the background here is that all the legislators that touched this were from Sacramento. Uh, Phil Eisenberg was uh, uh, chair of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. Lloyd Conley was uh, chair of the uh, Subcommittee on the Administration of Justice. Uh, Bill Lockyer uh, was not from Sacramento, but was attending law school in Sacramento because I had him right in the front row. Uh, and he was president pro tem of the Senate at the time, right, uh, right about that time. And so it was easy to get legislative help to work on things and to, if we needed it. Uh, and the legislature had a spot bill. It was Bill, Bill Eisenberg's to uh, uh, create a mandatory malpractice if it turned out that we could uh, push the pencil around and make it happen. Uh, and uh, part and parcel of this then became getting uh, actuaries in here to look at the number of the lawyers in Sacramento, the areas that they practiced in, frequency and severity from insurance data that could be gotten. Uh, Lawyers Mutual gave us their data. Home gave us their data. Uh, we went to a few of the specialty carriers and got as much you know, real life frequency and severity data as we could get. Uh, pretty, this is when we're looking at mandatory insurance, uh, and pretty quickly uh, came to the place of understanding that we really needed to get a new actuarial study of all those things to try to get an idea. Uh, the idea was that you couldn't mandate what you couldn't provide in some kind of way. And so how are you going to provide it? What would it cost? Uh, to uh, put together a mandatory malpractice insurance requirement. This time it was on like a fund model because remember you only had two, two carriers uh, in California. Uh, and so uh, one model looked at was, okay, this fund is gonna be kind of the primary first layer. You can buy all the extra coverage you wanted from the market, uh, from secondary carriers, but, uh, and so we looked at, uh, base sort of policy, $100,000 of uh, coverage, uh, and what would, what would it cost to buy that? And it's got to have, you know, prior apps endorsement that will grow as that tail uh, starts to grow. So we commissioned uh, a, a study by one of the biggest actuaries in America, and for the life of me, I can't remember their name. I want to say it was Milligan or Milligan or something. Uh, like that. Milliman. Okay, so my brain isn't completely shot. Uh, I think it cost a hundred thousand or more uh, to uh, do the actuarial study. Uh, and this was a pretty universal study of claims frequency and severity in California over the 30 years preceding our look at it. Uh, and the idea was with doing the actuarial study, can we come up with some idea? some predictability of what a premium might look like for a policy that might be the minimum limits to protect the just, public. Just going back to a question. Sure. Um, so you mentioned um, that you were studying this with this minimum li limit of 100,000. And I'm just curious before we um, get into the very important part about the actual oral study, how did your committee or group at the time decide that that was um, the minimum limit that you wanted to work at as opposed to 500,000 or a million or something um, higher? It was, the, uh, it was the most popular policy in California. I think we got that from Home and Lawyers Mutual in terms of what they're writing in the, in the day. And uh, uh, also, uh, as the initial data started to come back from the actuarial study, 
you know, it was sufficient to cover the vast majority of claims that were made against Lloyd. Certainly not all of them, but the vast. What, you know, we knew that not everybody was going to be comfortable with 100. You might want five. You want, but the idea was you you could always buy excess coverage. You know, that there was plenty of capacity for that. Uh, where we were really having a hard market is on the first loss. You know, it's the it's it's the first hundred thousand uh, that cost carriers a lot of money. Not the second, not the third. In terms of claims data, we were looking at. My point in mentioning the survey uh, is that this was extensive, and Dick backed me up on this, went on for at least a year. Uh, studied every element of the market cost, frequency, severity, uh, claims, uh, uh, insured lawyers in California, uninsured lawyers, unpaid judgments. And somewhere in this building, that actuarial study lives, I assume. Nobody's been able to find it. I didn't keep it. But I know that it was done. And it might be that the company has it. I don't know. It might be that home has it. Uh, Kevin, when you say severity, was that broken down in any uh, way in terms of uh, areas of uh, law? It was. Uh, you know, for example, uh, in those days, in my, just my recollection, plaintiff's personal injury had more frequency and lower severity. Probate had low frequency mm. but high severity, uh, and uh, tax had low, very low frequency but higher severity, and so it was all broken down. Uh, as the data came in, uh, uh, it led to a discussion of a one hundred thousand dollar policy that was also modeled after Oregon at the time, uh, and how they had their program uh, set up. And the Board of Governors approved this mandatory insurance uh, commission uh, uh, recommendation to establish a mandatory insurance. Uh, uh, when I say approved it, it was acknowledged that we approved it in order to put it out for public comment. Uh, and uh, we didn't quite know exactly how we were going to pull the pieces together, but wanted to see how the public reacted to it. Uh, you have a long memo that David Long did in 1996 that in turn talks about what was going on in the 80s and what the, you know, what the, kind of what we got back. Uh, there were a number of very large bar associations. Uh, LA is the one I remember was staunchly opposed to this. They had their own program going in Los Angeles, an insurance program, an endorsed program. Um, there was a lot of uh, negative feedback on the other side from uh, Minority specialty bars, part-time practitioners. Uh, there was uh, quite a strong sort of reaction uh, from people in certain practice areas that essentially looked at it and said, "Wait a minute, you know, my area, you know, uh, uh, is not a high frequency or a high severity area. Why do I have to underwrite, you know, the plaintiff's injury bar, you know, that kind of thing?" Uh, and uh, also, quite a bit of, uh, of comment from uh, uh, firms that would say, look, $100,000 doesn't do a thing for me. $100,000 is my deductible. You know, I'm, I'm doing entertainment law in Beverly Hills. Uh, it's a nothing uh, for us. I do remember, and Dick, you back me up if I'm wrong, I think the the premium at, on an actuarial basis for $100,000 coverage as it came back was about $3,400 per lawyer in year one, so no prior act, right? And then it's going to start to grow. But we had a pretty good idea of what we were uh, talking about uh, at the time. I think that the, uh, the strongest negative comment on it, because there was some supportive comments, the strongest negative comment was, sort of went like this, what are you trying to fix? In other words, de describe the problem you're trying to fix. Do you think there's unpaid judgments out there or something like that of any dimension? I mean, plainly there's going to be an unpaid judgment, but is it of any dimension? Uh, you don't know. You think you know. Uh, uh, you know, as a policymaker, you think you know, but do you have any data uh, to show uh, that you're fixing something that's broken? Uh, that got everybody around the table talking. And I went to Lloyd Conley, who was then, like I say, the chair of the Assembly Subcommittee on the Administration of Justice, got a bill, 
that authorized and paid for a mandatory survey of the members of the bar. Very carefully constructed by our actuaries to oversample high propensity groups. <coughs> and we know what we're looking for in terms of do you have coverage and are there unpaid judgments? Uh, 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 cases, what you'll never know is what are the cases that didn't get brought because there was no insurance uh, to back it up, uh, etc. And there's a pretty good summary of what came back in the materials you have. Uh, essentially showed that about maybe 1% of the lawyers in California had an unpaid judgment as a result of no insurance. It was like maybe uh, uh, 700 and change unpaid judgments over five years and a lawyer population of 120,000 members in those days. That's a little under 1%. Did you say 1% of the uninsured or 1% of the No, 1% the of the entire responding population uh, had a, the, 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 to the extent that an unpaid judgment was an issue, it was an issue that affected or, you know, targeted 1% of the, these are the practicing active farmers. Uh, and so, uh, uh, as we started uh, uh, looking at the mandatory insurance and uh, uh, you know, sort of trying to summarize the, uh, the comment that we got, uh, the, the uh, discussion sort of turned over time into, uh, it focused on two things. One was that you've got a problem but it's not a huge one. It's not even a big one. Uh, and secondly, uh, that um, uh, we had a problem that, uh, I remember talking to Les Rawls from Oregon because he was in this all the way through, uh, just a terrific help, uh, that we, unlike Oregon, we couldn't define the California lawyer. We had more lawyers in Sacramento County than they had in the entire state. We didn't have that homogeneous, if I can say it that way, uh, bar. Uh, but we did have uh, we had family lawyers and entertainment lawyers and tax lawyers and securities lawyers, but we didn't have a California lawyer that we could look at and say, okay, here's a product that meets, you know, that's a one size fits all. About that time, uh, the focus turned a little bit to, well, look at the market. Why is it the case that in such a hard market now and we can't seem to do something uh, to soften it. That's when the discussion turned to uh, putting together an uh, open market entrant. Uh, I thought we could do it, uh, uh, that we had 125,000 members, that if you had 4,000 dentists in San Francisco, you could do an affinity program. We had 125,000 lawyers in California. There's something we can do there found out pretty quickly, uh, we looked at putting together a captive, but then we'd have to raise capital and buy a building and hire people and all that. How do we do that without, how do we get that program without doing all that? Well, you find it existing, form a relationship. So we had this sort of, and I think I'm bringing it sort of current to what you all know, but uh, we said about, I said about, the committee said about to uh, talk to carriers about this. Uh, when you talk about coming to California to write a lawyer's program, I thought that's going to be a tough sell. It wasn't, given the number of lawyers that were potential uh, affinity members. Uh, and uh, the one thing that was different is we wanted Copley. This is where uh, Jed Hurley and I were chairs, I think, for about 14 years after. But it wasn't, it wasn't a uh, member benefit program. Judge uh, Colleen, could you give a couple people in our working group may not know exactly what Copley is sure. and the background? It may be helpful if you give us a little bit on that as well. Yeah. Um, this was an essential feature of this new program was a uh, uh, organ at the state bar whose job it was, was to interact on, do two things. One, uh, to do what you could with the member lawyers to reduce the frequency and severity of claims. So if you look at the program summaries, the last document uh, in the package, uh, that was, this was the agenda item in 1986, or 89, when this was approved by the Board of Governors, uh, you'll see some headings, but one is, this is what the policy is gonna look like. 
For example, you don't surcharge somebody that's had a claim. That claim was calculated into your premium on day one. But you don't, I mean, in other words, we've got 125,000 members, so we get a say in this. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, we have to have full prior acts coverage. We have to, you know, uh, be, have a part-time program for part-timers, which we did. $25,000 limit for the part-timer program, invented it. We had to have a way of interacting with the carrier on behalf of the insureds, and that's what the Committee on Professional Liability Insurance was charged to do. Secondarily, the Committee on Professional Liability Insurance was charged to do the educational programs, the peer review, the interaction with the lawyer's assistance program, all the things that you could do and all the things you could think of uh, to lessen the frequency and severity of malpractice claims in the first place. Um, we had to, uh, so I remember, this was so much fun, you know, uh, you get to sit down with carriers in New York. I, I remember seeing, uh, we in, uh, uh, this went on for years, and we were change the carrier here and there. I remember being in New York right, I mean, within a couple of weeks after the 9-11, uh, and being in the uh, insurance company's office where you're looking down at Grand Zero and the windows were, uh, the heat had rippled them. And so that had to be in 2001, so that meant this program was in place a decade or more. By but the point is, you sit down with carriers and you say, look, uh, you may think that uh, uh, what you want to do when you defend these claims is to hire the cheapest lawyers you can find anywhere and, you know, uh, tell them that they can't hire experts. And you'd probably be right from an economic perspective. On the other hand, this program's for lawyers, by lawyers, about lawyers, so you're probably not a good match for us then. Right? That's where you, you could have those conversations. I know Randy had them later uh, in terms of uh, the interactions with the so the, the point being is that the Committee on Professional Liability Insurance, which is the acronym, everything's got an acronym, probably, was designed at the time the endorsed program was adopted for the specific purpose, not of administering a member benefit program, but for attending to that program as part of the overall public protection mission uh, on the, on the and consumer protection mission that went with the disciplinary process. Well, there was no point of departure there. Uh, it was just part of the overall revamping of, uh, you know, trying to get to a more credible place. And if there was a member benefit, then you have a win on both sides. You know, you your members as well, but it was regulatory uh, in terms of its conception. Um, so uh, that program is history, I mean, history in the sense that it's existed, it's insured lawyers for, you know, ever since 1989 here in California. Uh, you know, there, I think the other carriers, uh, uh, you know, particularly for that uh, uh, practitioner that is in the one to three or one to five hundred thousand dollar policy, uh, you know, nobody uh, has experienced, uh, you know, predatory pricing or undercutting or anything like that. Uh, it's put another entrant on the market. I think all the entrants, now, today we're in a soft market. So everything looks different. You know, and oh well, you know, people can buy it anywhere. But you won't have a soft market. When the investment markets go down, the premiums will go up. And, and, and carriers will leave. You know, if you've got to make money on your investment dollar, you're much better off to put it in life insurance uh, than PLI or auto insurance. And that's what will happen. So in a tight market, you might be to the place of two or three uh, carriers. So uh, uh, the, I think the, the, you know, what I would probably close and I'll certainly uh, uh, answer any questions that you, have, that you might have, but I think we went through three or four or five uh, uh, probably three carriers in my tenure, uh, both on the Board of Governors and then as Chair of uh, Copley for the next 14 or 15 years as this program got off the, um, got, got off uh, going, uh, was uh, uh, to get it up and running as a, a credible entrant. Uh, it sort of a, uh, operates as a market check 
on other carriers as other carriers do on that program uh, to ensure that you know there's a stable pricing that can pay claims and this sort of thing. I think that's been the case. Uh, and so uh, I think the thought became uh, that we uh, at least would take that step and we did. Uh, if I circle back around, because you know in 1991 there was another plebiscite done regarding not prior, not mandatory, not, so that would have been number three. 75, 76, the one that we acted on and got the actuarial study, the plebiscite done in 1991 uh, regarding, and, and now this I guess makes four and there'll probably be a five, uh, somewhere down the track. But I think the policy judgments that sort of drove our decision making uh, in the uh, day was that when you had a hard market, you had to structure your malpractice insurance program as the sole primary carrier. If you only had one or two, uh, then you have to, if you're going to mandate it, you've got to supply it. And you can't supply it, you know, as a fallback uh, you, with other entrants in the market writing the best risk because you'll instantly have adverse selection inside your program. Uh, and so we couldn't do that. Policy judgment would be the same today. Not so much how do you do it when you've got a soft market, but what will you do on the day it becomes a hard market, which it will, uh, always does. And then, uh, uh, then uh, uh, you, a essential question is matching available limits to risk, because uh, you have uh, folks that are in areas of practice that uh, you want to maintain and you want to you want to encourage and you want people to be able to get lawyers in those fields, uh, but they also can be high frequency uh, sort of fields. And if you mandate insurance that you can't supply, you've got to figure out how you're going to match that risk and how you're going to write that risk. And then uh, uh, lastly, uh, I would say uh, two things. One is that uh, you're going to hear, I guess, today uh, from folks that, you know, that provide pro bono services, and I would probably add not free services, but services for people of limited means was a real issue. Uh, uh, you know, you, on the one hand, you look at it and you go, well, there shouldn't be a second class of justice, you know, for, for um, folks. Um, but, you know, having been on the bench for a decade now, and I'm pretty sure Judge Perkins over there is going to agree with me on this, uh, we see in uh, all levels of our court, sure it's the same throughout California. Uh, people can't afford more. And people that try to handle their own cases. Uh, uh, not just in the family law courts, although 70% probably of our litigants in family courts are self-represented. Uh, but also in the civil cases that Judge Perkins and I do, and every other type of work that we see. And uh, uh, how to get legal services for these folks is uh, as much a problem in uh, 2018 as it was in 1988. Uh, in fact, it's worth much more pervasive today because we see everything in terms of rights. Our law is written that way. Now. So you've got to figure that one out in terms of how to. And lastly, uh, I'll just mention it quickly. I saw in your materials a lot of discussion about disclosure states. There was some, there was some discussion in my time, if I can say it that way, about the fact that uh, if, that one thing you should do uh, is mandate disclosure if somebody doesn't have insurance. Uh, it might have been a palliative for us to say, well, hmm. you know, look, if we make sure that lawyers have to say if they don't have insurance, then anybody that's hurt by this, you know, at least have that information when they make that choice. It turned into a discussion of, well, do you say, you mandate that they say, I have it? Or do you mandate that they say, I don't have it? We opted ultimately for the latter. Uh, because if you put lawyers in places of warranting that they have insurance in a case that's you know, pretty heavily driven by exclusions and prior acts and reporting deadlines and all kinds of stuff, you may put them in a place of making a representation. It's not true. But anybody knows when they don't have insurance. And the, uh, consumer legal services should hear at least that. So that's kind of the history. I think you'd be so far ahead if you could find that, if you could find that actuarial study. Uh -huh.
Do we have time for a, yeah. a question? Yeah. And I don't want to cut anybody else off, but um, I, I want to try to take advantage, Judge Paul Hain, of you know, your historical connection with all of this over the last 30 or 40 years. And I read your uh, write-up in 1989. I read the David Long write-up uh, in 1997. Whether we're at you know iteration three, four, or five, is, is there is there anything about today's dynamic to the extent you have a sense of it, or the the temperament of the public, or the temperament of the of the bar uh, for an, an appetite for change? along the sort of things that we're considering here. You know, we had hard markets and soft markets in the past, and no insurance and crises and all those sorts of things. And you've seen all that, and you did the deep dive on all those studies. But is there anything you're seeing that's different today that sort of screams out for, uh, you know, the sort of uh, analysis that we're doing and, and the different um, options and alternatives that the, the State Bar has available to it? I think that, uh I think that at the time we looked, uh, a good half of the bar was very interested in this fund because the market was so difficult. You know, in terms of buying it, if you had any claims, you could forget about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you, so that builds in all sorts of odd, strange dynamics in the lawyer-client relationship because of the effect of what happens if you have a claim, you're going to become uninsured entirely. And, if I had to guess, uh, I'd probably say there's less of an appetite today uh, uh, in one respect, among the lawyers, because uh, it's a much softer market and there's more availability. Uh, and so uh, in one sense, you're not struggling against the, you know, the, percentage of your, the percentage of your firm budget eaten up by malpractice insurance. And I'm pretty sure it was much lower today than it was you know, in, when there was only two carriers uh, and travelers had left and, and all that kind of stuff. Drives carriers nuts uh, uh, because you've got to get enough dollars to pay those claims. Uh, and uh, the idea that you could uh, drop over and buy a policy from Golden Eagle and they'll be gone next year. Did we see that? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, you know, it was tough. So uh, at the same time, I think that, uh, you know, uh, complain when it happens. Uh, look, I talk to my kids, my daughters about this all the time. When, when, a, when a bad thing happens, a lot more people know about it today than used to. Right? So if you have this person that does this horrible thing as a lawyer and has no malpractice insurance to pay for it, uh, it becomes, uh, you know, uh, public, the public square hears about that where Back in the days I'm talking about, of course, we were typing on selectors, so uh, you, you, didn't, you didn't have that. So I think that, you know, you might get more interest uh, by regulators, legislators, bar types, the court, all that. Uh, uh, you know, when you hear a, about a bad case, you know, when the, when the plane hits the mountain, you know, in some public way, uh, you hear about it more and that may uh, deposit a more of an interest in it, uh, but if you believe, in, you know, if you get to a place of concluding that you can't mandate what you can't provide, because that's been the net net on the prior looks at this, uh, uh, you could mandate insurance today in an open market model, but you're going to someday you're going to have to cross the bridge and Rubicon. What happens? when now you're mandated something only two or three entrants will provide. Because that will happen. Hmm. It's cyclical, it's never not happened. So uh, those are some of the policy judgments. And I should say, Randy, because you asked me to bring Lloyd Conley with me, uh, Judge Conley, who I mentioned, was uh, at the legislature and helped the bar with the study bills and the mandatory survey and all that, some of you remember, finished his work as a legislator became a judge, one of the very best in Sacramento, or maybe anywhere, did you know, some of the huge cases that you read about, primarily a water in Colorado River and stuff like that, with Judge Conley's work. Uh, then he retired from the bench after a full judicial career, and then he got nagged primarily by me. 
to become the CEO of the Sacramento Superior Court. And uh, uh, he's 71 years old, has a one-year-old baby. And uh, I see him, I used to see him on his PJ every day. Now I see him every other day, maybe. Uh, and he wanted to come. Uh, we have a uh, legislative matter, uh, about $400 million attached to it in Sacramento today. And so he said, can you go do that? And I, I told him I would, but uh, uh, he uh, uh, very closely connected the Center for Public Interest Law at the University of San Diego, uh, and uh, uh, you know worked with them and me and us when we were doing all this back in the day. And uh, I'm, I'm certain you know we'd come back uh, if, if there's an occasion to do that. I think we have one one more question, just Paul. Thank you for your comments, Judge. Uh, my name is Ruben Duran. I'm going to belie my, my novice uh, status here and, and just ask you, it sounded like maybe an offhanded comment, but what did you mean when you said Lloyd's is not really insurance? It's not insurance. Uh, uh, so uh, you have a bunch of investors. I mean, there's probably people here that would be much better at this, but uh, investors that are called names you live in, if you want to invest in this and you want to pledge uh, your fortune to uh, insur insurance type product, you become a name in, uh, and uh, Lloyd's used to be a marketplace in the old days where you went and you wrote out a slip, this is how much coverage I want, and then it would be matched with a group of names, but basically uh, it's backed by the personal fortunes of individual investors in, uh, in London. It's not covered by the California Insurance Guarantee Association. Uh, it hasn't had notable problems. There have been a few, uh, but uh, it's it's not insurance in the sense that we think of it, where um, there are reserves required to be set aside for claims. Thank you. Any other questions for Judge Colhane? Judge Colhane, you have Judge Colhane, thank you very much. We appreciate you coming all the way from Sacramento. Um, that was really, really helpful, and um, we're, we're deeply appreciative. Thank you. I'm sorry that after running a few minutes, I'd be back on the bench at 1.30. <laughs> <laughs> okay. wow. So I, I told Randy, and I've got to be in class tonight, I told Randy that <coughs> it's not a day off. <laughs> but I, I really appreciate kind of being here. You know, it feels like... We, then we had another building. I was on the committee that bought this place. <laughs> I'm glad it worked. Well, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. You know, I think we really should, uh, those of us sitting around the table who are lawyers, we really should express a lot of gratitude to you, Kevin, for all the work that you've done uh, for so many years on behalf of all the lawyers in this state. And you're coming here today, and you've just been, you've just really added to all the aspects of lawyers and consumer protection for us. So thank you very much. Thank you. You're here. Well, thank you. Um, so now we'll move right into our second panel. No breaks with this group. If you want a break, you're not getting one. We have too much to do. <laughs> um, we will take a break after this panel. But um, we would, um, as I prefaced in the introductory comments, we now have an hour and a half panel with three very distinguished panelists. Um, again, Diane Minnick from the Idaho State Bar, which recently imposed mandatory malpractice insurance. Jean Leverty, the president of the Nevada State Bar, and they recently voted to impose mandatory malpractice insurance. And Chris Newbold uh, from ALPS, who I understand, and Chris, thank you for being here, work closely with both Diane and Jean. Let me give you a very, very brief background on the three of them, and I'll defer to you all to give your expertise in these areas. Uh, in the area of mandatory malpractice insurance. Diane Minnick is the executive director of the Idaho State Bar and the Idaho Law Foundation. Um, she's worked for both organizations since 1985, as I understand it, and became the executive director of the Idaho State Bar in 1990. Um, Diane has a really neat biography, which we don't have time to review in detail, but she has been involved in leadership roles in the National Association of Bar Executives, the Western States Bar Conference, the Girl Scout Council, the Boise Public School Foundation, Rotary, Friends of the Zoo, which was my favorite, and um, much more. So we're very grateful for Diane's expertise today. And Jean, um, thank you for coming in all the way from Nevada. Very um, grateful for that. 
And Gene has been practicing law since 1971. He's licensed not only in Nevada, but also here in California, as I understand it. Um, he is currently with his own firm, Leverty & Associates. Um, Gene has a very interesting background. While he has been a trial lawyer for 35 years, practicing, I understand, largely in the personal injury realm, he was also the deputy, chief deputy insurance commissioner of the state of Nevada from, I believe, 1972 to 1979, giving him deep expertise in insurance coverage, including complex insurance issues. So Gene speaks to us not only from the perspective of the head of the bar that just imposed mandatory malpractice insurance, but somebody who has a lot of insurance knowledge. Um, he also was the chair of the State Bar of Nevada's Insurance Standing Committee from 1977 to 1980. He then was elevated more recently to the Vice President of the State Bar of Nevada and again now serves as the President. So Gene, thank you for being here today. And uh, finally, certainly uh, last but not least, is Chris Newbold from ALPS Lawyers Malpractice Insurance. Uh, Chris is the Executive Vice President of ALPS and ALPS Property uh, and Casualty Insurance Company. Um, he focuses in his job, I got this from your ALPS bio, so hopefully it's correct, uh, focuses on bar association relationships, strategic and operational planning, risk management, human resources, and more. He is actually a nationally recognized strategic planning facilitator in the bar association and bar foundation world. Um, I was also um, very interested in reading in his bio that he is well versed on captive insurance associations, which is obviously part of what we are studying. Um, and again, I will allow our three distinguished panelists to discuss the interactions that they've had amongst themselves in terms of the imposition of mandatory malpractice insurance in both Idaho and Nevada. And Gene, I believe we have your PowerPoint teed up. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we can start with Diane. I'm going to go first because he has a really fancy PowerPoint. I do not, so you can see that next. So keep you awake in the next. Um, I'm Diane Minick, director of Idaho State Bar. I've been um, in Idaho for a very long time. Um, I did grow up in the Bay Area. I grew up in San Jose. And as I tell people, we have 6,500 lawyers in Idaho. Compared to your 266,000, there are about the same amount of lawyers in California as our people in Boise, Idaho, where I live. So I say that as our scale is very different, the numbers are very different, but I'm hoping that some of the things that we learned in this process will be helpful as you consider this issue. Um, I do a little bit interesting that the judge had that history because I've been here all that time and some of those things I actually remember. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit about our history because it kind of, in some ways, mirrors some of the things that happened here. I don't think that's any different. You know, big or small, a lot of the bar associations go through the same things over the years. Um, first, I'm going to say we are integrated bar like California. We do all of the regulatory functions in Idaho. We're in charge of discipline, admissions, licensing, mandatory CLE, um, class assistance fund, fee arbitration. All of that is within the Idaho State Bar's um, functions. We have an enabling statute, but what governs what we do every single day in terms of procedural as well as rules of professional conduct are Idaho Supreme Court rules. So all of what we do is under the, we're basically an administrative arm of the Idaho Supreme Court. And what we do in terms of how do we change those rules or how do we create those rules, and that's kind of an important part of how this process works for us. Um, we may have a task force like this to look at an issue and come up with a recommendation, but everything that is in our uh, procedural rules, our bar commission rules, um, goes to our membership and they have to vote. Um, and it's a very consistent process. It happens at the exact same time every year. You can submit a resolution, and it can be an individual member, it can be the board, it can be the court will actually submit resolutions to change the rules. Um, and it's their rules. Um, so everything that we do has to go to our membership. So you submit a resolution, we submit that to the membership. Um, we go to every judicial district in the state and we discuss it with the members. We have meetings with the lawyers. And then we, um, you can vote there or you can vote later and just send in a ballot. Um, and if it passes, if the vote, members vote in favor, it goes to the Supreme Court for its adoption. Um, if it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, and the court, in all of the years that I have worked at the bar, has never not adopted a rule that we submitted. Um, and in all of the years I've been here, they have only adopted one rule on their own motion, which had to do with electronic filing. So um, they can obviously do whatever they want to. They do not. 
um, that our process is one that's, like I said, very consistent, same every year, and all of the rules that we have have been through this process, in, including this one, and so that's, I um, want to just kind of say how all that works. Um, our history of this issue is very similar. Um, in the 80s, we took it to our membership for a vote. They said, yeah, we should look at this issue. Um, and then because of the hard market, is kind of, as he said, that's why it was an issue at that time. And that's when ALPS was formed, and Chris will talk about that in a minute. And so then it became not such an issue because they sort of filled in that gap. Um, in the 90s, we brought it back to the membership and said, do you want us to look at this issue and create a plan for mandatory malpractice? They said, yes, please do so. We came back with the Oregon model. They said, absolutely not. We don't like that. Um, and interesting, I, what I know about insurance now, um, it, that's not a model that actually will probably work in Idaho. There aren't enough of us. But you know, at the time, that was what we came up with and, and wasn't a good plan. Um, and then in the mid-2000s, we did mandatory disclosure, which about two-thirds of the states now um, have a mandatory disclosure rule that you have to say whether you do or don't. So, that's sort of the history in Idaho, which is sort of similar. Then, and um, we had a task force a couple of times look at this. Um, so in 2016, 2016, the current president of the bar president at the time, who was a sole practitioner from Boise, she decided that we ought to have mandatory prop practice. And she submitted a resolution with her own name on it. The board did not support it. Um, they did not, not support it, but they did not vote to have their name on it um, to the membership. We didn't do a lot. There was no big task force. There was not a lot of discussion. There was not a lot of anything. Um, and we submitted it to the membership. Uh, her points, she had three points as to why she thought this was a good idea. Um, and I'll read them to you because they're pretty short. Um, one of the main purposes of the organized bar is to ensure that the public is properly protected against unprofessional conduct of the members of the bar. If a lawyer does not have legal malpractice insurance, it is possible that victims of legal malpractice will not have any financial recourse against a negligent legal professional. Requiring attorneys to have minimum limits of professional liability insurance coverage would help ensure the public as consumers of legal services are financially protected from attorney error. Um, so her, her motivation was protecting the public. I mean, that was her uh, thought process at the time. And she did some malpractice work. I think she got a little tired of lawyers saying, well, go ahead and file against me. I will file bankruptcy. Um, so th it was a pretty simple um, process. Um, she you have the rule. It's very simple. It's a couple of pages long. Um, and we took it to the membership. And I will tell you, I was completely as surprised as everybody else. It passed. Um, 51 to 49, it was a pretty close um, vote. But 25% of the members voted, so you know we have that many people vote in a primary election in Idaho, so it wasn't a bad number. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so it passed. And because we had mandatory disclosure, we could figure out kind of how many um, people did or didn't have insurance, sort of. Our records weren't great. But, so we figured 15 to 20% of the people did not have insurance when we went through this whole process. Uh, so once it passed, we submitted it to the court. The court adopted it. That was in seven, 2017. Diane? Yeah. Can I ask a question about your, your survey on that? The 51%, 49%, do you have any idea whether or not the 51% was more the large, medium-sized firm, attorneys that already had insurance, and how to sell those pro bonos, part-timers? I don't. Okay. Because we do it by individual lawyer, and it's a secret ballot, so we can't really um, you know, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what the pros and cons for that is, kind of how those have played out, so you have kind of a sense of who and what. Okay. Um, but you know, as I said, yes. Hi, Kathleen Hamilton. A couple of quick, just process questions. Um, so, do I correctly understand that your state legislature has no involvement in establishing these rules that? Um, no. We have an enabling statute. Our license fees are set by statute. Um, and a couple of other things, but it's very limited. All of what we do as a regulatory body is under is under the Idaho Supreme Court Supreme Court rules. So no, and I stay very very far away from the legislature intentionally for that purpose. And then, does your regulatory process include um, any public participation or public notice or opportunity for public comment? Um, in this particular process, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. If we have a task force, generally we would, we did a senior lawyer task force a couple of years ago, and then there were public members on that to talk about, you know, the process of succession planning, et cetera. 
Um, our board is only five members, and so no, I expect that if we ever redo that again, which we probably should at some point, um, that would be, we have public members on all of our regulatory committees. Climate Assistance Fund, I mean, public is involved, and it's posted, so we would take public comments, and if people wanted to come and comment, we don't necessarily promote that. We don't discourage it, but we don't promote, so. Yes. <clears throat> Go ahead, go ahead. Oh. I was just curious about how specific the proposal was that was put to the membership. Did it have particulars of what the insurance was, like a minimum limit? or 100, was it? 300, but, okay. yeah, which is in the rule. The, the, I gave it, I apologize, Linda has the proposal, but the resolution was, the rationale was a paragraph long, and you have a copy of the rule. Okay. But and that's so 302, what became 302? Yeah, what became 302. Okay. Hey, thank you. That's what was in the resolution, and then there was like a paragraph of rationale, which is basically a, a little more expanded version of the three points that she made. It's pretty basic. Uh, I had a question. So you have, uh, it's on. You have 6,500 voting members? Our voting members are, I want to say, 5,500 probably. Oh. Active members and judges are voting members. If you're not an active member or a judge, you don't vote. And you had 25% hit rate on the survey, so it wasn't mandated or whatever would be? 25% on the vote. It's not a survey. It is a vote. I mean, you vote, and if, it, you, if it's, uh, the vote is favorable, that okay. rule would be proposed to the court. Okay. It's not a survey in the sense that once we get it, we can do something else right. with it. Was there any uh, member outreach or public outreach, or what was the sort of the engagement on in, in either the bar or the public or any other? Like I said, we have this process is consistent every year. Every year, resolutions are due on a certain day. We send the resolutions to every lawyer by paper. We send it by email. We post it on our website. We put it in our magazine. We do all of the we have a weekly bulletin. We do all of the outreach to lawyers on this. Um, they get two or three or four different notices about the meetings as well as about the resolutions um, and they're all posted so and they get the actual hard copy in the mail still. Someday, you know, we may not do that, but we actually still mail stuff once in a while. So I'm looking at something here, it looks like sort of frequently asked questions about it. Did right. that go out as for prior to the vote then? No, that was afterwards. afterwards. I mean we did answer all of those questions at the meetings, I will say that that's where they came from. Okay. Is to, to do that. Um, so let me go to that. I'll, I'll jump ahead to, to that part in terms of what were the issues that were brought up at the meetings and then how have we addressed those issues. Okay, because I think that's kind of where the most important part. Um, I will say that there's a group of lawyers that vote against everything the bar does, just so they don't like us. That's okay. I can live with that. Um, <laughs> and then there's a group of, of lawyers, and, and this is true in any place, not just lawyers, that are just don't want more regulation. I mean, their, their view is more regulation is not good, and that's fine. Um, not specific to this rule, they say that whatever rule that requires something more of lawyers. So those are the two um, Next question, of course, is can everybody, as the judge alluded to, can everybody get coverage? Um, and will the insurance companies then mandate whether or not lawyers practice? And I will tell you, we did it. One time, it was for 2018 licensing. That licensing period included on March 1, give or take, and everyone has insurance. There is no one that told me they couldn't get insurance. Well, there was a couple people that told me they couldn't get insurance. Then I said, okay, you can't get insurance or you don't like the price. Well, they don't like the price. Okay, that doesn't count as not being able to get insurance. And then I would ask them, what is that price? And they would give it to me, and it was a completely reasonable number. They weren't being overcharged based on what numbers were. So everyone got insurance. It's only 100, 300, so it's a minimal um, amount. Um, we asked the lawyers, and, and I will say I did the survey on the carriers. 75% um, probably of our lawyers are covered by nine different carriers. The, the largest is Alps because that's our endorsed carrier and that's 35% and then alas and there's a whole bunch of others. But most of them are covered by a pretty small group. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of others because everyone is less subject to it whether you practice in Idaho or not. So a lot of them are one-offs because they're in some other state. Um, cost, of course, is the next obvious issue. Um, and we ask lawyers to redact. They have to submit a form that says, 
I represent private clients, or I don't. If you do, then you need to say you have insurance, and you have to say who, and you have to provide proof. So that's how the process works. <coughs> um, and for those that uh, said they had insurance, and they, they, then they, the proof thing, I'm down to like one lawyer doesn't turn the form in, but he promised me he was going to quit practicing. And then about 10 or 15 didn't provide proof. So, um, and they have to tell us. So it's all, it, the, the, the minimal, the coverage is pretty minimal in terms of what they have. So cost-wise, we asked them to redact the premium because we didn't really want to have that information public. Um, and all of it. Um, and of course, many lawyers did not which is kind of good because now I know what the prices were. I mean, I know what the premiums actually were. And they ran anywhere from $500 up. So um, part-time, limited practice, I saw 500 to 1,000 many times. The average, I think, for Idaho, and, and Chris can correct me because they have a big chunk of it, obviously, is somewhere between two and $3,000 when I looked at it. Um, and I'm not including the larger firms, because clearly if you do securities work or tax work or, you know, my husband's a securities bond lawyer, so, I mean, his is different. But for the people that are solo small firm is the largest part of Idaho lawyers, um, probably 80%. I don't have those numbers exactly, but I think, um, as I told Randy, we don't have large, large firms like California has. Um, I mean, we have Stoll Reeves and some of the regional firms in Idaho, but the largest actual Idaho firm is only about 75 lawyers. So that's, that element of it isn't really in our mix. Plus, those <laughs> lawyers all have insurance. Um, so the cost was the next thing, and, and as far as I can tell, it was pretty reasonable when people gave me their, um, when I asked them, what, well, what is it, and they, it wasn't unreasonable. So then you get down to some of the other. Now we didn't do all the actuarial stuff. I'm just you know, obviously we just sort of went at this. Um, so now we're trying to figure out okay where is it and what is it and um, I think house council is the other one. We should have exempted them from it because I'm not particularly concerned about protecting large corporations because um, they will have coverage and with those lawyers because technically they are a private client and that's for the language of our rule. Um, we just said, if you're covered some way, that's fine. Don't send proof. Just tell me that your corporation covers you in some way, and that's, that's acceptable. Um, what are the other big issues? Uh, pro bono. That was another one, as he mentioned, that you know, whether or not pro bono work, um, can you do that under what sources? And it wasn't just pro bono in the traditional sense that we all think about. It's pro bono, I want to work for the Little League or the nonprofit down the street or you know, all of these other kinds of if you're a prosecutor, if you're a public lawyer, you're not subject to the rule because that's not a private client. So for all of those people that are public lawyers, they want to do these things, does it, does it count in terms of would they have to have insurance? Um, and in our case, again, the, the advantage of Idaho being small is we have a pro bono program. That's in our office also. Um, and their insurance will cover any of those. I mean, technically, they have a policy. That policy is if you run that case through them, you will be covered by our policy. And it's a, I think it's NLADA, National Legal Aid Defenders. Um, so that, and even in that policy, um, there are some modest means things that could be covered also. I mean, their, their threshold is not pro bono exclusively in terms of what would be covered. So if you have some of those kinds of cases, those would be covered. Um, or could be covered by the, the pro bono program's policy if you want to do that. <laughs> um, and then the other, the trickiest one from my perspective is just the part-time lawyers. People who just want to do a few cases, I'm winding down my practice, you know, that whole element of, and I don't know about you, but in Idaho, I think this is nationally fairly true, 51% of our lawyers are over 50 years old. It's huge. When in 1990 or 93, whenever I did this, it was 19%. So that number has changed so much over the years. And so you get to that end of the practice part. Um, and the answer is yes, they have to have coverage under our rule. Um, I think that the premiums that they saw were pretty reasonable for the most part. I think there are many that decided, have been thinking about giving up practice and probably chose to do so because of that. And, and we had initially, another thing we did, which was kind of not tied to this, but a year or so ago, we used to have an exemption if you were over 72 for the CLE requirements, and we took that away from the older lawyers. 
that and the insurance coupled together, I think sort of those people that were kind of on the edge of whether I should do this or not do this are like, okay, you know, I'm done. I don't want to do it. And, um, and I think there are a few people that just said, I'm not going to do it, so I won't keep practicing. That's you know, your choice. It wasn't that you didn't. So that was the trickiest one. It's just sort of those hard time. I only want to do a few things. Um, and we have an emeritus license, and they can be covered through our program too. So um, that's where we kind of got caught up, and I had to talk to a lot of people and about what and how. And, and I intentionally, me and one of our lawyers, I intentionally took a lot of these calls initially because given we didn't do our homework on this as much as we should have, I wanted to know what are the issues and how are we going to play, how is this going to play out. And the FAQ came from our initial letters we sent to everybody we knew would need insurance and didn't have it. And then as we've worked forward, we will redo some of the things that we've done trying to answer the questions. And granted, it's a soft market. Um, honestly, it, it's, it has gone so much better than I thought it would. You know, this is one of those things where someone has a brilliant idea and then they look at you and say, okay, here you go, good luck. Um, and it went very well. I had lawyers push back. Most of the pushback on the front line of our office was they didn't know what to do and they couldn't figure out how to fill the form out and those sorts of sort of administrative kinds of issues. Um, not about the rule itself, but they just weren't clear on what they were supposed to do. Um, people I talked to, um, few people not very happy about it. Um, a few people who thought the big firms were trying to put the small firms out of business and then I had to explain, no, the person who proposed this was the sole practitioner, so that's really not the issue here. Um, I had as many people tell me it was the right thing to do that I talked to on the phone about it um, in terms of lawyers. So that's clearly anecdotally. Um, and so now I think what happens next is soft market, hard market, you know, how much do the prices go up in the second year? I mean, there are some issues that we're going to face going forward. But for now, um, it was pretty smooth and not too difficult for lawyers to get insurance. And does anybody have other questions? That's kind of where I am at this point. <coughs> does your rule um, does your rule require now the carriers that are providing this management <coughs> insurance for your lawyers to share claims data with you? No. Our rule, I, I will say this, this is our rule. It's like this 302. That's it. That's all there is. Um, and don't take this personally, lawyers, but the less words, the better, <laughs> because it's pretty simple. It doesn't require a lot of things. And which gives us the flexibility to sort of say, here's what you got to do. Um, the more words you give lawyers, the more ways they try to figure out how it doesn't apply to them. Um, now, I know Alps will, if I need that information from Alps, I think that, well, I, okay, full disclosure, I'm on the Alps Board of Directors, so I get that information anyway for a variety of states, not just Idaho. I mean, I can see it, so I kind of know what it is. Um, but no. Um, I'm just wondering about somebody who might be uninsurable by a private market. Where does that fall in? They might not be unethical, but they might just not be able to get insurance on the open market. We didn't have anybody. I mean, honestly, I, I don't know because that did not happen. Now, I know that, like, if we send them to Alps, they have a secondary market. You know, like, you know, whatever the pool was when I was in high school and had to be in it for car insurance. Um, <laughs> after wrecking my mother's car here in California. Um, so I think they are able to place some of them, and Chris can talk about that in a minute. But we have not had anyone say they were uninsurable. Uh, so I, I anticipated that and did not have that happen. Can I follow up on that? Is it possible that they were uninsurable and as a result they had to leave my own practice? Hmm. It's possible, but I don't. I'll go look at our, our statistics, but you know we kind of know who comes and goes and who changes, and I don't I don't think that was the case. I mean, it's possible, but I don't know that. And I can't tell you that did not happen to somebody, but I don't. I mean, I've had a couple people say it was hard to get insurance because they only did a few clients or this or that, but they got it eventually. So um, I have talked to some people who were concerned that they couldn't because they got turned down by a company, but they went to another one and found it. So I'm also curious what law school that might be like in Idaho versus California because I know that 
it's a huge issue in California with the new graduates having this huge debt load and so many of them going into solo practice because of the market. Um, I don't know what Idaho is like. Um, we have two law schools in Idaho now, uh, which is not very many, obviously, compared to yours. Uh, I'm thinking that ooh, it's 75 to 100,000 is the average, but I see a lot higher. And we have lots of people that didn't go to Idaho law Total schools. Over the three years? Yeah. I, and, and I mean, we had a, I was anecdotally, we had a guy the other day who um, his debt load was, he didn't pass the bar exam, but, but his debt load was set to 250,000. We see a lot of high ones. I mean, it's not, it, it's not minuscule. But, you know, I guess the other issue there, though, is if you, I mean, there's a policy Alps has that's pretty inexpensive for first year lawyers. Hmm. I mean, is it really, if, you, if, if your business model is I like, can't afford $1,000 to have insurance, is that good? I mean, I guess there's a balance there that you have to think about, but from my perspective. So. We have several questions. We have Ruben and then Pat. Okay. Diane, what's the, um, I don't know if you, if you said this, if you did, I apologize. What's the frequency of claims made on insurance or civil litigation claims made for malpractice? I don't know. I mean, I know from Alice's perspective. I, mean, I can probably speak more to it just because you know, <laughs> we have the right question. It's, it's going to be fairly similar to what we see it's nationally, 20. which is, you know, and actually probably about three and a half percent, right? So three and a half claims for every 100 lawyers on an annualized basis. Okay. So I think on the staff, we got less than this 2.9 inside of Idaho's. So anyway, that's those are ours, in, and that's a, a third of our lawyers that are insured. Connie, um, I neglected to write it down. What you said? Did you say half of your lawyers are over fifty? Fifty-one percent, yes. And so, uh, how many young lawyers do you have? The other forty-nine percent. <laughs> <laughs> like that's a, that's a really big range. So I mean, twenty-five. So I'm thinking of student loan. Debt, especially the large student loan debt, seems to affect like those under 30. So interesting. I think our numbers, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't bring that. Yeah, maybe 35. But um, the last time I, I'd have to go look it up for sure. But it was interesting because only three percent of our lawyers are under 30. That's that was the question. That's yeah, that that, that I did. I mean, between 30 and, and 40 is higher, but it was a pretty low number. And, and I don't know if that's just people coming into practice or people are going to law school later. I think that statistics show that a lot of people are in law school at a later time in their life. So, Diane, I had a question too. Um, and I, I, I apologize if you answered this, but I'm, I'm not sure um, we've asked it yet. So when you are now requiring lawyers to have these policies, are you requiring them to have some type of specific retro date or prior acts date? In other words, these are claims made policies, meaning that the, you know, the, just for the benefit of everybody here, that, that right. the, um, I'm, I'm only a malpractice defense attorney, by the way, uh, so when the claim is made, it's the policy then in effect, but the alleged negligent act need to have, needs to have occurred subsequent to the retro date or the prior act date. So I'm wondering how, what you've mandated or. We didn't, there's no, but one of the questions Chris and I discussed last week was going forward, they will have to have prior acts from the date that this was required of them. I see. Because I think, it doesn't say that, but clearly the intent is you have to have practice from the insurance from the time at which this rule was implemented so you can't then eliminate your prior acts in the next year so that you pay less. Excellent. Any other questions? Um, <laughs> Lisa. Is there a <coughs> way that you would be able to track whether the people who did opt out because they were only they were retiring, and this pushed them out the door. Whether that impacted the availability of counsel for any group of people, are you seeing any um, uh, pro bono groups that are saying they're having a harder time finding volunteers? I mean, maybe that's not really an issue in Idaho. Well, we we say that, but I don't think it's the insurance. It's not insurance related, and we do have an, a, a status that you can be an emeritus, and it costs seventy bucks a year or something, and you can do pro bono work and the insurance is provided so there is an avenue if that's what you want to do that you can do that. Any other questions? Uh, Diane's not leaving I don't think yet. No, I'll so. stay for a while. Okay, then uh, Jean, why don't we transition okay, to your PowerPoint. Okay. Oh, I, oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. Sorry, thank you. Uh, what about any sense of a public reaction to this? The legal services consuming public? 
and see it as a good thing, positive reception, or is it radio silence? Radio silence. And I think, you know, I'll say that, you know, we handle clients, this is fun, and a lot of, the, obviously, we do all the disciplinary things. And I think one of the things that, um, and you all know this, people who are harmed in some of these ways, especially like people that come to client assistance fund, these are the people that gave the lawyer their last $2,000. This is not big ticket people. And I don't think that they understand the ramifications of hiring a lawyer that doesn't have insurance. Um, unless somebody tells them, you should make sure they do because if something happens. So I, I'm not sure that it's a group that we have surveyed, but I, that would be watching how the client assistance fund works. That would be my comment is that I'm guessing that until it happens to them, it doesn't occur to them that it could happen to them. Got it. Got it. Thank you. One more question. Um, are you monitoring or have you noticed an uptick in claims? Claims are disciplinary when you claim. Either what, like either um, claims against these in, this insurance that against lawyers for malpractice. Just purely adults in five months. Yeah. Okay. Right. And, and are you, and that, that's, I guess that led to the, that well, obviously side, like, yeah. are, you are you going to, are you going to well, be monitoring or will you be monitoring? Yeah, I think that's a good question because I thought about that. Is that going to, um, are all these people that didn't have insurance and now do, is that going to create a, a because if you're not, um, if you've never been insured and you go to get insurance, it's cheap because you have no history. Yeah. I mean, you're treated like a new lawyer, basically. So that's a good question and that's what we're going to have to look at when we get through year one. Um, oh, no, sorry. No, go ahead. I just uh, want to make sure we get to all of the excellent comments of our distinguished panelists. Um, Gene. Yeah, um, how are we going to do logistics? I can do this because I've, I've been led to believe that it might not work. So I'm just saying yes. <laughs> um, again, my name is Gene Liberty. Uh, I started off with being uh, actually drafting the insurance code for Nevada. Uh, then I went to the Legislative Council, I mean to the Insurance Division as Chief Deputy. Uh, I left and I joined a, a California law firm uh, that we formed insurance companies, including the doctor's company. I left in 89 uh, and sort of moved in, in what a lot of people consider the wrong direction. I started insur suing insurance companies for bad faith. Um, and so my background, still today, I form insurance companies and I also sue insurance companies, but I've never sued a lawyer. So um, anyway, with that background, I want to tell you that the, Cal the Nevada Bar, we have 11,000 lawyers, more or less, uh, 8,700 are voting members, um, are, are members. Uh, we have a mandatory bar. We're subject only to the Nevada Supreme Court. We have no dealings with the legislative uh, uh, Senate or Assembly. Uh, we uh, pass no legislation through them. Uh, so we, well, how we adopt things, we have a Board of Governors uh, consisting of 13 voting members, two ex officio being the law school dean and the Board of Bar Examiner. Uh, they're, they're members of our, our Board of Governors. Um, we meet about five times a year. We form task force. Um, we operate pretty much like Idaho um, and other states, except we have no legislative involvement, but we are very supervised by the uh, Supreme Court of Nevada. Um, so we submit everything eventually if we want to get it adopted. We refer to that adoption as an ADKT uh, to the Supreme Court. So we're at the point with regard to, um, I was, I, Going back, the fact that you know that I started, became a lawyer in 1971, I was involved in the malpractice crisis in 1980s in Nevada. Um, the issue, I was chairman of the committee looking at whether what we were going to do to solve the problem. Uh, we looked at Oregon at that point, but our numbers, you've got to remember, and, and that period of time in the 1980s, Nevada was a very small uh, state. We now have several million, but then we had about 400,000 the entire state. We had very few lawyers, so we couldn't look at adopting the, uh, the Oregon system, but so we just didn't have enough lawyers. Uh, so that's when uh, uh, some of the members of the, uh, in Nevada joined with other states and they, they formed a camp, uh, an insurance company, uh, ALPS, and there were other companies formed. Uh, 
during that period of time. So anyway, so going fast forward, uh, you know, it was brought, uh, it, it was started by an, an attorney in Nevada who uh, is a plaintiff's lawyer. He wrote to the Supreme Court, he wrote to the Board of Governors, um, and he wrote to everybody demonstrating a, a couple of really bad examples of cases that came to him where the lawyers, uh, he, he, people came and they were really seriously injured and the lawyers had no insurance. So he said that we should look at adopting the Oregon program or doing something because there are lawyers in Nevada uh, that without insurance that are hurting the public. That was sort of the starting point. The Supreme Court asked us to look in to the insurance issue, the liability issue. Uh, we formed a task force. Our task force uh, was about seven people, so it's a lot smaller than your task force. Um, and we had a, a couple people that had backgrounds in insurance uh, that were on our committee. Um, and so we started a year and a half ago looking at liability insurance. So I think we've, we've started off with a different basis and hit the next thing. We, uh, yeah, the next one. Currently in Nevada, for the last several years, you know, insurance, you have to report whether or not you have insurance at the state bar. Uh, and so we, we don't verify that what they report, but they list their insurance company and they give us the information. And from that information, uh, that was our starting point, because we could look at that and determine exactly how many members of our bar do not have uh, malpractice insurance. Can you hit the next one? Yeah. So we determined that 15% of our Nevada bar uh, is uninsured. And that's, it doesn't make any difference if you're private practice or whatever, if, you know, this is the reporting of the bar. Uh, so we know, starting off, that 85% of our bar is already insured. It's not an issue. So what we started off with regard to this task force, what we looked at is the uninsured. And we, and we sent out a survey to them. And get the next one. So we sent out the survey to them. And, uh, oh, I should mention, yeah, this is important. We already have some mandatory requirements in Nevada for, uh, for insurance. For example, we require 500,000 500, coverage uh, if you serve on the lawyer referral uh, service panel. We require it with regard to our, our mentoring program, all mentors. Every new lawyer in Nevada has to go through a mentoring program for a year. Uh, the people that mentor them have to have um, malpractice insurance of 500000 And then we have special licensure. We have uh, family law, personal injury, workers' compensation. Um, that It's required to have those specialties. You have to demonstrate on an annual basis that you have $500,000 in insurance. So we've had these requirements of mandatory insurance uh, in Nevada for a period of time for certain areas. Next one. Thank you. So what we did is, from the information we get annually, we determined what the top, top 10 carriers in Nevada, actually there was 19 carriers that provided malpractice insurance in Nevada. And as you can demonstrate, as we show, ALPS is one of the bigger providers, but not the uh, principal. Uh, it's the principal provider, but it's pretty much the market's divided up, included, including Lloyd's of London. I, I might deviate here because the judge said something about Lloyd's of London. Um, Lloyd's of London is indeed a surplus lines insurer. Surplus lines means you're not covered by the guarantee laws, but it, they are in fact regulated by the various state insurance departments and, and divisions. So uh, they are considered uh, insurance. So uh, but anyway, so Lloyd's of London, it usually, the Lloyd's of London policies are with the uh, multi-state law firms who have higher limits, and so you, you would find Lloyd's involved in that mix. Uh, but we'll come back to these top carriers, because later on, we invited the carriers to come to Nevada. We, we ended up with three of the carriers, and we wanted to talk to them about rates and whatever, and for the future. Next slide. Okay, so I told you about the survey with regard to the, uh, those that don't have insurance, uh, and we found that 73% uh, are solo practitioners, uh, and uh, nearly 80% are in private practice, 
and that more than 55% uh, are have been practicing law for 20 years or longer. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are the areas of practice, and this is going to come in. We, we determine from the survey what areas these 15% practice law in. And so it, it's pretty much general practice of law. Um, and those that comes in important when you do, do when you're determining rates. What are these 15% if we mandate malpractice insurance, what are they going to have to pay uh, for their insurance? And so uh, so we, we're going to we can develop rates based on areas of uh, common practice or generality that they may practice in more than one area. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we asked these 15%, uh, first of all, these 15%, they didn't all respond to our survey. Uh, that would be highly unusual, but we had a large turnout. Uh, we had uh, 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 at least uh, about 40% of the, these respond. Um, and, and like uh, Diane said, whenever you send out a survey, you hear from the ones that are against it, not the ones that are for it. But, uh, so, but those 15% those we expected, we wanted to know why they didn't have malpractice insurance. And they listed it was cost prohibitive. They were confident in their practice, especially over 20 years. They said, you know, I, I don't need insurance. I've never had a malpractice claim. I can handle it myself. Um, and then there's some that said the practice didn't require it. They do certain types of areas of law that they think that malpractice insurance wouldn't necessarily help. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, we, we, we next looked at how can we measure if there's any harm to a client if the attorney doesn't have malpractice insurance. And uh, you know, the, the difficulty here is there, you know, there's no way to keep track of it. would they have sued the lawyer or did they sue the lawyer and he didn't have malpractice insurance. There's no place where you can really determine that. Um, but we do, and we had a belief that there was a loss in trust and with regard to the profession if those people experienced it. My personal, uh, you know, uh, what I learned, I served on the client security fund, started it uh, 20 years ago. Um, and what I found during that process, and I don't know if you, our client security fund, if you're, un if, if you create, if you steal money, basically, and the lawyer, we have a fund that we reimburse people up to 75,000. Uh, what I learned on the client security fund over a period of years is that we had a great uh, <coughs> deal of claims being submitted to the client security fund by people who, um, actually uh, came to the client security fund because their attorney didn't have that practice insurance and they had claims and we we looked at them over the last few years and we found out that some of those claims were in excess of three and a half million dollars so uh, we and, and it says right there i think i can't read it but 66 percent of the client security fund claims are denied and the past five years were due that they were malpractice and not theft so uh, so it is difficult to measure, but we do have some indications from the client security fund. Next slide, please. So, uh, you know, we, we started off with uh, the concept, you know, what, what, to, um, what did the public think, you know? And, and it was initially thought that, you know, the public thought that all lawyers had malpractice insurance. They just assumed that mm -hmm. lawyers, like other professions, had the malpractice insurance. Yeah. So we, we um, worked with, a, we did some focus groups. In fact, we can have a big uh, program at our, our state bar convention on what the focus groups, what we learned about the practice of law. But what's interesting is that these focus groups, this one and, and the other one, and these, these people are, uh, if you can read, they have uh, their, their professors and they have, they're educated people. And they felt that, uh, you know, we were also looking at this, whether or not the disclosure laws were, were important for Nevada, that you do disclose whether or not you have malpractice insurance, similar to California, because we're required to do that in a retire retainer agreements in California. So uh, we asked um, if they, uh, you know, what they thought 
bottom line is interesting. They they thought that if they, the lawyer had to disclose to them that they had did, did or did not have malpractice insurance, uh, that that would be difficult to start off the conversation. Number one, they would, and, but more importantly, they felt that if their lawyer uh, had malpractice insurance, that that meant that he needed it. So you know, that was, and that he was maybe not the best lawyer to have. Now we have a mix of. Uh, other people that think that malpractice insurance is, is important, but it was it, really interesting that there was a, this discussion that if my lawyer had to tell me whether or not he or she has malpractice insurance, and she, he told me that I had malpractice insurance, I would worry about my lawyer and I may not retain him. So I think the focus groups are really amazing because they, they gave us feedback that we certainly didn't expect. But, okay, the next slide, please. And this is another focus group, uh, you know, with regard to basically some of them believing that uh, uh, that insurance is mandated. Uh, you know, they said, well, I thought it was required. It's required of doctors, CPAs, have it. Uh, and I just thought lawyers and other people said, well, I wouldn't let my lawyer <coughs> have malpractice insurance, but that means it's a bad lawyer. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is our overall uh, findings of the focus group. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's no mention of how malpractice insurance might protect the public. Uh, split on whether it is prudent for an attorney to have it. Uh, has some sort of positive and negative connotations. And uh, so I think that this kind of, uh, if all attorneys are required to have it, the issue of competency goes away. So that's what the end up focus group determined that if they, if they were told it was mandated, they would say, well, then they wouldn't be worried about their lawyer not having it. So, okay, next slide. Uh, so what we did is, going back to the last slide, we, we considered, um, we went into, like I said, looking at the disclosure laws uh, based on the focus groups. Uh, you know, we, we, we pretty much decided that the disclosure doesn't really protect the public. Um, you know, from our focus groups findings, we believe that you know the, the public uh, does really pay attention to protect themselves. Uh, we looked at both this, the reporting to the state bar and also to the clients. And California has reporting to the clients. A lot of states have. It. Yes. I'm sorry, just to go back for a second. Who conducted your focus groups? Uh, it, it was a trial consultants, uh, actually, that I used in preparing for trials, and so I had them do the focus groups in both the Las Vegas and Reno. We have uh, more focus groups, but it was a trial, they, they do it for trial consultants. I can give you their name. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so then we went over and we looked at um, other models, for example, the open market of Idaho, uh, they're mandating it. We looked at, as seriously at the captive carrier concept of Oregon. Uh, we invited Oregon over, we spent a lot of time uh, with them. Uh, basically, uh, the Oregon concept would require us to uh, do legislation to permit our company to be, uh, our, to not be regulated by the insurance division, similar to Oregon. Uh, we would have to do, uh, and we also, Things have changed. In Nevada, we have a captive law where we can the bar to form its own insurance company. Uh, so we also consider the captive market for an association such as the state bar, which is very feasible uh, and it doesn't take legislative changes. Uh, and then we looked at the Illinois model. We uh, Illinois mandates malpractice insurance, but if you don't do it, you have to take CLE. So uh, we basically. It's, it's on risk prevention. Uh, next slide, please. So um, at, at this point, uh, we sent out another, uh, we, first of all, we're totally transparent. We have, I'm writing my president's message about we're considering malpractice. I'm communicating to uh, you know, various conventions of the Nevada Justice Association uh, I'm writing in the NJA's publications. 
I'm, I'm asking for input and we consider that we're considering it. So we're, we're very transparent, transparent with the get we're considering it. Uh, then we sent out a survey, and uh, uh, the survey of all Nevada uh, attorneys, uh, we sent that out, I'll touch in a minute. And then we had other uh, meetings with the Nevada Insurance Commissioner. Uh, we had meetings with regard to Carol uh, Vinnick of the Oregon, uh, she runs Oregon uh, plan. Uh, we had, uh, like I said, representative from Alps, Lawyers Mutual, and Medmark. Uh, of our invitation of 19 carriers, those are the three that showed up. Uh, so uh, anyway, so we, we published some articles. Next slide, please. So um, basically our survey of all active attorneys revealed that um, there were, uh, there was agreement that, uh, that malpractice uh, would protect the public. Uh, there was concerns with regard to the cost and whether availability, and there were several that disagreed uh, with regard to uh, <coughs> whether we should have, whether it should be mandated. Next slide, please. So the current status is uh, the state bar, uh, the task force brought it to the Board of Governors uh, with regard to whether whether we wanted to move forward on it. And it was decided that the, basically for the same reasons as Idaho, that to ensure that all clients are protected, uh, regardless of the firm size, the type of work performed, that uh, we're responsible to make sure the public is protected. And so we evaluated at this particular time, based on what the insurance commissioner uh, said, and by the way, rates, malpractice rates, except for Lloyds of London, are filed, our surplus lines carriers are filed with the insurance division, so that information is always available. But uh, we determined that currently the open market is, is best because it provided the best rates. Uh, however, we, we also discussed the fact that if we may be in the open market and if it became a tight market, we would be in a position to then at that point create a captive insurer and move the Nevada lawyers into uh, an insurance company fairly easily. So uh, that, that's not a, a, a problem, it's just that from the standpoint of financially, it wasn't worthwhile at this time, especially when our rates uh, would be very, uh, would be uh, not, maybe not as competitive as the open market. I, 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 I'm kind of deviating here a minute. Uh, what we did look at is using a, a single insurance company to provide malpractice insurance for both every lawyer in Nevada. And in fact, we got, we got quotes, uh, of rough quotes. Uh, and so how much would it cost to provide 100, 300,000, no, it's 100,000, 100, 100,000 policy. Uh, and we said, what would be the rates for that north and south? Because, you know, uh, candidly, our claim experience in Las Vegas is not nearly as good as Washoe County, where I'm from. Okay. Uh, so uh, we said, well, what would be the price? So it would be $3,000 per lawyer. Uh, so that did not you know, seem like a good direction to go. And plus that, the well, Washoe County, the north part of the state, would be subsidized in Las Vegas. So that's why we went to the open market. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, yes. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I didn't have my microphone. I, I was just, and maybe this is coming up, in which case just, you know, talk about it at the appropriate time. But can, at the appropriate time, can you expand a little bit more on what is the um, exact process that you voted on in terms of the consequence to the lawyer who does not report that they hold the limit, the required limit? What do you do to them? Yeah, well, we did discuss that. Uh, I can raise it now because I don't think I raised it quite. We discussed what happens, what about the lawyer that is, uh, you know, so poor that he can't get insurance, okay? Because my experience is there is a market out there, even for the poorest of lawyers, they can get malpractice insurance. They, there's a secondary market. So it's just a matter of cost. Does that mean that, it's my, it's, it, from our standpoint, our responsibility is to protect the public? Uh, one of the principal reasons, and the honor of the legal profession. And, you know, do we honor the profession and protect the public by letting 
bad lawyers who can't get insurance to continue practicing. So uh, we, we looked at that, but we felt that our overriding responsibility was protecting the public. Plus, it was my firm belief, and I agree with Diane, I think that any lawyer can get malpractice insurance, okay? They may be paying more, uh, they, but, you know, but part of what we're, we were looking at is we're, we're, we're requiring in Nevada, uh, we considered the 100, 300 to Idaho. We went with 250, 250, 250. Uh, the reason is because when you get into a basic policy, a basic policy, the defense cost comes out of the policy limit. So if you have 250 and you pay for a policy, if you pay for a defense, if, if it's only 100,000, you don't have much to where the, the injured party is going to be protected. So we felt with 250, 250, and, and um, so that's why we, we propose that. We're proposing that to the Supreme Court. Although we're also going to be giving the Supreme Court the rates for 100, 300, which we believe are going to be very similar to the 250, 250. Now, the average premium for attorneys in Nevada is 3,835. That includes prior acts. I, I don't know if any prior acts is, uh, you know, if you've done something in, in, in the past, well, let me just start off. If the 15% that are uninsured, if they start their coverage once it's mandated, they have no prior acts. So it's, their coverage starts as of the day and it goes forward. But lawyers, after a period of about five years, that's when you, 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 your premium builds up and it covers your prior acts. So, um, that that premium becomes higher. Yes. I just I want to ask a question, and I'm I'm going to preface it in a very non-lawyerly way, but um, because I feel like it's going to come across combative, and I don't mean it. I just can't quite in my head figure out a way to say it in a different way. But I just want to make sure I heard you right. Um, is the premise of your prior statement that um, if a lawyer does not make a lot of money, that they are a bad lawyer? I didn't say that. No. I know. Yeah, I, what I, I, mean, what I, I said but it, is that I, they, That's why I'm trying to clarify because it's almost how it came across, and that's why that's exactly what I, what I, I prefaced it that way. What I'm saying is the lawyer can't get yeah. malpractice insurance because he has bad past claim experience. Uh -huh. If he has a bad track record and he's had lost, lost you can't even get insurance, then you know that means that he's not an attorney that I would want in the Nevada marketplace to be providing services because. Uh, that means he's a, he's a risk to the public. Okay, so then can you then clarify you in that same uh, conversation you were also talking about lawyers that didn't make a lot of money and I, I guess I missed what point you were making with those. I don't think, did I say something about it money? It sounded like it, you know, yeah. 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 There's a market even for the poorest of lawyers in the secondary market, um, but our responsibility is to protect the public. We don't want to let bad lawyers continue to practice. It was the juxtaposition, I think, that made it sound like if you're so poor that you can't get insurance, then well, you're a bad lawyer. I think it was the juxtaposition of the two comments, because I, okay. yeah, I yeah, it, what, what it, what my comment is, is that if they can't get malpractice insurance, you know, because they have poor experience, okay, then maybe they shouldn't be practicing. That's what I, I it has nothing to do with financially, because I really believe they, they can, you know, you can get malpractice insurance. They, the cost is a different factor. Poor, you meant practicing habits make them yeah. poor, yeah. or you're not poor economically. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 That, that was what I wanted yeah. to clarify. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, Joanna. Um, I'm a part time lawyer winding down my practice. I do a lot of low bono work. If I had to pay 38 35 and I have a tail on my I couldn't afford to practice it. Okay. So well, this really going. concerns me. I mean, what do you? How do you deal that's with the, the part time? Though. That's not. I understand, but well, you know, let me you're, you're asking for a 250 requirement, which is you know, one right. and a half times more than what I currently have. I just worry about those part time attorneys and the attorneys that do low bono work. How have you guys addressed that issue? Well, first of all, like Idaho, Nevada, our pro bono has malpractice components. So any lawyer. If, you know, they can do pro bono work 
and they are insured. What about low bono though, at part time, where you only yeah. have a couple of well, clients? Well, there's, there's, yeah, there's lower rates you can get for part time practice. And practice so credits for, yeah. for low bono. But you still have to get 250, 250. Yes, yes. <coughs> but but you pay less. I, the, our beginning rates uh, with regard to Clark County are about 1500 and for Nevada. For Worship County, it's about thirteen hundred. Right, that's without the tail. Right? Pardon me? That's without the tail. That's without the tail. That's without. That's because it's starting without a prior access coverage. That is right. Yeah. Yeah, Gene, you mentioned that there was when you got the quotes from the uh, the one carrier, the single carriers, to see what it would cost to insure all of the lawyers in the state. That came out around three thousand dollars. Four hundred thousand. For a hundred thousand coverage, and that's without prior acts. That's like an initial. Yeah, order. yeah without prior acts. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the difficulty in that exercise, right, is that most carriers today, when you insure a risk, you know the risk that you're bringing into the portfolio, right? Right. In a situation that Gene proposed to us, which is you got to insure them all, right? We, we're not going to be conservative in that estimate because of the unknown risks that would come into the portfolio. Correct. So, you know, Oregon's model, um, you know, they're at $3,500, right, for, for 300, 300 I think. Um, and, 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 you know, again, there were some things, there were some nuances to Nevada, particularly in Clark County, where, you know, there's just the uncertainty was just going to keep pushing that up. Gene's the original thought is the more numbers I bring to you, cheaper it gets, right? Well, the reality from a carrier perspective is the more uncertainty in the portfolio coming in of risk that I have no clue about, I just got to price that into the equation and I, I'm probably going to not come in as conservative as you might like. Yeah, you're picking up pieces of the market that other carriers had chosen not to take before, yeah. correct? So that's, that's But, but you know, on the other hand, after a few years, if we had it with one market, the rates could go down because what our experience could be better and you don't, you know, so you start off at a high, but yeah, that's, that was it. Can we get the next slide? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the task force went on to the Board of Governors, uh, the recommendation uh, to uh, do, require all private practitioner lawyers to have uh, liability insurance with minimum limits of 250, 250. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, what we provided the uh, to the Board of Governors, the Board of Governors adopted that uh, unanimously, uh, and so we have an ADKT, which is what was required to do this, propose this rule to the Supreme Court. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you, uh, can we get the next slide? Yeah. Oh, the, uh, okay, the uh, objections. So we, we know uh, from our survey of the 8,900 active licensed attorneys. Um, we listed, we had, of course, a lot of objections. I listed what the objections are. They're pretty much what Diane said, reg regulatory. I, I don't like you being involved in my practice. You, you know, what you should require me to do is cost, cost of providing legal services is gonna go up to my clients. Uh, by the way, we had uh, hearings where we invited uninsured people to come into the task Explain. We had one gentleman who had a patent law practice. He said that he couldn't afford to. Um, it would be cost prohibitive for him to get that insurance. However, his bottom line, he said, "I'll just move to another state." He says, "I'll just yeah, I'm licensed other states. I'll just do my patent law somewhere else." Uh, the uh, but we had a lot of people that were also in favor. Next slide, please. That supported it. Uh, you know that. They, they had we had favorable responses. Uh, you know, they thought that, uh, and we also have the support of the Nevada Justice Association, the NJA, who believes that uh, mandatory malpractice insurance should be required. Uh, uh, candidly, uh, you know, there's there's a very vocal uh, group that is against the malpractice. Uh, I received not too kind of emails and some from some people. Complaining, uh, they 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 base it. They think that I sue insurance uh, lawyers, and I need malpractice. I've never sued a lawyer. There's an assumption that I think I do those type of cases. But the bottom line is, is that we uh, we have the support, uh, and I was told by the Supreme Court, which uh, they said they wanted me to provide the ADKT. 
Uh, they are looking forward to seeing it. Uh, they're very interested in it. Um, and uh, we are anticipating that the Nevada Supreme Court will adopt the ADKT. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, I think it was at the bottom of the slide, but I just didn't catch it in time. What's the disciplinary action that uh, occurs to an attorney who doesn't have it? Well, Is first of all, we, there's a fine if they don't provide it within the time period. And if they don't have it, then they would be disbarred. Okay. Yeah. Ours isn't a disciplinary. It's a it's a licensing. So if yeah. you don't com comply with the licensing, it's a, we send something to the court and they would cancel your license. So it's not... It would only be disciplinary if you didn't get it or you did something wrong and be, become mitigating in a discipline case. Yeah, but I really believe if we have if we have a problem, if there's quite a few attorneys that can't get it. For example, be candid with you, um, I do class actions, okay? And as a class action lawyer, it's difficult to get malpractice insurance. So I formed my own insurance company. So there are ways to, to resolve. <laughs> we all know how to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He knows so stuff. It is that. possible, yeah. Has the legislature gotten involved or pushed one way or the other? They can't be involved. They're, they're, they have no dealings. Separation of powers? Yeah. We, we, we just deal with the Supreme Court, and that's the only regulatory entity we have to deal with. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. One issue that I haven't heard discussed really is the issue of, oh, sorry about that. Um, one issue I haven't heard discussed really is the issue of the aggregate. Everybody that does it seems to have an aggregate, you know, so single multiple claims and single aggregate. Is there any discussion about just having, hey, you know, like auto insurance where you just have, you know, it's just a straight per claim limit and then you can have as many claims as you want? Oh, yeah, I've never heard of that for medical malpractice. No. So, I mean, for malpractice, but you're no, talking, about, you're you're talking you about a 1530 insurance. policy? Is that what you're talking about? No, I'm saying in the sense that, look, you know, you have, a, you, have, you have an insured who has four claims over, you know, that it, or he exhausts his aggregate limit. That next, per, in your case, it's just the single aggregate limit, one limit. He exhausts 250, and then the next person, let's say, he made two mistakes that year. That person really doesn't have the benefit of that insurance. I mean, is it just, hey, you know, you can only mandate too much, or was that considered, or? Uh, yeah, so that's being considered, because what we were looking at is the, you know, mandatory insurance limits amount, you know, what would be, and we came up with 250, 250 only because we believe for a basic policy, basic policies are ones where the defense cost comes out of the liability limit. And so we were trying to bring the premium in as, as the least amount, require the least amount to the lawyer, but to do something to protect the public. Actually, the 85% I can guarantee you that are insured in Nevada uh, lawyers right now are at much higher limits than 250, 250, and their average premium is 3,800. So I think we're just, yeah, I, I, we have once we get started, I think we're going to find that the rates are very competitive to start out, and uh, I think we'll, we'll add competition. And if we have issues, then we'll form a captive insurance for those, you know. We'll call in G when the time comes. <laughs> <laughs> and just so everybody has a sense of our timing, we started your panel 15 minutes late, so we have until 1230. That still gives us a good 26 minutes. Um, but I want to make sure we fit in everything in the next 26 minutes. And we're going to start lunch a little bit late and start the next panel late by 15 okay. minutes. But we plan for all of this, so actually we will have time for the panel yeah. Yeah. So um, please continue. Oh, I think that's my last slide, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, you know, I just leave it. Basically, we are at the point where uh, there, we. I will say that I think a lot, great deal of that 15% are not very happy with the fact that we're considering adopting uh, mandatory malpractice insurance. Uh, however, let's, let's just talk about, they, they say, well, I can't afford it or the cost. Well, if you really think about it, that premium that we're going to be charging uh, is you know, you know, very low considering what their hourly rate is per month or whatever. Plus that there's discounts for part-time lawyers that are only practicing, they, they, they can have discounts of 50% of the rates in some kind of carriers. So I think most of their arguments kind of, in my, my mind, in, in the real world, uh, you know, they, they can get insurance, they can, you know, it's, it's a cost of doing business, but it's not a significant cost of doing business to carry minimum malpractice insurance. So, thank you. Oh, just one quick question. Uh, and you probably 
mentioned it, but I just didn't get Make it. Make sure um, you get the, there you go. Sorry. Um, my question, uh, probably mentioned it, but I just didn't uh, catch it, was um, in Nevada already, uh, with regards to disclosure, is there disclosure just to the bar, or is it also to the public? Above? Just to the bar. Just to the bar. And it's, that the information is not available to the public. I had a question both for Idaho and Nevada. Did you explore the costs for individually underwriting people as opposed to having a unitary price? The cost to the bar if anyone were to adopt a program where the bar was trying to deal with the underwriting and the claims management and so forth? Uh, we didn't consider that, except we looked at what Oregon was doing and how Oregon does it. I mean, they, they don't underwrite in Oregon. It's just every lawyer is required to have uh, their, co their, their coverage of 300000 They pay 3500 a year for that. And then they can get umbrella coverages over the minimum limits. Um, so, yeah, hmm. and, and there is no <coughs> in, in, in with regard to the Oregon uh, plan. Um, so, and, and if, you know, that would probably be the case if we needed to form a, a company in Nevada, a captive, because you wouldn't need to, you wouldn't necessarily do underwriting, you would have minimum limits for everyone. Does that answer your question? Yes, minimum limits, but I was thinking the pricing for those limits on an individual basis. Okay. You know, everybody would pay the same regardless of the nature of their practice and so forth. For the minimum limits, yeah, Thank based you. on Oregon, yeah. We didn't consider that. Because I, I don't think we're large enough to make that. I mean, possibly, but I don't know that we're yeah. willing to, to try to do that given our size. Well, it was your comments about talking to people individually on yeah. the phone that made me think about it. It's like California. You can't really do that. Um, that I think, right? I know. <laughs> Somebody's <laughs> promising you that they're going to retire. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. No, I know. <laughs> yes. Uh, Jean, uh, when we spoke, you mentioned to me that you did uh, the round table of the insurers. You invited all the insurers and only a couple. Right. Showed up. Three. I'm, just, yeah. I'm sorry. Three. 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 Uh, can you can you tell me? Did you just for our purposes of our process? Did you find that to be valuable? Is that something you would commend to us? Well, if they showed up, yeah, the three that showed up were very uh, helpful. Uh, actually, they're the ones that uh, uh, you know. Basically, we we discussed about basic policies. We educated the members of the task force with regard to different coverages. Uh, there were different companies were providing. The most interesting thing was that we had one carrier that participated that does not write in Nevada. They only write California lawyers. lawyers. Yeah. So they they participated. Uh, seems that they have a lot of lawyers, California lawyers that are practicing in, in Nevada. That they that they reported, you know, they're covered in, in Nevada. So um, and you know, we we talked to them with regard to basic rates and, and coverages and California lawyers being able to, you know, obtain the insurance for Nevada. So, Chris, do you have a presentation too? I do. Excellent. I do. Let me, I'll jump into a few things. Let me, first of all, just kind of give you a, a basic, uh, you know, the quick two-minute story about Alps, because I think it's, I think it's important for you to kind of understand who we are and the fact that right now we don't even write in this market, right? So it, 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 there's something to be said for, uh, California being, uh, in many ways, just very, very different in this discussion than other states. So ALPS was formed back in the late 80s. Again, the insurance crisis, the hardening of the market, lawyers found it difficult to find affordable and to some extent accessible malpractice insurance. What you saw generally is your members coming to your state bars and saying, we need a solution to this issue. The larger states generally had sufficient risk pools to be able to go and create, to the extent that they wanted to go down that road, their own state-based captive insurance companies. And that's what you saw with a, a whole group of states from California to Texas to Florida to Minnesota to Illinois. Um, it, generally speaking, the states with larger uh, lawyer populations went out and created their own state-based uh, insurance companies, generally referred to bar-related insurance companies. Right, and the whole premise being, lawyer owned, lawyer operated by lawyers for lawyers. You know, it was it it, would, it actually served, in my opinion, a critical point of saying, if, if the market's not going to do it, we can do it for ourselves. And in those states that did it, they I think they did it. And they stabilized the market. 
what, what a whole host of other groups uh, or other states had to do in that period was to say, listen, we have less than 15,000 lawyers, and we're not going to be able to put together a sufficient, sufficient risk pool to be able to get there. Um, and so it, that got folks kind of started talking at ABA meetings and so forth. And, and really the concept behind ALPS was to create the first multi-state bar endorsed insurance company, which we, I think we effectively wrote our first policy in 1988. Um, you know, we, we had kind of four originating states, but it quickly grew to 11 and 12, including Idaho and Nevada within the first you know, 12 to 18 months of our existence. And it was this notion that as a by lawyers, for lawyers, uh, company, we could, you know, we could, we could do the right thing. We could advance the interests of the profession. We could think about lawyer-friendly coverages and policies, and you know, again, and, and commit to educating and making lawyers better practitioners through education and loss prevention efforts. Um, you know, it, 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 you know, Alps was formed about the same time as Alas. I would say that Alas uh, basically works in the large law firm environment. Alps, you know, we have very much focused uh, in our early beginnings in the rural states and really focus our market demographic on the solo and small firm practitioner. Our average uh, number of lawyers per policy in our book, two and a half per policy, right? So 60% of the policies that we issue are solo practitioners. It's not to say that we don't insure large firms, we do. Probably not that many uh, anymore beyond 100 lawyers, but what we have really found is uh, a, a business model and a market niche uh, for those firms that I don't want to say are generally ignored by the marketplace, but there's a higher administrative uh, yeah, churn when you're dealing with the small firm and the solo practitioners. And so that's just a, an area that we have found to be um, very um, kind of lucrative to us, and we have continued to grow and grow over time. This year we'll write approximately uh, $50 million in gross written premium, which will make us, then, and the other thing that's very unique about us is again, we're a direct carrier, right? We don't use an agent or a broker distribution network. Uh, so, in effect, we're the, you know, the nation's largest direct writer of lawyers' malpractice insurance on a very direct basis, meaning we do all of our own sales marketing, we do all of our own underwriting, we, do, we have our own claims attorneys. You know, we kind of, we're kind of soup the nuts uh, in the process. Uh, and, and, and in that process, try to you know, deliver some of the cost savings back to the customer because we can take a 15% commission outside from the intermediary perspective. Uh, so today we are endorsed by more state bars than any other carrier. We're endorsed by 17 uh, state bars. So you, get, you know, again, starting early on, you know, a lot of these were you know, South Dakota, North Dakota, Alaska, those kind of states. But over time, you know, we have been able to pick up our fair share of some larger state bars. Uh, the kind of the ones that come to mind immediately would be Virginia, uh, about 30,000 lawyers in Virginia, Washington, about 30,000 lawyers. In Washington, Colorado, about twenty thousand lawyers in in, uh, in in Colorado, and so I, you know, I think that we, you know, again, what we what we what we drive to do is to be a partner with our state bars to provide, you know, good risk education, um, you know, do the right thing. We, we do not position ourselves, and this is a very important point, as an insurer of last resort. Right? We have a portfolio. The financial strength of our book is important in terms of our ability to deliver good products to the states that we have endorsements with. Um, so we have, you know, we have never said that we're going to be the low, low, the low cost carrier. In many respects, until a couple of years ago, you know, we were actually probably most known for just kind of having the Cadillac policy from a coverage perspective. You know, doing things like defense costs outside the limits. Um, you know, making sure that you know full consent to settle provisions. You know, those kind of things that I would call more lawyer-friendly coverages, right? And so, but we, we are reacting and responding to a marketplace that today is saying, you know, we may not want all those bells and whistles. And for a cost-conscious shopper, uh, I think that we have wanted to think about how we can diversify, diversify our product base to be able to provide some different price points in the market. Um, and as we learned in the, in the Idaho experiment, you know, what generally, experiment. experiment, or it's not an experiment anymore, it's a reality, <laughs> the Idaho reality, is that is that um, is that most new entrants in the marketplace are going to come in and look for what they need to, in essence, check the box to be able to you know satisfy their their requirement as a condition of their licensure. Okay, um, you know, so, so that's kind of the basic history on on Alpha. I'm going to hit on a couple points that I think are, are are may have kind of been missed in the equation so far, and you guys know some of this stuff already. I always like to approach these discussions first of all. Acknowledge that this is a 50-50 issue. 
you know, I, you know, 51, 49 in Idaho. Right? <laughs> uh, you know, just yes. barely got over the edge, right? <laughs> it, it is an argument that, it, it is a discussion and a dilemma that has very quantifiable talking points on both sides, right? And, and I just think that that's an important thing to, to mention because, you know, in many respects, both of these states are thinking about this to say, you know, listen, if, we're, if we were, there's no way that we were going to be able to do this perfectly from the start. And, and just a fundamental notion of don't let perfection be the enemy of progress. And as they've thought about their regulatory mandate to this issue and their responsibility as a self-regulating profession um, to, you know, to, to regulate attorneys, that they have, in many respects, put the interest of their of, of protecting the public, and this is also an interesting issue because, as a bar association, you know, and I facilitate a lot of strategic planning around the country, you know, you're dealing you're dealing with 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 conflicting missions in some respects, right? You have a mission toward protecting the public, and in many respects, you're also a trade association <laughs> for the lawyers that are paying your your your, your dues, right? Not in California anymore. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that's true. That's true. You guys have went through some changes, but but I, I, again, it's, I think it's a very you know kind of interesting issue in that respect. So so I always ask myself, what's what's the issue that we're trying to solve? And here's what I would say is the issue: the, the large number of lawyers who are going uninsured are generally solo practitioners. We have good quantifiable data, in particularly Illinois and 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 in, in Colorado that upwards of three out of every 10 lawyers who are solo practitioners are opting to go bare. It is generally not the multi-attorney, it's not, it's not the multi-member firm, right? When I decided to go into practice with Diane, you know, I like Diane, but I, you know, we each have to cover our, our, our backside in that type of a relationship. So the crux of the issue is the solo practitioner. And I would venture to guess that, you know, if you were to have a, you know, have, sit down and have a lunch with a Chief Justice of a Supreme Court and have to deliver the news that three out of every 10 solo practitioners in our state is going bare, that that would, that would give me, that would give the Chief and, and the Supreme Court some cause for, or the legislature in your case, some cause for concern, right? Um, let, me, let me play the numbers out for you, and I'm only using, Linda's got better numbers than I do, but I just took, took it off of the ABA. You basically have 170,000 active in-state lawyers, okay? Let's play the numbers. 30% of them are not gonna be in private practice. So that's gonna take 170 down to 120,000. We know generally, based upon ABA statistics, that 49% of lawyers in private practice are in solo practice, okay? So that means that your, your quantity of numbers of lawyers in private practice today as a solo practitioner is about 58,300, okay? And if you take three out of 10 of those 58,000, you're basically dealing with an issue right now where you have 17,500 California attorneys in solo practice who are probably out there practicing out right now without malpractice insurance. That, to me, that's the issue, right? Do you wanna do anything with that community or do we feel comfortable with that community operating in that manner in terms of our responsibilities to public protection, okay? So that, th those, are, those are just, you know, kind of the numbers that, that we're, you know, um, kind of operating from, and same numbers we did for Idaho, same numbers we did for Nevada, and, and I think that kind of helps, to me at least, kind of frame the issue um, in some respects. I'd just like to add, uh, the state of Washington is, has a task force considering mandatory malpractice as well, and, and, and uh, I appeared in front of them a couple months ago. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting is that they also have 15%, because they have a reporting requirement, and they found 15% of their bar is uninsured as well. So I think that, it, and, and I think that that's, and, and I was talking to other states, um, just this weekend I was at what they call the Jackrabbit Bar, and. Uh, you were missed. I'm and, sorry. You know, in, in those states, they have about 15% that are also uninsured. So it's pretty much, there's about a 15% ratio of uninsured from all these states. So um, I just thought I'd add that information. So it's probably about at least 15% in California. And, and, and the, the interesting issue that, that we're now kind of, the reality is setting in again with, with, with Idaho's realities. And, and you know, Gene, 
Gene is a hero for making sure that whatever we can do to bring the price down for new entrants in the marketplace is going to actually make his cause for being able to get this enacted easier, right? And, and so is that that's, that's, that's correct, say, yeah. right? And 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 so you know we this is, it's been very interesting to just kind of go through this because you know again what you're generally seeing you know the number of thirty eight hundred dollars for the average lawyer in Nevada. You know, that is generally not what the lawyer who is currently uninsured is going to pay when they come into the market in California. Again, we've talked about tail policy, but let, let me talk about the, just the general reasons why. First of all, they're going to elect the most basic policy. So one of the things that every task force has to get comfortable with is, is some malpractice coverage better <coughs> than no malpractice coverage, right? Because you know, while Diane thinks 100 is right, Gene thinks 250 is right, you know, you know, Scott and I, who defend claims, we both think that that's way low, and that's got us pretty worried, right? Um, but but that's that's the reality in terms of it ties our hands somewhat in terms of sufficiency of, uh, of, of, of limit of liability to effectively mount a good defensible claim for a case where we think that we're in the right. Otherwise, now we just now we're just going to have to kind of cut a check, and and we're going to have to kind of figure out how that plays itself out from a, from a rate perspective. Um, so most of them go basic policy, most of them don't have prior acts. We do need to acknowledge that even in some of the pricing that kind of Gene put up there in, in, a, in a slide, that as, as a lawyer who comes in with no prior acts comes in, there's going to be a maturing factor that goes in that even though they come in at a fairly affordable rate, it's going to continue to increase. In our case, I think it's you know, six or seven years, most carriers six to eight years is the maturing rate. So even if they can come in at a, at a more digestible rate, eight years from now, that rate could be $1,200 more than the $1,500 that it is today, okay? So you just have to kind of keep that kind of notion in mind. And then kind of coming back to the notion of, you know, there are, you know, we, we are facing a tsunami of aging attorneys. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we, we have to be mindful of the fact that we, we don't envision in our forecast that you know the, the practice of law is not a, a profession in which mandatory you know a, a retirement traditional retirement age comes and people hang it up. I think that I think that practitioners, when it's been part of your livelihood and your professional identity for 40, 50 years, we are already seeing lawyers who are moving into their 80s and 85 and 90 year old range who are continuing to practice law, right? And and so. You know, we, we, we have to, you know, we, we are thinking about things like, you know, if, if, if we have to be, we have to recognize that because there's a more limited risk exposure for those who practice on a limited basis, that there's credits built in for that limited exposure. And most carriers, I think, traditionally have that. Heather. Thank you. Um, you're one of the insurance professionals in the room. We have a couple of others, including Scott and um, Brian back there, Kathy, a couple of other people who are in the insurance industry. And for those of us who um, aren't actually insurance professionals, I think we all have one question, which is really important to us as we consider this open market model, which is, um, you know, from your perspective, Chris, would you anticipate any problems with the California attorneys being able to secure insurance? So I thought your number was really interesting. I haven't heard that before. 17,000 small firm solo practitioners who don't have insurance, but that's a fair number based on the you know extrapolation from the data, or probably a pretty solid number. Do, do you anticipate uh, this demographic having trouble securing the insurance? Um, you know, because of perhaps um, you know I, I see a lot of people who have a, 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 a heavy claims history and they just drop their insurance because they can't afford the high risk market. Um, you know, we're going to be hearing later from people who as you've heard already prefaced um, in, in some of the questions, people who you know practice, or people who have experience with attorneys who practice in the low bono or pro bono field, whereas, and premium for that, them is pretty high. So let's just say hypothetically, we were to impose an open market model here in California, what would your comments or observations be in terms of the ability of this uncovered demographic to secure such insurance? It's a great question, right? In, in some respects, it's, it's, it's the key question. Uh, you know, I, I, 
you have to appreciate that there are cyclical parts of the of the market, right? You know, and again, I, I think it is to some extent. You know, the judge is right, right? You know, the, it, right now, I would say that most risks out there are going to be insurable at some price by some entity, right? And that's just kind of that's where the market is right now. I mean, I, if you would have told me that in Idaho, every lawyer would get coverage, you know, I'm not sure I would have made that bet if I would have went to you know Dean State and, and went to Vegas or you know one, one of the books. Right? <laughs> I, I, I'm just not certain I would have done that. I, I do think that you have to go in this and, and say, and, and you will talk to Carol Burnick, who's the CEO of the Oregon PLF. I mean, it's interesting. You know, they they have to defend all claims by all lawyers in the book. So there are, you're gonna hear her talk about stories where there are lawyers in that, in there, that they cover for $3,500, just like everybody else, who are into their eighth and ninth and 10th claims. Where generally what they see, what they're seeing, is that at some point that person's realizing, maybe the practice of law is not a good fit for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they are actually kind of leaving on their own accord because they just kind of realized that you know maybe it's just it just it isn't good for me. So I, I I do think I mean obviously with the with the population of California, you know there there could be a a a, a, a percent. I don't even know what the number would be, but I think you have to appreciate that that there will be some folks who I think will be uninsurable. Let me give you one other data point. So you know again, Alps is an admitted carrier. Um, meaning that we're regulated by state insurance entities, which means that we generally want to take more standard risks than, than uh, risks that would be, you know, high severity or distressed firms. You know, we want to we want to have a good book to make sure that that, that and we're not subsidizing distressed risks out there, right? So some firms make it in to the underwriting um, uh, 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 guidelines, if you will, and, and some firms don't. Now, generally, we have a fairly broad appetite. We have we have state bar relationships. You know, we have a generally fairly broad appetite, but there are instances where we say we just can't touch that. It's just you know the severity risk is too high, the area of practice is, is of concern, or the claims history is such. And again, there are markets out there right now for these types of distressed firms. We, as a part of our customer service in our endorsed states, we then take those risks and say we can't place you, but we have another spot for you. In the last four or five years, we have taken about three to four hundred of those risks to the distressed market, and only on two instances have we not been able to get a price for that risk. Right? You know, it may be a, a high price, right? And, 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 and you, you got to also appreciate, and, and I don't have the data. Maybe others in the room do, who actually do more specific business in in California. Generally speaking. You know, I, we, you know, based upon some conversations with, with reinsurers and others in the market, I think generally California LPL rates are about 25% higher than the average, right? So you got, that's another kind of data point in this equation. Uh, because of the uniqueness of the risks in your data pool, the size of the data pool, the judicial environment uh, at play in California, uh, that generally California lawyers on average pay higher uh, than, than many other states I know, you know Probably both of these states, uh, although not exactly, not not by much. I, I would actually, I, I would probably forecast. You know, in, in our book of business, and again, we're writing in about 35 states. Here, yeah. The average, uh, the average premium per attorney is probably somewhere around $2,800 per lawyer. That, that's including all limits of liability, all different facets of area practice. You know, it, it, again, sometimes it's a, it's a really a bad data point because. You know, we take on all sorts of different types of risks. I would venture to guess that the average uh, premium per attorney in California would be somewhere in the 4,000 to 4,200 range. Um, and, and so you ha happy you happy you are happy right now, happy you are sad, and saying I got to go back to my, you know, again, don't, don't, you know, I, I know that this, this is a public, but I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the data points that I think are important in your deliberations. Thank you. Um, do you have any sense of, of that number, um, that 17,000 that may there's any um, correlation in where they are located. So for instance, is there more of a likelihood that people in urban areas would be insured as opposed to rural areas or high income uh, areas would be more likely to be insured as opposed to low income areas or any any correlations like that? Yeah, I don't think there's any I don't think there's any 
specific data out there. Again, these are kind of more back of the envelope. I would venture to guess, you know, I, I work in a lot of states where access to justice in rural areas is a big issue. And there is some concern in some of those states that, you know, when you tell that lawyer in Scobie, Montana, that they have to have malpractice insurance, and maybe they haven't had it, and maybe they're the only lawyer in a 100-mile radius, but that's, that could be a decision factor in terms of whether they close up practice or not, and, and that being an access to justice issue. But I, I really haven't seen anything in terms of any quantifiable data in terms of heat maps as to kind of, you know, just kind of where those uninsured populations are, are hanging, hanging out and what characteristics are ultimately defining them. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Dr. Hoffman, you I sit on the board um, for solo and small firm for CLA, and so obviously that's kind of my core constituency group. So when we're talking about implementing, and this goes to maybe all three of you, um, so you've implemented these programs or you're about to implement this mandatory insurance, but um, and you have these rates that are right now because these policies are just starting for a lot of these people, but what are you thinking might be the ramifications in eight years when these policies have grown considerably more expensive and are you thinking about different products that you know maybe your your company might be offering um, that would allow these solo small firms to still afford coverage in you know eight yeah. years six years from now it, it's, a, it's a tough question in some respects because we know generally that the claims frequency of solo practitioners is higher than the multi-member firms because they don't have that support network to be able to bounce ideas off of. Do you know what that percentage is? Uh, I could I could get it. I mean, it, it's it, it, it's let's just say it's you know there's a little bit you're going to pay some additional premium for your solo just because of the you know, likelihood of a, of a, of a risk. Um, I, you know I I mean what we are generally trying to do really with anybody who's coming into the marketplace. Um, and, and really kind of coming in with no prior acts is to be a strong and an educator about the realities of what's coming. And we actually find that, that we have more, when we have a highly, you know, our retention rates are amongst the highest in the industry, 90, 90, you know, 92 to 94 percent. That includes uncontrollable lost business like, you know, people dying or, or people merging firms and those types of things. Um, you know, when, when you, when you, uh, you know, when you, when you deal with those kind of um, retention rates, that's what else I'm trying to find. Um, what's your original question? How much will they increase? How much will they increase? You try to just, you, you, or the, the, the point I was going to make is that we see the, the, the greatest defection um, of an insured, and, and, and again, we have, we have insureds who are you know, generally, LPL is not shopped very often. If you haven't had a claim and you mm -hmm. haven't had serious increases in your in your rate, and you generally feel comfortable for your carrier, it's cruise control on renewal, right? Um, it's usually when one of those three things kind of uh, pipe in. But you know, we generally see the most affections in our book in years two and three, when they start to kind of sit there and go, wait, nothing changed with me, and, and somehow I have to keep paying higher rates. Well, the reality is you know, we picked up another year of exposure in each of those years. And as much education as we try to do, you know, we just work in a demographic that, you know, when you can, when you can sometimes save $150, don't make the switch. You know, so it is a very cost conscientious um, portion of, of that particular book. So, I, you know, I, we try to do as much as we can on the education side, but it, it's, I don't know that there's anything we can really kind of do in terms of programmatic, programmatically thinking about kind of coverage things. Um, we, you know, we do do some things where, you know, on preferred renewal programs that if you've been claims free for a period of time and you're basically the same risk and you're fully mature, that you can get into kind of a, a more guaranteed fixed rate program that will kind of, but that's usually when you're fully mature. We only have about five, five women to offer questions uh, lest we run into a rebellion for failure to feed people. So, um, Scott? Yeah, I just had a question. So, I don't know if either state did this, but I was wondering, when you look at the lawsuits for legal malpractice, did you drill down and see like how many people are being sued who don't have insurance? Um, and I'm not sure if you mentioned that and I just missed it. But. Yeah, I, I, I said we looked at it. We looked at, could we determine that? We determined that we couldn't because there's, you know, there's no way to really tell if lawsuits been, you know, not brought because people didn't have malpractice insurance 
or what the issues were. So that we, we had no hold. The only way I could evaluate that was from the client security fund. Those claims that came to the client security fund, instead of pursuing the malpractice carrier, and the amounts of, of the number of claims and those brought. There's no really way to know that if they didn't. <coughs> they didn't sue, but how many people got sued that didn't have insurance or any of that? I mean, uh, well, but if, you're, but if a lawyer, a lawyer is generally yeah. not going to take that case to sue a lawyer that doesn't have insurance, so it's hard to know. I mean, you kind of, yeah. it's kind of a. It was, it, I, I also have done some advising with Washington uh, as well as that in a lot of their task force meetings. They had a couple of plaintiff's attorneys who generally um, you know, work in the area of professional liability and, and notably you know, um, suing lawyers. And, you know, they were basically of the opinion that, you know, I've, I've been doing this for 20 years and, and only on two instances that I went, I went against the lawyer who didn't have the malpractice policy. Um, they so won't take those cases. They just, just won't take them. Other questions for our panel? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that it's, it's pretty easy to place distressed risks or kind of substandard risks and right like finding another yeah. surplus right lines now. market or whatever. <laughs> Are you aware of any states that have considered a captive for that purpose? And I was thinking like the, the analogy here would be the California okay. Fair Plan for like, mm -hmm. you know, high fire sure. risk property insurance, something like that. Actually, uh, in Nevada, that's what we consider as a backup. Yeah, so mm -hmm. the answer is yes, because that you're right. If yeah. you have a difficult market, you create a, 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 a market share where the, you can do it in two ways. You can form your own captive or have those that are writing malpractice participate in that fund. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's kind of the model that the fair plan adopts. Yeah, exactly. Everybody who's an admitted carrier has to contribute to the pool. So. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Unlikely, but did either state discuss any kind of exit strategy, sunset clause? You know, if it went <laughs> south and the rates for a captive, for example, were so high that it was just prohibited because of the hard market or something, did you talk about options? Not yet. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's what you can always do. <laughs> well, <laughs> but sunset clause, I mean, yeah. there are ways yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. To exit a little less precipitously. Yeah. Just wondered if you looked at options. Hmm. Okay, we've probably got to close out. Don't you think, Heather, on, yeah. on comments yeah. here? Uh, and you know, Scott, what about uh, Robert? Is he okay? Will we look possibility? One o'clock, thank you. Okay, that's, that's perfect. Uh, well, a huge thanks to our, our panelists. You guys are really terrific. What subject matter experts were very lucky for your guidance. And again, we realize you all came from faraway places. so. Thank you for that. We hope that you will continue to follow our work, all which is publicly available on our website through the um, video and otherwise. Um, and we continue to also welcome you know, your continued input into our process. So I'll turn it back to you, Randy. Thank yeah, you. thanks. I agree. Great job on, on finding such uh, experienced, intelligent speakers. I mean, you guys are going through this uh, in the last year or so is really helpful and relevant to us. And we appreciate your you're relating to us your experiences there. We are uh, going to take about 15 minutes to uh, get up, take a break, we'll adjourn, get some food, uh, bring it back here. We have our next speaker at <coughs> on video conference at 1 p.m. Uh, so do whatever you have to do. Tom, we're going to sign off for a little bit then? Yeah, good. Okay, thank you, folks. West of the Okay, we have the thumbs up from Tom. We will uh, now <clears throat> go back on our webcast. I'm going to have uh, Scott Barabash introduce our next uh, speaker. Thanks, Randy. So, um, we have Bob Hilla, who's participating. He is the president of the New Jersey State Bar Association. I've known him for about 15 years. He has been practicing for, I believe, about 35 years. <coughs> At least that's what I got from your bio, Bob. Um, yes, thanks. He's a partner at McElroy Deutsch, I'm sorry, McElroy Deutsch, Mulvaney, and Carpenter in New Jersey. And he has um, headed up a 
he added up a group much like our malpractice insurance working groups for the state of New Jersey. They produced a report that was nearly 200 pages addressing all sorts of issues. And in contrast to the presentations we saw just before the break, in New Jersey, they reviewed these issues similar to what we're doing, and they decided against having a mandatory malpractice requirement. So I'm going to turn it over to Bob to give us a bit of an overview of what they looked at, and um, we'll go from there. Here we go. <clears throat> well, thank, thank you, Scott. Um, and, and Scott uh, and I have had a chance to work together in New Jersey as well. He's always been on this issue and he's been ahead of the trend. So thanks, Scott, for uh, taking this on in California. I think they're lucky to have you there. And uh, Randy Miller, I, wherever you are, thank you uh, for getting this set up. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at this alien looking device. So if I have to look up the, at the screen where all of you are, it looks like I'm looking up to heaven. I'm not praying on this issue, but yeah. anyway. No, it's perfect, Bob. Um, we can see you like uh, you know sitting in our living room here, so it's, it's great so far. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, yes, I, what I did was I kind of went back to this. This issue keeps sort of rearing its ugly head in New Jersey, primarily driven not really by the public, frankly, but either the courts, the ADA, or the plaintiff's bar. Um, and in 1991, we had this, and the report talks about it, we had this Michaels Commission that recommended a disclosure rule at that time. Um, the court rejected that, it's had several permutation, which, uh, which eventually led to our committee to look at this. And yes, we looked at it over almost three years. We've met about eight different times. We broke into subcommittees. Uh, we looked at um, both the marketplace, um, the legal market, because this would impact <coughs> the lawyer. They would be identified as the legal market. Um, obviously, the carriers um, who were there, and then also um, you know, the impact on the client. So, um, the, the interesting thing, and I guess, I, I guess the biggest uh, concern that the group had when we started out was that we really had no evidence um, to help to give us a roadmap for why we were doing this in the first place. Um, as I said, we didn't have any uh, client stories. What was interesting is in most of the instances, if not all, that we uh, were pointed to, um, with respect to the issue of mandating coverage, these circumstances where clients were hurt from the absence of coverage were cases where the lawyers actually bought policies. So, you know, there was a concern here that, uh, you, you know, by mandating uh, ownership of a policy or a disclosure did not mean that you were representing or could warrant or guarantee coverage. Although that will creep into some of the discussions that we had where some of the members of the committee, as you'll note in the report, but the vast majority of the committee didn't buy into it, thought we should create a whole new cause of action and I had insurance. Um, but so that that was a concern was to look at that. Also the other issue was we looked at the committee um, and there were some questions about whether the committee was representative of the market because of course it's one thing to require someone to purchase a policy but the court in New Jersey which has a, a monopoly over the practice of law has no power to control the insurance marketplace and in fact even the legislature in New Jersey's history and uh, maybe California's done better in its experience has had limited success extremely limited success both in regulating the insurance industry to make coverage certainly in the oil area um, and and also um, with respect to um, you know making it affordable or accessible to everybody in the marketplace so we had on our committee initially a representative of an insurance company well known well respected however they didn't even write in an in, in admitted basis in new jersey so that was a problem because um it, we have about 25 carriers that are authorized to write on an admitted basis in New Jersey. And um, five of them actually do. One of them is actually starting to pull out. Um, and uh, 
none of them really have a great appetite for the small firm uh, solos to one to five, two to five member firms, which make up the vast majority of the practitioners in the state. Certainly those who serve, uh, certainly those who serve the um, consumer-based public. So what we did was we tried to get a couple of, we got a couple of the brokers that have some significant experience in getting coverage through the marketplace um, to give some input on that in terms of whether, um, you know, we could even, uh, because the, the issue here is if you're going to mandate it and, and the consequences for non-compliance with rule mandating would be the denial of the right to practice. So the, the issue uh, would, would be that, you know, we got to make sure, uh, and we did look at Oregon, uh, which is in the report, um, but you, you better make sure, for instance, like Oregon did, that every lawyer that you're going to give a license to can be protected by coverage. Now, again, New Jersey's not flush with cash. I, I don't know how California is, but there's no appetite for funding an insurance program or a captive type of environment here or um, to subsidize the lower end lawyers uh, who would be disproportionately impacted by this. And you don't need a study really to do that, but um, obviously there were none that were done. So um, we, we tried to get the committee to start looking at, at, at these issues. Um, we did a survey, which is also noted in the report, and I was able to get that over, I think, to your body. Um, and um, we also, at the same time, the state bar in New Jersey had been spending a number of years trying to do market reforms to help make insurance more accessible and more affordable. Because you, you can't require something if you don't create the right environment to allow it to exist and flourish. Uh, because ultimately, nobody had the starting point on this by saying it was a good idea not to have insurance. We didn't really come across any lawyer that said that. There were a number of reasons why they didn't have it. Um, but the, the idea of not having it um, was a consequence of a variety of choices. So uh, the State Bar had done an extensive study of the marketplace. We talked to CNA. Uh, we got, uh, when you compare the Oregon model, we, we got um, some indications of uh, one carrier's national book that costs and the frequency of claims, which you know, indicated that it would be far exceeding what the average cost per claim and the average claim amount was for a state like Oregon. Uh, none of the carriers or brokers could, um, could guarantee that they would write anyone or write anyone at an affordable rate. Um, they said, yes, you could write someone 10 times a premium, and that, and that may be 10 times what the person's making on an annual basis. So they'll offer them the coverage in that circumstance, but as a reality, they, they can't purchase it. So basically, a couple of the things after that study that we came up with, um, we really found no evidence of a problem. In other words, that there was a linkage between the non the, not having insurance and uh, victims of malpractice being harmed. Um, there's intuitive uh, belief on that, but we really have, and I would think this gets back to the other question, where would we go from here? Um, as I said, we have no ability to control what's a volatile market. Um, mandating, mandating, we can't mandate coverage. Uh, you can mandate someone buying a uh, policy. Uh, that is misleading to the public because the policy does not always equate to coverage. Um, also, it directs the public sometimes to people who have higher limits with the idea that they're getting better lawyers. And again, um, we found nothing that related the absence or the presence of insurance or policy purchase to the qualification or the qualities of the individual that was providing services. Um, in fact, you'll see in a number of policies, there's always an ethics provision in there I know the carriers have that in their head on potential malpractice claims, uh, but obviously that also recognizes that there are going to be those types of ethics claims launched against lawyers who actually buy policies. So um, 
to uh, suggest that people without policies have a higher incidence or an incidence of that was again something that we didn't have anything to base uh, a decision on. Um, the disproportionate repeated the disproportionate and punitive impact on the bar and the consequential impact on cost and access to justice for the most economically vulnerable members of the public we looked at. If you do look at, uh, it's interesting, survey results uh, show that there were a number of people who did not have insurance or lawyer. Um, not a majority, but, but some that did. Uh, they were primarily small practitioners. Um, they weren't well-heeled lawyers or well-heeled law firms that are representing blue-chip clients. So, um, you know, you, you need to look at the marketplace um, and whether that can afford product. You also need to look at whether this is going to disturb the market. And when we got into the uh, disclosure rule, you saw some of that in the court. A lot of the thing there was that by creating a duty to disclose to a client, you're now creating another cause of action that could actually be a cost driver in the market and also be a driver that was going to disproportionately impact uh, people re-entering the profession. For instance, if they took off for family leave, young people burdened by student debt that are really looking to anything and they're more likely to represent the general public. Uh, minority attorneys who are going to start with fewer resources through a legal education process and, um, and then consequently uh, may generally wind up with higher debt uh, to start. So um, you're already creating a segment of the profession, the majority of the profession, um, and also that serves the majority of the consumer public that is already economically stressed. And now you need to be careful that by trying to do some good, you're not creating greater harm. Um, also, we looked at some of the legal part aspects in New Jersey. Attorneys are not insurers. Whether somebody has financial assets or a good bank account should have nothing to do uh, with their licensure or ability to practice. If that were the case, we would probably exclude about uh, two-thirds of the lawyers in our state. Um, the public also, it was also noted, some of the members of our committee also raised um, and this is not in the report, I don't believe, but that the public has a responsibility to inquire. Um, and there's uh, nothing to show that the purchase of a policy or knowledge of a purchase of a policy through disclosure would make a difference to that individual in hiring that lawyer or in, in the pricing of what um, the consumer would ultimately be paying. So for those reasons, ultimately, and I think I've kind of summarized that in the report, um, the, uh, the committee recommended to our Supreme Court uh, that we not go down the path of mandating uh, coverage, it's certainly not at this time. Um, and then uh, the issue dealt with reporting, which is really where the ABA rule goes along. If you notice from the state bar's response, to that uh, really doesn't address the reporting issue. I don't know that that's really an issue. We already report for the LLCs, PCs, and um, LLPs to the court. I don't know if you know, anybody had an issue with that. The real issue came down to the disclosure requirement. Um, a lot of the same considerations there, and also this idea that a number, of, a, a number of, the, of a couple of people on the committee. Uh, we're advocating towards uh, allowing that to become a cause of action. Uh, the majority of the group that approved um, the discovery, the uh, disclosure rule, without the subsection C, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, those uh, people figured it's best left to the court for no other rules that address that. And, uh, you know, uh, basically that was it. We, there's no precedent for subsection C. Let's leave it to the court. Um, the ideas behind the disclosure was that the, uh, the public was entitled to a, um, um, a, a proactive 
uh, an obligation on the lawyers to affirmatively disclose rather than to ask the question of coverage. Uh, because certainly uh, there's nothing that indicates that a lawyer doesn't have to disclose if they have insurance if the client asks them. Um, and, and I don't think anybody seriously thinks that you know, uh, that should be the case. So the real question is whether it's an affirmative duty to disclose. What is that duty? In New Jersey, we have a case called Back versus the Lawyer, which says there's no personal right of, or private right of action, civil action, based on a violation of the discovery of the um, RPCs. And this would technically not be an RPC, uh, but it, it would arguably be the equivalent of that. Um, and that would be by clear and convincing proof. But it could be evidence used against the lawyer in a suit for a standard. And as I said, the argument by the plaintiff's representatives in the committee said that, well, uh, it, you know, the client should be able to pursue a claim that it would have chosen someone differently had it not been for someone not telling you that they had insurance. And then interestingly enough, there were arguments that they said that, well, you know, the duty should be ironed out on a case-by-case -case basis in the courts, and that duty should be whether the carrier that was selected, because we have carriers that go under or pull out, uh, was adequate, and or the coverage or the place that the claim was adequate that resulted in a disclaimer. Um, so uh, those were interesting causes of action. At, and, and the report recognized those claims are going to come. What's important about that is the, because insurance, as Scott will tell you, is, is a, the pricing of it is based on risk, not what actually happens. So you, you're, you're trying to price something now that is going to cost you in the future. Um, and if you don't get it right, um, then you're going to get clobbered, and then you wind up out of the marketplace, and you're not going to offer the coverage. So this idea that this disclosure rule that was proposed, uh, if, that, if the court accepts that, the report recognizes there will be claims that will be made against lawyers in this in the situations where the coverages aren't afforded. It's also going to um, be interesting because um, those will have different time periods, maybe perhaps with respect to the uh, the uh, claims made policy issues. It also brings the carriers in almost in every one of those cases. The real problem is, is how do the companies price that? They may turn out to be nonsensical claims that die a quick death, but they're going to have to price that once the rule goes into effect. And again, who's going to bear the disproportionate impact of that? It's going to be the economically stressed lawyers uh, and the clients, the, the lower uh, economy of scale clients that they serve. Now, um, this report has been to the committee, I mean, been to the Supreme Court now since June of 2017. Um, I have had no indication, and as Scott mentioned, I was president of the New Jersey State Bar until two weeks ago, uh, when I uh, uh, was happy to hand off the gavel to John Keith, uh, who was president-elect. Um, but up until that point, um, we have no indication that the court is going to act anytime soon on the recommendations of the committee uh, with respect to that rule. I know Scott had given me a couple of questions, and um, one of the questions was, what do you think New Jersey is going to do? Well, I wish I had a crystal ball on that, Scott, but um, what I think is, is uh, unlikely that there's going to be more study on the mandatory insurance issue. I just think that that's a tiger the court doesn't want to take by the tail. There's a mountain of information that's supported all these reports. And as I said, the bar has one dated May 1st, 2017. We have the June 17 to the 2017 report from the courts committee. That's 171 pages plus attachments and exhibits and appendices. Then we have the state bar's response to that, that that agreed with the no mandatory insurance, but objected to the disclosure rule. That stated January 15, 2018. And then we also had, which I most recently sent to you, there was an effort by our legislature, or one, one of the senators, to introduce a bill 
to committee that would mandate coverage. Um, I supplied to your group the May 14th, 2018 <laughs> position statement that we had prepared and submitted to the Senate Judiciary Committee that was entertaining that legislation. Uh, that was on, I believe, uh, May 14th was that Monday morning. Uh, the bill was pulled from committee that afternoon. Uh, and it doesn't look like there's going to be anything uh, that's going to uh, reemerge in the near future, certainly from the legislature. And that's an issue constitutionally in New Jersey. Um, so uh, that, that um, and, and again, so that's, that's out there. There's going to be an effort to look at some of the comprehensive issues relating to the marketplace to see if that can be eased. I think that that's going to need to be part and parcel of this. I would say that if the court were going to mandate coverage, uh, if the court is going to push the disclosure rule as proposed, I would suspect the state bar will probably issue a statement that says certain anomalies in the New Jersey marketplace that make it almost 50% higher here to write a base rate than in New York and Pennsylvania, which should actually be higher. Um, that those rules, such as the Saffer versus Willoughby case of fee shifting against lawyers and our six-year statute, that those, those issues need to be addressed so that we're not a, a regional outlier in the marketplace and that people try and stay away from us much like individual policies on the uh, healthcare exchanges. So um, I don't know, Scott, if I've missed anything, but that's pretty much, I think, my summary. And if anyone has any questions, I'll try and do my best to answer them. Uh, could you do me a favor and just talk a little bit about how many attorneys, I think there's some close to 100,000, and go into a little bit of the details about how many people were, are uninsured or what you think about or approximation as far as you know you know that, that small group that you're talking about of solos that were going to be disproportionately impacted what what does that relate to because i know pcs and i think llps both have to have insurance so it kind of reduces down some of the number in jersey as far as the uninsured but i know that i also know that there's probably like 100,000 attorneys but uh active members of the bar practicing private or in private practice is much smaller than that. So maybe you can just give us a little bit of the context of what we're talking about as far as how much the makeup of the bar and who has yeah, the Great question, Scott. Um, and it also is significant because we compared those numbers uh, with Oregon. And we did have a great discussion with Oregon's uh, CEO up there about the plan as well. But New Jersey, and again, California is a much bigger state. Um, but in New Jersey, we had currently about 99,000 lawyers, 35,000 of which are actually practicing uh, in New Jersey. Um, the, the last study before then was about 85,000 to 37,000 practicing. So the numbers are trending downward. Uh, we're not you know, certainly attracting members of the bar. Of those 35,000, uh, and of course, we're not uh, 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 we're not a unified bar. We're, we're a volunteer bar organization, um, but we have about uh, eighteen to nineteen thousand of those thirty-five thousand are members of our association. Um, and of course, that does not include government, you know, attorneys and things of that nature. What's interesting from the statistics from our administrative office of courts is that um, in the last data that I evaluated, it's a couple years old, and you know we really need to update it. Um, but at the time, we had the 85,000. There's no reason to believe there's much uh, significant change. So the 99,000 number went in. But the, um, of that, 94% uh, of the law firms in the marketplace were uh, one to five member firms. 66% of the lawyers worked in those firms. In an evaluation of who was insured generally, and, and again, this is a different study than the appendix, and they're not quite in sync, but again, the sample was a voluntary sample in the appendix E, which is 
part of the submission we sent to your body for evaluation. Um, but it looked like, I believe, 90% of solos were insured, 94% of two to five were insured, over five members, 100%. So, you know, again, and this gets back to the first point that we looked at, you know, where is the problem? It's certainly not being driven by the public here, but where is the problem? Um, and, and that sort of led most of the discussion over the course of three years in looking at the problems in, in, in the, the, the marketplace uh, issue um, and, and some of the risk, you know, which are cost drivers in that marketplace. Um, because if you look at those statistics, it indicates that, you know, um, the trend is to get insurance, not to avoid getting insurance. So, you know, our focus should be on trying to make, uh, you know, allow professionals to have that protection. And, um, so those cost drivers are important. Now, Appendix C, we only had about 326 of the 35,000 respond. Um, so that needs to be taken into context as uninsured. 100% um, of them are in private practice. Uh, and again, you know, so they're dealing with the consumer public. Um, about 86.8% were practicing more than 10 years. That's an interesting um, trend. About 97.5% um, of those uninsured were solos, well, 92.3 and then 5.2% were two to five members. So it's mostly solos of that, but, um, and then two to five is the other significant. Pretty much is non, it, it's, as I said, it's non-existent after that, although this had 97.5 probably because some people didn't respond. Um, about 31% of those uninsured say they disclose. Um, uh, the, um, the interesting thing on page 9 of 20 of the results of the survey in Appendix Z to the court's report show a lot of reasons why people don't uh, have it. And some of them are because they're part-time lawyers that didn't want to carry the cost of a policy. Others said it was uh, too expensive for them. Um, and I've had lawyers, uh, solos, um, who have been practicing a number of years. For instance, I had one gentleman, we had a coverage case, and that gentleman had three or four children, um, skipped a year because he, had, he didn't have enough money to pay for a health policy for his family, which is, I think, uh, you know, $40,000. And then, um, so he skipped the year, then he got insurance as soon as he got enough money. So he repurchased the policy. But then the insurer, as you know, uh, because of the gap in coverage, would not insure for prior acts on these claims made basis. Then what happens? He gets a claim. What happened? A claim related to activity that happened before the, uh, the policy incepted. So now he owns a policy. He reported to the client and disclosed the client as a policy. But now that policy is not going to cover. And again, that starts to, if you're going to have to, to warrant coverage, then you're going to have to convert every lawyer into coverage counsel to do their own independent assessment. And I think it's easy to see what's the problem there. What's interesting is on page 17 of 20, 13% of the minority uh, attorneys, uh, roughly, and 83% of the white attorneys, um, are in this category of uninsured. Now, again, um, we don't really have, and this is important, you really need to see what the trending is here. Because you have 74% uh, are, are men, male, but you have 25.5% are women. Um, so you have to look at that portion of the population. Is it rising? Um, and is it rising disproportionately in the solo two to five area? We did not get uh, the numbers drilled down to that extent, but obviously that's an important number to know. Otherwise, in effect, this disproportionate impact is going to have a punitive impact on those singled out in those classes. 
Um, also, it was interesting. Uh, it looked like uh, 80% of the uninsured were over 50, and actually it looked like um, about 52 percent over 60. So what may be trending is lawyers lawyers are retiring from firms, uh, maybe dabbling uh, or maybe just retired, or the firm closed up shop and then they don't get a tail policy. So now they don't have coverage. Um, and and again, you know, that could be in that population. It's significant to know that fact, but we don't know that fact. Um, based on that. Another interesting thing on page 20 of 20, 64.29% of the uninsured in the sample uh, made incomes under 49.9. Um, I don't know, you know, in New Jersey, if you're a lawyer and you're making under 49.9, um, you're struggling. Uh, 50 to 99,000 represent the other 20%, so you have almost 85% of the lawyers that are uninsured are making less than $100,000 a year. Many of them trying to support families. Uh, we don't have data on single moms or single parents trying to raise children, but I, I would venture to say that based on those economic factors, they're probably in that uh, population. Uh, so again, you know, before the court, I would suspect it's going to drill down or mandate coverage those numbers need to be evaluated, you know, even further. I don't know if that answers your question, Scott. No, that's good. That was very helpful. Uh, one question I wanted to ask you is because um, in California there is a requirement right now um, that if you don't have insurance, you have to disclose you don't have insurance. I read your the big back and forth in New Jersey about whether or not you, it should be to disclose it to the client, whether you should disclose it to the bar, or whether you shouldn't have to disclose it at all. Can you just go into that just a little bit? Yeah, there was a real tug of war when the committee opens. Um, and, and if you notice from the report, it was a close, uh, it, it, it really wasn't a resounding uh, endorsement of the position to go with the disclosure rule, which, by the way, is different because it's the disclosure rule of the client, not the ABA rule, which is not to the client, but to the courts. Um, and as I said, I don't think an issue of reporting to the court, filling out a court form, where your issue is and your obligations with the court, and then having that recorded or put in some sort of a database by the court where the public can get access to. I don't think that that's a real issue here, nor will it be an issue, and it may very well be something our court is going to go and do. The issue got into creating this duty to disclose uh, to clients, and then also now dragging, because remember, our rules, um, which, and I, and I think, let me just get the site to it accurately. Because um, a lot of discussion in this in the report um, really starts, um, you know, talks about the pros and cons from 62 to 69. The con is 69 to 75 as to whether they have the disclosure to clients. And then you'll see starting on page 139, really to the uh, end is where the debate goes on back and forth. But we tagged it on to the rules. And as you know, Scott, from your experience in New Jersey, rule 1 colon 21 dash 1, uh, it's A, B, and C. Um, and, I, and I don't have, I don't know why we have E here as opposed to D, but um, those rules deal with the requirements for these certain entities to have insurance. And the reason for that was, uh, you know, a lot of us discussed it in the committee was so that these organizations, which were limited liability companies, would have the requisite coverage. If you were a proprietor or a partner, you were personally obligated to the full extent of your assets on that claim. So, you know, there wasn't the same consideration to um, require a flooring of $100,000 in coverage, whether or not that's even there, because uh, some of those. Uh, numbers don't even make sense when you add them all up based on the number of people in firms. Like ours, it has 300 lawyers in 16 states. Um, but, and I, and I was a sole practitioner, Scott, as you know, a long time ago. But 
basically the you know the, the issues there with the disclosures there was there was a lot of trouble with it based on the concern that it would create a duty uh, to the client uh, that therefore it would create additional disclosure. And, and uh, even though there was some language we tried to get in the rule that said that if you report it consistent with that, that, um, you know, it sort of was like a safe harbor. And you know how well those work under HIPAA. Um, but uh, it, again, I, a lot of us felt it didn't go um, far enough. And certainly a lot of the lawyers on the committee that represented the minority or the unemployed or underemployed component of the profession uh, had great concerns about uh, that as well. So, um, you know, I think that, I, I think that that was, that was a major concern on, on that component. Um, if you could have somehow some immunity, and that's why we created subsection C to make it clear that this was not going to creep another cause of action against lawyers in New Jersey for a violation of this rule. It was just between the court and the lawyers. The other interesting thing and important thing I want to underscore for your committee is that it's, it's a moving target in a year. You know, if you're, if, if you're going to start representing a client, um, you can give them, yeah, I purchased the policy. This is the policy in effect. But that representation may last a number of years. Your, um, your uh, insurance, though, may change drastically during that period of time. So now there's a question, do you need to monitor and notify every client, existing client, every year of every change in your coverages? Um, and again, that seemed unrealistic um, to a, a number of the committee. Um, and um, you know the concern again with this rule subsection C, which is pretty almost an even split. Uh, maybe we had one vote against, which is why it didn't carry. Um, but and I don't remember specifically, but that was to avoid that. Um, again, you, you know, with the court, if you report on an annual statement, when you do that statement, that is accurate as to that statement. You report one thing to one body at one time. Now, with this disclosure requirement, you're going to be constantly, and not only wait doing it on an annual basis, but whenever your policy comes up for renewal or gets canceled or whatever, you know, arguably, you're now required to notify the, um, the uh, uh, clients, every one of your clients of that change. And again, I, you know, that, that becomes punitive, I, I think, uh, but that's my thought. I know a number of the committee we're concerned about it. Certainly, when you're a small practitioner and uh, or a small group of practitioners having to go when, whenever your um, insurance comes in, and you know, now you have to pull every file and send out a notice um, every year when your registration comes in. You just have to send out a notice, whether okay, it's the same or whatever. Uh, we just felt that that wasn't serving any real legitimate purpose. Um, in terms of the overall balance here, I mean, you know, that was that was overkill on a problem that we didn't, even, that we weren't even sure existed. Thanks, Bob. I wanted to open up. I, I'm only about five more minutes, um, but I just wanted to open up and see if anybody has questions for Bob. While we have him on the line, I did. Uh, Bob, Randy Miller. Uh, so, what's the mechanism uh, that the Supreme Court will follow? Uh, if you know, in assessing the ad hoc committee's report, or maybe even also the letter from the New Jersey State Bar? Well, the mechanism, uh, very similar to regulations and uh, anything where it's put out for public comment. Uh, it was put out for comment. We submitted our comments. Um, the period for comment is closed. It's now in the court's hand to really look at it and decide what they're going to do. Um, they have a constitutional uh, mandate um, to uh, regulate and oversee the practice of law, who's licensed, how you're licensed, those requirements. Obviously, uh, they can't, other than a case in controversy before it, regulate markets or anything like that. But um, it, it's now in the hands of the Supreme Court, basically, to um, 
create a rule. Now, if the rule comes out and the bar is not satisfied with it, certainly um, the bar is free to urge the court to either look at it again, create another committee, send it to professional liability committee, um, which exists on an ongoing basis uh, for the court since this is a civil uh, rule bait. Well, um, it's interesting actually, it's a general practice rule, so even criminal practitioners, municipal court practitioners, tax practitioners, everybody will be covered by it. Uh, but the question is, since it's in, in, in that section of the rule, I also served on the Civil Practice Committee, so it could, it could be urged to be looked at there, or the uh, Professional Responsibility Committee. Those would be the two most likely for the bar to raise an objection as to whatever the court does. Now, generally speaking, the court will issue rules uh, on its two-year cycle. Uh, this is really wasn't on a two-year cycle, uh, but this, for instance, civil practice rules will be issued um, coming out in July to be effective in September. Whether this rule will be among them, I, I don't know. Um, given the strength of the bar's objection um, on the disclosure, I, I don't know that the court would completely disregard what the bar is saying. Um, I do know our court is always concerned about not impacting negatively um, the more disadvantaged public and or um, you know, the, the, the more vulnerable practitioners. I, I, I'm sure and confident the court does not want to do that. So whatever they're going to do, they're going to try and do and see if they can do it without that. They could take an approach where they say, you know what, we're just going to require um, reporting to us. We'll have it on a list. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Uh, but again, when that will happen, um, there is no timetable for this. Bob, this is Randy Morgan. Did you come to any um, conclusions about whether there was any verifiable information uh, as to whether there were victims of uh, uninsured lawyers in New Jersey? Um, there, there are cases, uh, and we looked at some of the cases. I, I can't say that we actually looked at them exhaustively, except that I'm sure the members of the plaintiff's bar, uh, plaintiff's legal malpractice bar that were on the committee, two, two of them, you know, who do a substantial amount of it, uh, would have thrown that at us and put it in the report. You won't see that in the report. Um, so I, I, um, I, I didn't see any. Um, the case law that was out there, as I mentioned, um, seem to uh, relate to cases where the lawyer had purchased a policy, but for what, whatever reason, the the, um, the carrier declined coverage, and then of course that wound up as a court case. In some of those cases, the lawyer was successful, and others the lawyer was not. Um, there are two cases that are interesting, and they're back to back in New Jersey, and um, I think. Scott, when, when Zork first started, which was a, in his prior life, uh, when they first started doing some work, um, uh, remember Scott Sparks? Yeah, um, And uh, Zucker, Zucker, Zuckerman and Zuckerberg. I, I forget, one, one actually um, uh, validated claims made policies for lawyers in New Jersey. The other one converted uh, the claims made policy to an occurrence policy, in essence, because there was a question whether the lawyer knew that the non-offering of full prior acts coverage comported with the concept of a claims made, which cut off claims in the future, but wasn't designed to cut off coverage for claims in the past. Uh, so those two decisions came out, I think, Scott, what were they, the 1980s? Long time ago. Because, uh, the one was uh, Justice Justice Stein, whose son was with me on the committee. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking it was probably around somewhere in 1985. Um, but anyway, uh, so so I don't know if that answers your question. Really. Yeah, uh, it's one of the things we struggle with here. And actually, most of the folks that we have communicated with about mandatory legal malpractice issues uh, have run across the same information. We have sort of anecdotal stories about 
victims of uninsured lawyers out there, but no real bona fide way of collecting that information. So maybe neither here nor there at the end of the day, because I think we know intuitively there are certainly, there are victims, but how to categorize that or, or quantify that in some way so that the folks that will review our information and conclusions at some point will understand how we assess that. Yeah, I mean, the, the trick on it is obviously getting getting good information and accurate information um, and getting quantitative uh, sufficiency such that you can really identify what that there is a problem. Then the next issue, though, that we tried to explore and we couldn't answer again was what was driving the uninsurability or the non-insurance the non purchase uh, by lawyers. Um, if, if that was a significant um, cause of harm. Um, and then, of course, you know, if, if it was attributable to a market, then, you know, on one hand, you don't want to deny after, after s sending someone through three years of um, education and diverting this human capital towards that task, acquiring a sig significant financial burden, uh, going through professional hazing, which is the bar exam, and, and then, um, you know, and then giving them a diploma, but then saying, if you can't buy insurance, you can't use that. You know, we needed to make sure that, you know, that was not a result that I don't think anybody in the committee was comfortable uh, mandating, certainly, or, or, hope, or recognizing it as a consequence. So I think that the real key there was that, that, that if we got the information in the first two categories, we needed to wrestle with how to make sure that everyone was able to get insurance. And frankly, there's only really a couple of ways. One is obviously Oregon's captive program. Um, then how do you put all lawyers, including those who are uh, perhaps economically disadvantaged or whatever, but no less uh, qualitatively um, uh, advantage. Um, in other words, they have the same qualifications, the same abilities, but they just don't have the same economics to back them up. Then, then are you going to create a system that's going to subsidize their cost so that they're on an even, equal playing field? It's not fair to make somebody who's struggling out of law school, can't get a job in a firm maybe like ours, and has to go out or wants to go out, hang or shingle, serve the community they live in, struggle to make ends meet like we all have had to do, but then have to pay the same policy premium, actually, if not more, because they're in, in the higher suit areas, which are the ABA studies results were real estate, per, plaintiff's personal injury, uh, which is interesting because that's a contingency-based fee arrangement, um, trust and states, family law. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, where's the fairness then that that person should be paying the same or greater premium than, let's say, I would yeah, um, in my practice? Yeah, no, it's a good question, Bob, and um, I think we're going to have to end it here. I really appreciate taking your time out of your day um, to do this. I think um, this has been really informative, and um, the report you guys put together is, is spectacular. So I just want to thank you again for all of us, and um, I, we have another presentation coming up as soon as we're done here. So um, I'm going to turn it okay, back to you. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks again. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Really yeah, Bob. impressive Bob. work, helpful thank information. Thank you very much. Thank you. And all the best. It's a great, it's, it's an important project, and I wish you guys all the best. For success. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Take care. Bye bye. So, Heather, are we? Oh, we're going straight to Connie. For okay, nice great. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And All right, Connie. We're time crunched here, so yeah. that's why we, one of our speakers has to leave. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I will go ahead and start with introductions. They're setting up a PowerPoint, so I'll go ahead and, and talk. We have our two speakers who are sort of off center here, but they are over there, so you can listen to me and look at them. Um, they are going to each give a presentation, um, a little PowerPoint presentation, just 10 minutes each, and then we'll go ahead and ask them some questions, sort of the same um, procedure we've been going through. The first person to speak is going to be Professor Andrew Kuschera, who has been teaching at San Joaquin College of Law in Clovis, California since 2013. In 2014 and 2017, he received the Adjunct Faculty of the Year Award. 
Professor Cochera is also a partner at Palmer Cochera LLP in Clovis, California, where he practices real estate and business law, landlord tenant law, and estate planning. Professor Cochera is admitted to practice in all California courts and the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of California. Professor Cochera was valedictorian of the 2013 graduating class of San Joaquin College of Law, where he obtained his Juris Doctorate with high honors. At San Joaquin College of Law, he received the Dean <coughs> and 17 Witkin Awards for academic excellence. In 2005, Professor Cochera obtained a an MBA from the Craig School of Business at California State University, Fresno. And in 1997, Professor Cochera obtained a bachelor's degree cum laude with distinction in economics and a minor in real estate from San Diego State University. Um, Professor Cochera is here because he teaches a class at San Joaquin College of Law called Practice 99. Practice 99 is a class that teaches um, students about how to provide low bono services and I'm going to now read a little blurb about that class. Few consumers of legal services can afford to pay prevailing market rates. Some qualify for government subsidized legal aid services such as Central California Legal Services which is the legal aid for the Fresno and Central Valley region of California. But the other 99% often go underserved due to socioeconomic or geographical barriers. Practice 99 teaches law students how to start and grow a community-based law practice that serves modest means or low bono clients, commonly in rural areas. Students learn how to use law practice technology to market and deliver legal services and how to build a sustainable, profitable practice while also expanding access to legal services. Practice 99 focuses on community lawyering and the four core areas of law practice, management, marketing, technology, finance, and management. This includes cloud-based practice management platforms, online delivery of legal services, building streamlined revenue models, and grassroots marketing. Law students leave Practice 99 empowered with fundamental tools for starting and growing a law practice of their own and ready to serve the 99%. So Professor Kachir is going to talk to us about how students and lawyers who practice in this low bono arena may be affected by what we are talking about today. So if you can welcome, please, Professor Kachir. <laughs> and next to him is Cynthia Chandler, who's also a professor, but she didn't really put that as a title. Um, she is the director of Bally, the Bay Area Legal Incubator. As director of Bally, Cynthia's work is 90% fairy godmother and 10% fixer. She coaches attorneys to help them realize their dream of building successful law practices while promoting social justice. Bally is an Oakland, California-based social mission legal incubator launched by the Alameda County Bar Association in partnership with five Bay Area law schools and the Alameda County Law Library to accelerate the, accelerate the launch of affordable community law practices. Cynthia has over 20 years experience as a social entrepreneur, activist, academic, and attorney. She co-founded and built several innovative legal organizations, maintains legislative practice, and is an adjunct professor at Golden Gate School of Law. Cynthia has received numerous awards for her innovative legal work, including California Women Lawyers' prestigious Bay Stender Award in 2015, Women's Health Ad Activist ne Network's Top 30 Activist for Women's Health in 2005, Ford Foundation Leadership for a Changing World Award in 2001, and California Law Business Attorney, to whom California can be most grateful in 1997. Cynthia received her JD from Harvard Law School and a Master of Philosophy in Criminology from the University of Cambridge. The Bay Area Legal Incubator is a community of solo attorneys dedicated to providing affordable legal services and promoting social justice. It is not a law firm, but rather a social mission community with a physical hub and online network for individual California licensed attorneys committed to serving people of modest economic means. Each individual attorney operates his or her own distinct independent practice. 
No legal representation or relationship exists in any way between Valley and any of the clients or prospective clients of the attorneys within our or that their community and or any user of the website um, of Valley or its affiliates. But Valley does provide a two-year program to help attorneys accelerate the launch of solo practices serving low and middle income clients in a wide spectrum of practice areas. Local communities benefit from access to legal assistance and attorneys benefit from a shared community, office space, free resources, mentoring and training in emerging best practices and technology. So thank you for being here, Cynthia. So Andrew's gonna go first. He has this PowerPoint and I think Linda has the controls. Great, thank you Connie for the introduction. Uh, we were asked to talk about today the potential impact of mandatory malpractice insurance on uh, low-income clients. Um, uh, Linda, next slide. Please. So the context of Practice 99 is the issue of access to legal representation, and that's a subset of the issue of access to justice. Um, our take on access to legal representation is that the government can only do so much to solve the problem which is essentially throw money at it, and they only have so much money. Um, the idea or the concept behind Practice 99 is the private market approach to solving the access to legal representation problem. Um, we believe that the private market has an almost infinite ability to, to solve that problem. Um, and I'll show you how we're going to do it. Um, next slide, please, Linda. <coughs> uh, so Practice 99 is... <coughs> Um, it came from the idea of practice for the 99%. Um, we have a very small segment of uh, consumers of legal services that can afford to pay market rates for legal services, and we have a very small segment of um, the legal market that can qualify for free legal services. Uh, and then we have everybody else in the middle, and that's what we call the 99%. Now, we don't have empirical evidence that it's 99%, but it's substantial. Um, and so you get the idea. Um, and so that's our definition, is everybody in between um, the affordability of market rates and you know, not qualifying for legal aid. Um, intentionally, that's a very broad segment. Uh, it's not just <coughs> socioeconomic, so it can also be a geographic. Um, Practice 99 also focuses on um, you know, areas, especially around the Central Valley where we are, um, where the market may have enough money to pay for legal services, but there physically are no lawyers where they live. Um, and, and that creates a significant, significant problem as well. Um, and then next slide, please. Uh, in our Practice 99 class, we do discuss uh, malpractice insurance, and we discuss it really in two contexts. One is as a risk management tool, um, and that answers the question of how do the non-cost factors of malpractice insurance help lawyers manage risk. Um, and that comes out of the practice management part of the class. Um, the other context is as a line item expense in the revenue model. And that answers the question of do the cost factors of malpractice insurance justify the reduced risk? And so we teach our students to think critically about this. We don't necessarily recommend that they get malpractice insurance or don't, um, but we do teach them to think critically about that decision. Uh, next slide, please, Linda. Uh, practice 99 revolves around what I like to call a streamlined revenue model. So where our Practice 99 lawyers are serving clients, there is a direct link between the client paying for the legal services and the lawyer providing the legal services. So I represent low bono clients also. Um, when I do, I'm the one on the other side of the table providing services. They're the ones paying for it. Um, that's a very direct link. Um, that streamlined revenue model naturally has to focus on the expenses that are involved. And um, part of our class focuses on what exactly are those expenses uh, and how much are they. And not surprisingly, malpractice insurance is not just a significant expense, but likely the most significant expense that um, a Practice 99 lawyer might have. So anything in that revenue model as an expense um, really needs to be uh, 
targeted and subject to um, you know, constructive criticism of whether or not it's necessary. Um, next slide, please. So this is taken directly from our um, class session on what are the expenses of uh, starting and growing a new law office. Uh, the most expensive one is probably office rent. However, um, that's arguably not even necessary. Um, many, uh, many lawyers now are opting for virtual offices uh, that cost nothing. So if that expense is zero, the next highest expense is malpractice insurance. Now, I listened to some of the other um, speakers earlier, and that was a little bit enlightening for me because maybe my estimate of $500 to $2,500 annually is low. Um, the reason the $500 is in there is because, I, I'm sure as you know, um, Lawyers Mutual has a very incredible program that we suggest um, for new solo lawyers. Um, you know, I expect without that program that you know their first year premium might be somewhere around $2,500. Um, that was just kind of my ad hoc estimate based on my own experience paying for uh, practice insurance. Um, so, uh, but then again, uh, that lawyer gets to decide because right now that's an optional expense, you know, is that even necessary? Uh, the next expense, which really is mandatory, is a practice management platform, but now we're down to about $600 annually, and then your CalVar dues, which of course you have to pay, have about $500 annually. So when you look at where malpractice insurance stands in relation to the other expenses that um, a new solo lawyer trying to start and grow a practice 99 uh, law firm would incur, uh, it's, it's likely the most significant expense. Um, I, I think it probably warrants a little bit more of an explanation of, of what, um, what I mean when I talk about low bono service. So market rates in Fresno for uh, legal services are between $250 and $450 an hour. Um, with low bono service is probably sub $200, you know, most likely $150 and, and less. Uh, and so what we teach our students to, to do is uh, start and grow a community-based law practice where they can charge clients between $50 and $150 an hour, and they will, they will make more money than they will as a first-year associate at a medium or large firm, um, and also be providing low bono services to consumers that don't have access to it because it practically doesn't exist. Um, so that's really all I have. Um, is there one more slide, Linda? Maybe I have. Yeah, so th this kind of I already discussed, but um, the direct effect that that malpractice insurance has um, could result in a lawyer either deciding that they can't serve as many low bono clients um, or decide not to do this at all and you know go join a firm or, or discharge full market rates. Um, that effect is amplified a little bit in small firm environments. Um, specifically because of the availability of that LMIC policy or lack of avail availability of it for uh, firms. My own experience is um, I partnered up with another solo lawyer. Um, we each were in our second year of those ML LMIC policies. Um, and as soon as we created a partnership, that policy was no longer available. And then our malpractice insurance together more than doubled. Um, and so with a solo lawyer looking at providing um, low bono services in a practice 99 type firm, um, it's really a significant deterrent for them to do anything other than solo practice because of the availability and expense of those policies. Yes? Um, just actually, can, can I just make a quick, quick comment? We are losing Cindy at 3.30. Oh, She's yeah. out the door at 3.30. I can, so stay, I, I can stay till 2.45. You can stay till 2.45. 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, okay. I just wanted to make sure we don't ask a whole bunch of questions and then you don't get to talk at all. So I would, um, you know, my, my suggestion would be if we could get through both of their presentations and then ask the questions. Otherwise, we may not get to hear. And I'm sorry, Kathy, for cutting you off, but I did not uh, make it clear that we lose Cindy. <laughs> Yeah. Should I just? Yeah. Why don't you? Okay. So then. The I think slide. the next slide is. Yeah. The next slide should just travel right through. And actually, so I'm Cynthia Chandler, and I can move to the next slide. So, um, 
So I'm before Can I want I, I also so to make sure that your mic is on. Mic is on because they're not going to work here. And I should have said that. Aha. My chair <coughs> will not roll over. A little closer. There we go. Is that working better? Yes. Yeah? Okay. So um, I too am working with folks building modest means uh, low bono practices. Uh, before I get into the nitty gritty of what it means to build a legal incubator and what I'm coaching and training people on and the trends I'm seeing, and also I should say our incubator, like most legal incubators in the country, mandates um, that folks have malpractice insurance. So I have some experience with how that mandate is impacting people building. Uh, low bono practices. Um, I always like to start with uh, sort of a dedication to one of my clients. This is sort of a pattern tradition I have, but also just to remind us, especially with a conversation that's around protecting the public, um, who those folks are. Uh, so, and it also is a way of just sharing my values um, that I'm bringing to this conversation. So I wanted to dedicate my little presentation to Rosemary Willoughby, who was one of my very first clients as a baby lawyer back in the 1990s. Um, so, uh, I worked for many, many years doing human rights work and uh, civil rights work with people in prison. And that's an interesting population because it's a population that has such limited access to legal resources that there's an exception, an official legal exception that allows folks in prison to practice law as non-lawyers legally because they don't have access to lawyers. And in fact, most of my most formative mentors in the law were non-lawyers who were in prison. Um, and Rosie was one of them. Um, so, Rosie uh, was a person who was very out in public and published lots of things about living with hepatitis C at a point where the hepatitis C epidemic was very much not understood. Um, and people were literally dying every single week in California prisons in the 1990s due to liver disease and liver failure. Um, and Rosie uh, contacted me as a baby lawyer because she heard I was interested in issues of healthcare access. And she said, let's make a class action happen around hepatitis C care. And I didn't know better to say no. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll communicate with you. I'll figure out what research you need. We'll see if this goes somewhere, blah, blah, blah. And meanwhile, she became an incredible uh, triage staff person for me, frankly, with my practice. Um, and we worked really hard at connecting and empowering people in prison to contact treatment nurses and get a feedback on what they could demand for their care. And we started getting the care level in the prison where she was at, which was the world's largest women's prison in Peru. Um, only Rosie really pissed off the chief medical officer at that prison. He could not stand her. Every single day, people would be checking in with her and then going to him and demanding more care, and he was irked. So one day, after we had been doing this, we had this, we had this machine going of her referring people to me, we were doing this work, we were starting to actually seek out co-counsel for a large class action, and I'm like, yes, this is awesome, this is what I want to do. One day, um, the chief medical officer falsified uh, some medical forms and claimed that she exhibited signs and symptoms of tuberculosis so that she could be pulled out of her cell, sent across the street to a brand new prison that had, it, had a uh, vacuum chamber isolation treatment center for tuberculosis, and taken out of his prison so he did not have to deal with her. The only problem was that she had advanced liver disease. So he sent her and had her sent over there with orders to administer TB meds without sending her medical records. Um, it took me about five days to find out where she was. By the time I could figure out on behalf of her family where she was, uh, her liver was so badly decompensated that she died shortly thereafter. So one of my first clients, and I didn't do anything ethically wrong, right? But one of my first clients died because of her work with me and because of our legal work. That started a pattern and practice for me when I teach students and when I teach young lawyers of always insisting that people place primary this idea of not doing harm and allowing people to make decisions about how your legal decisions with them impact their daily life in a way that sometimes you can't even imagine, right? I also realized that she was in an environment where she had absolutely no ability to exert her legal rights. And as an unrespected young baby lawyer, I had very little ability to effectuate her legal rights successfully as well, right? And so it's an interesting story, I think, and we can go on to the next slide, um, to think about how we balance these two things, of like, how do we make sure people have access to any sense of justice, and how do we make sure that we actually protect vulnerable populations? 
Um, and so I, I feel like I've lived and breathed this conundrum every single day, so I thought I would start with that. Um, so years went by, and now I'm the fairy godmother, the um, County Bar Association's Bay Area Legal Incubator. Um, and what this our incubator is part of a movement of incubators. Um, five, ten, five years ago, there were about five of these in the country. There's now five legal incubators in the San Francisco Bay Area alone. There's 13 incubators in our state. Um, they all have a commitment to addressing the justice gap by training attorneys to become community stored attorneys, is the way I think of it. Becoming community attorneys who, who provide services to low, low income and medium income clients. Um, uh, we've taken ours a little bit of a step further, where we want to acknowledge that access to justice won't really happen until we diversify the pipeline of who becomes an attorney. Um, until we actually allow uh, middle and low income communities to be empowered to shape the law and to shape what justice is, we will only be giving people access to an injustice system. So we want to actually effectuate that pipeline too. And with that, with that in mind, um, we try to select a diversity of attorneys into our program. So um, I just wanted to give you an idea of the diverse folks coming into the program. And I also want to say these are folks who are selected with a particularly onerous selection process. We want attorneys doing this work by design, not default. I cannot coach someone to build a business if they are unemployable, okay? If they cannot succeed in any arena, they are not going to be a great solo. Building a business is a really hard thing to do. Um, so, the folks who have come into our incubator were two and a half years old. We've taken in 35 people so far. 82% are people of color, 58% are women. 38 identify on the LGBTQIA spectrum, 24% are immigrants, 36% are first generation citizens. Um, they speak collectively over 10 languages. 22% um, identify as living with a disabling condition, which by the way, makes it very challenging to be a solo because you have to figure out how to accommodate your own disability as an employer for yourself, which people do not always have the best ability to do if they have a disability. So it's, it's been, that's an interesting coaching element. Um, let's see, in terms of age, what was interesting is I sort of expected, and in the, as part of the design team, we expected all these folks to be super newbies, baby lawyers coming out of law school. But really, most folks coming directly out of law school don't have it in them to by design be building a venture, okay? So the ages are a little bit different. 43% are between 25 and 29, Whoops. with most of those being near the 29, 28, 29 age. 43% uh, are also 30 to 39, 2% are 40 to 49, and 4% are over 50, um, which have been folks who are coming back for new careers as opposed to leaving the law. After either retiring or getting burnt out or reaching a certain level of dissatisfaction with their prior legal careers. Um, let's see, what, an important part to emphasize is that, um, so I have one person in the program who's been in practice for over 30 years. I have one person in practice for over 15 years. I have two in practice for over seven years um, and two in practice for over five years. What? Oh, okay. Um, so uh, what's interesting about that also with student debt over 50% owe over 150,000 in student loans, 15% owe over 250,000. And over 50% of the folks who have come into our incubator qualify for public benefits themselves. Um, so they're coming in with not a lot of economic safety net in building practices. And yet, these are really the kinds of folks we want to build practices. Super talented, motivated folks with a really great business design who come from communities that they want to serve. And we can go to the next slide. Okay. So... I wanted to talk about some of the lessons learned. As I said, we mandate that folks have malpractice insurance in part in order to shelter the program itself and the law school sponsoring the participants from any liability. Um, despite the fact that we have disclaimers making it clear it's not a firm, um, if folks were uninsured and someone was looking for someone who might have money to pay off a claim, we would be targets. So we do mandate that everyone have a, uh, malpractice insurance. What we've found is that modest means attorneys have to run an incredibly tight ship in order to build a profitable business. In the first year, a few practices make a profit. If our folks are going to make a profit, they have to be stellar 
in terms of keeping their costs low, embracing technology, and just, just being on top of every single expense. Um, insurance requirements are challenging for new solos and Mosmine practitioners in general, even if they even if they qualify for the Strong Start program that Lawyers Mutual has, which is amazing, even that program, after six years out, um, becomes over forty five hundred dollars a year. So I just wanted to kind of call into question the rate levels we were quoted earlier for what California malpractice is. I think they were I don't know for fact because it's not my business. I think that they were quite low, um, given what we've seen folks getting coverage for. Um, and it's particularly difficult for solos to come into solo practice and do low bono practices if they've been um, working in the field for more than four years already. Um, folks are coming in and having to make really challenging decisions in order to get their malpractice insurance. Typically, those, those uh, practitioners are choosing to forego medical insurance in order to get their malpractice insurance to be in our program, um, which I track. <laughs> Um, typically, like what choices they're making, uh, they are also maxing out on their credit cards for credit card debt, um, multiple credit cards, which makes it then have less flexibility to invest in their practices and build up the equity they need for tools for efficiency. Uh, there are, is another great program that Lawyers Mutual offers for limiting the amount that you pay for coverage if you reduce your uh, cases to ones that you get from one county bar association's lawyer referral service. So it has been great actually for a couple of our attorneys to at least get the initial cash flow to then put additional riders on and build up their coverage and expand their practice. Um, and yet it is very limiting, right? If they have to make an incredible effort to figure out exactly which lawyer referral service would be most lucrative for them. Um, and they're also reducing their coverage levels and turning away more complex cases that they could do. So my attorney who is over 30 years out, who was doing complex litigation for years, just went into retirement, came out of retirement so that he could have an impactful low bono practice. He is great skills. He wasn't even practicing for like the last five years at all. All he wants to do is a low bono thing. He has to turn away more complex stuff from lower income people that will not be served by anybody else because he has to limit his insurance coverage. Um, at least for a while he's building up additional resources. Um, so I wanted to bring those things up. And then if you could flip it from the next slide. I just wanted y'all to take a breather and think creatively, so I put this fabulous impressionist art piece on. Um, I think that when there's working groups, you get kind of locked into thinking you have to make very narrow, tailored decisions, and I just wanted to encourage a little outside the box thinking. Okay, we can go to the next slide. And it's very pretty, too. Okay. I can um, feel my brain expanding already. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, some creative solutions that are just have been popping in my head for the last few days as I've been thinking about this, um, is you know there really is a need to figure out what to do for folks who are more than three years out. Um, the costs start rising up quickly and dramatically, and I, if we're serious about access to justice, which I believe the state bar is, um, we have to think about how we can support the leadership of a diverse attorney pool going into the profession. And so I think this is very important. Um, I think having the reduced cost for LRS referrals is a really great model that perhaps could be expanded upon. Um, I think we need to look seriously at more creative forms of part-time coverage for solos. Solos only spend about one-third of their time on billable time doing legal services. The other two-thirds of their time should be if they're successful marketing and running their finances. Um, there should be some way to acknowledge that full-time solos do part-time legal work. Um, I think there needs to be reduced cost plans for people doing low and pro bono practices, and those low bono practices should be realistically defined as maybe going up to like 400 times the poverty level in the San Francisco Bay Area because our cost of living is so high. Um, and then additionally, I think we need uh, to look at some more affordable products for attorneys who maybe have been practice, have been part of the bar, but either inactive or not practicing for whatever reason for a significant chunk of time. So one of my attorneys who's seven years out was barred, a member of the bar for seven years, but literally hadn't practiced a single day. He was an IT professional, 
um, and have a really raging, fabulous technology business. And now he's decided he actually really wants to go in and practice the law. He's paying a much higher rate than anyone else who's just starting because of when he became a member of the bar. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is I think we should think outside the box, even beyond insurance. If we're really wanting to protect clients while also supporting attorney entrepreneurs and diverse attorneys, uh, one thing I found that I thought was interesting was the State Bar of Texas has a client attorney assistance program. And in lieu of filing a grievance, clients can, who have a problem with it, an attorney, can work with a voluntary process with the State Bar to help them articulate their concerns to their attorney, improve their communication with their attorney, and also broker fee um, it, go through an alternative dispute resolution around uh, fee agreements. And, uh, and that apparently has had success in reducing claims against attorneys while also increasing satisfaction among clients. So I wanted to highlight that. And I also wanted to just highlight that another just thank you to Lawyers Mutual around having <laughs> MCLEs as well as an attorney advice line that comes with their coverage policy. Um, attorneys in my program make use of both of those greatly as something that reduces their potential for liability. And that's something that if we're gonna give insurance companies um, a big new market by ensuring that those 17,000 uninsured people actually get insurance, um, I think we should be asking them to do some more for their members um, or for the folks that they coverage. Uh, and certainly the fact that my attorneys who have coverage through Lawyers Mutual will know that they can just call up Lawyers Mutual and get help with, with a situation and make sure they're handling it correctly and, putting the right language into a letter, for example, um, is a really great additional service that makes them feel like they're getting even more benefit out of what they're paying for um, than merely dealing with a possible claim. Okay. okay. So we had, a, yes, we had a couple of hands up, but, but I think before we go to those, I just wanted to ask one question, I think, just broadly, and that is what is, what does a low photo um, looks like, like what kind of service is it that you're doing for the people? Is that your question? No, no, I beat you to no. the point. <laughs> okay, good. So, I mean, for, for instance, when we spoke earlier, you gave several examples, so I'll just let you do them again. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's almost every practice area that exists, um, barring, you know, high-level corporate stuff like M&A. Um, it's, it's every demographic of clients, every you know, every race and ethnicity, every geographical area, um, every gender, um, every occupation. Um, and, you know, so it's, it, it's almost like the entire world of lawyer, just the clients that can't afford to pay full market rates. I do think in practice, ideally, um, it would involve uh, more communication with the clients and offering unbundled limited scope representation and having a conversation with a client about, okay, so you have a budget of X to spend on legal services. What do you actually have capacity to do for yourself? What do you have capacity to do if I were to coach you? And what do you, what do you actually need an attorney to step in and do and what would be the fee for that? Um, so it tends to look like a lot of unbundled limited scope representation with flat fees, typically for the things that the attorneys do unless they're much more complex. Okay. And I think that, that's what I was thinking, sort of stereotypically that, or maybe a landlord-tenant kind of an issue that. Sort of I, I don't think there's a standard stereotypical thing, and even like even the sort of uh, sort of business issues that you brought up is possible. I mean, now that uh, cannabis is such a hot new issue here, I have three cannabis attorneys in the Bay Area Legal Incubator, um, all of whom are focusing on of representing equity partners. So San Francisco and Oakland have a reparations program where licenses are being um, designated for people who are directly impacted by the war on drugs for cannabis businesses. Um, but what's happened is there hasn't been a lot of attention to the support services those equity partners would need who do not typically have a lot of wealth or access to legal representation. And so there's a lot of very wealthy vultures swooping around looking for these equity partners. Um, and so I have, and it's also sort of unusual corporate designs that sort of formations that have to be created because the tax consequences for someone who has very little financial equity but who has identity equity going into a, into a deal are very different than what a venture capitalist would normally have to think of, right? Um, and so I have attorneys working on that step too, which is really pretty complex, right? And interesting. Um, but dealing with folks who don't have much money. Okay. 
hands up, Kathy, I think you were first. Um, so do small and solo legal startup companies, um, are they eligible for small business administration loans? I don't see any. Presumably. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah. How many uh, people uh, have been? My brilliant question, I need to be microphone here. Uh, how many uh, uh, students have you had in your 99 courses over the last few years? So Practice 99 was run at three schools, at uh, UC Berkeley and UC Davis and our school. Um, as kind of a pilot program, it was funded by an um, innovation grant from the Cal Bar Foundation. Um, and so uh, it was run for the first time last fall of uh, 2017. And uh, we had 10 students in our class at San Joaquin. And we are rerunning the class this fall. Um, and we're expanding it from one unit to two units. And we're going to have probably at least 15 students in that class this fall. And I was a guest lecturer for the, uh, or a co-teacher of the Berkeley Law one, and they had, the first semester they had 25 students, I believe, and the second semester they've done it two semesters now, I think they had around 20. Okay, and yeah. you mentioned that I was going to have a follow-up question. Uh, how many programs uh, have you been able to access here at the State Bar to help fund um, your classes and the incubator? potentially help your students, once they become lawyers, to get grants for their practices. So yes. like, how much money is available to you as to talk to your students about, about helping launch their practices in the first year? So the incubator, uh, the Bay Area Legal Incubator was launched with the help of a state bar grant um, and was one of, I think, seven incubators that was funded through the state bar, it was either five or seven. Sorry, I don't know the exact number, um, but I don't under I don't have an understanding that that uh, funding is renewable. It was sort of a one time only, um, and I don't know of additional grants that my folks could apply for to help them with launching their practices. Yeah, and, and uh, San Joaquin's portion of the Calvar Innovation Grant was five thousand dollars, and that's all we've ever gotten from anybody for any of this. Um, have you applied to other places, or uh, we haven't? And um, this is essentially our, our school's response to what, uh, what we know is a market need for more technology-focused practice management courses. Um, and we just decided to do it with a, uh, with a low bono community focus. Um, because our school has a very high um, percentage of student population of minorities and, uh, and women and other um, traditionally underrepresented groups in law schools. We're kind of an opportunity school. Uh, and so a lot of those uh, students come in with a community-based mindset to begin with. So um, this class really also serves their interests in addition to, you know, piquing an interest in, um, you know, solo practice. Yeah, I was going to say in the incubator, certainly we have diversified our funding. We've also expanded beyond our initial sponsoring schools who, are, who sponsor alums to be in our program. And we accept free agents now and are having corporate donors help sponsor corporate, sponsor free agents. So the Wiccan Foundation just sponsored our first two free agents. Um, and we're in the process of recruiting additional sponsors now. And the goal is to further diversify you know, who can be in the program. Schools have an interest in beefing up their employment data by only wanting to select brand new grads who just graduated. Um, whereas if I can get free agent sponsors, I can diversify for age, number of years out, um, other and people coming from other schools who maybe, maybe don't have the same cachet um, and bring them into the incubator. And when you, uh, sorry to keep going on, but uh, when you, when you uh, go to someone to sponsor a uh, free agent, you include in your budget uh, the price of uh, malpractice coverage? The attorneys themselves have to pay for the malpractice coverage. They get about $35,000 worth of benefits from the incubator a year to help run their practice through free uh, case management software, 
uh, all kinds of other kinds of technologies that they get, free coaching, free MCLEs, like free research tools, LexisNexis, Westlaw, blah, blah, blah. They get tons of free stuff, um, and they pay a small program fee um, to be part of it, and they also are responsible for their own malpractice insurance. Yeah. But the malpractice insurance is not, is not subsidized in any way. It's just open market purchase and get you a great program like LMIC, you need to the price is affordable uh, at least for a few years. Yeah, and actually I should say my, my most beloved attorney, which is outside this room, don't share that I said that to her, because the other ones might not like that. Yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, but she, um, I have an amazing tax attorney here in the program right now, and I never even imagined having a tax attorney, frankly, in the program. Um, she had been a uh, appellate, juvenile appellate attorney for over a decade, was burnt out, retooled, got an LLM in tax, decided she wanted to be the community tax attorney. And she does these amazing like community trainings on tax in the Bayview and, and stuff. And just is like this amazing tax attorney. Her malpractice insurance quote was so high. I've given her another, she has another three weeks to get coverage if she has to leave the program. And it is looking like she's gonna forego her medical coverage. Um, and she's trying to pay off a credit card that's maxed out in order to then put more onto that credit card so that she can cover it. Um, but it's, you know, people are making some really difficult decisions and she's an awesome attorney. Um, so it, you know, I'm watching people make some really pained decisions. Thank you for these great presentations. Um, in, you know, all of our research and discussions, um, one theme kind of emerged, which is that, you know, lawyers and the very young lawyers, the new lawyers, the incubator programs have the, um, advantage of these low price policies that are offered through LMIC and potentially other carriers. But by the time they graduate into um, you know, four plus years of practice, um, they no longer have the advantage of that pricing necessarily. And the, um, that's when it becomes difficult financially to maintain the insurance. I'm wondering to what extent either of you have actually seen that dynamic play out. And then my related question is this, I'm, you know, I'm a legal malpractice defense attorney, so I've seen a lot of claims, and um, I, I haven't seen many claims against, um, you know, I've, I've actually never seen a claim against a pro bono attorney, and I um, have, you know, almost, I, I have seen claims, well, that's not true, I, I have seen claims against, um, you know, legal services organizations, and I guess that is pro bono. But it's very, very, very rare. So I'm wondering if either of you have experienced situations where attorneys in the pro bono, low bono area have experienced such a claims history that it becomes um, even more unaffordable for them. Because I've never seen that, but I'm curious if you've seen that. Um, so I have had uh, one person in my program come back, um, uh, decide to become a solo after having a mouth malpractice insurance claim against him, so he was dealing with that. So his insurance rates are much higher than someone else's would have been in his same number of years of experience. But, um, and it also has raised problems with him even being able to volunteer and do pro bono work places because the pro bono insurance coverage that, uh, that legal services places have don't necessarily, they don't want to necessarily take him on as a risk having had a claim even though he's really I mean, I wouldn't have taken him into the program if he hadn't made a legitimate argument for how come he's overcome the situation that led to that claim. Um, so I've certainly seen that kind of an instance. I, and I, I just want to say, like, I absolutely, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if I'm just hanging out with very few uh, people who are all part of this, like 17,000, but I have to say that having been a social justice attorney my whole career, um, and, and my friends tend to be social justice attorneys, uh, many of them are solos. I don't know hardly any of them who are insured. Um, most of them are not because they've made a cost a, a, like analysis that they just can't afford it. And the reality is is that the claims that they would face are worth not that much money. Um, and so, because frankly, low and moderate income people in our society are not valued that high when they are injured. And that's a really horrible thing, but that is really true, right? Um, and so I, mean, I also want to say that the legislative practice that I have on this side, which is not my valley work, 
I don't have malpractice insurance coverage for that. I'm just gonna disclose that because I'm providing advice to folks who are writing criminal justice legislation. I can't believe I'm ever going to be sued for that pro bono work. Um, and if I were to just try to go get a part-time policy to cover that at almost 25 years out, that would be a lot of money. And so not only would it be my weekends are gone doing this volunteer work, but like, I don't know, $5,000 is gone for this volunteer work. So, um, and I, because of my career trajectory, I have never made much money and I've foregone salary to do impactful work. Um, and I simply couldn't afford to do that work anymore. So for me personally, and this is not, I didn't bring this up really because it's not the legal incubator stuff, but for me personally, if I, if I couldn't do that volunteerism work, which can, does not go through a formal um, bar associations pro bono thing much, I mean, attorneys do work all the time with community organizations that isn't through a formal process, right? Um, if I had to get coverage to do that work, I would no longer be able to do it. I would just have to say no. And can I just ask a follow-up question? Sure. You mentioned that you know in your circles of people doing mm -hmm. low bono work that they um, many of them don't have malpractice insurance. If you could be more, <laughs> give us some more specificity on that. You know what practice areas are these actually? Because I you know I've represented legal services organizations where they do pro bono and they all carry malpractice insurance yeah. for sure. The criminal defense attorneys oftentimes they're through one of these um, these. The, the conflict programs through the county bar associations, and they all have insurance. So um, many of the categories of low bono, pro bono attorneys that I've come in contact with already carry the insurance. So I'm curious, what are the exact sure. practice areas that you've encountered where you don't see them carrying insurance? Um, oh, hold on, I just want to clarify one thing. So I think when we brought these two speakers in, I just want to clarify like the separation between pro bono and low bono, because I think pro bono, by and large, those pro bono attorneys really are covered by insurance because if you're part of a legal services organization, you are going to be covered. And I, I, think you guys well, I, I think that's exactly right. In fact, all the all the attorneys I know that do full time pro bono work um, for you know some sort of organization or legal services have coverage through their organization. Right, but what isn't covered is pro bono work that you do. Like so, right now I get coverage for my work that I do at the legal incubator for everything related to that, I'm covered. So actually I would be counted as a covered attorney. But when I go and work, I'm on the leadership committee of a statewide legislative group um, that, that designs criminal justice legislation. When I'm doing that on the weekends and I'm crafting legislation for a whole coalition of organizations and I'm drafting it for them, and I'm doing that work, I don't have coverage for that, right? And there's not a formal organization under whose policy I would fit for doing that. Um, or when that coalition hits their own crazy problems, which they do, because grassroots organizations do. <laughs> and they ask a quick question, even if I'm just referring them on to somebody else for more complex help. There's like, there's a lot, I just wanna say, there's a lot of pro bono work that isn't covered formally. Love, and then I'll by my, my yeah. question then, according to these excellent comments, because you're right. With, with the pro bono, at least in San Diego, if you're doing pro bono work, you're either covered by the policy of the legal services organization, or the legal services organization requires you to present your own policy. I run a pro bono small yeah. one in, in San Diego. But the low bono, you're right, totally different story. So I'll modify my question in light of your great comments, which is what are the low bono or low price legal services categories in, in which you think practitioners aren't, aren't um, carrying well, the insurance and where this would potentially disproportionately impact them? I know, personally know attorneys who are not insured doing uh, uh, post-conviction relief, doing family law, doing a criminal, uh, uh, doing misdemeanor work, but not through the local, like not getting through the local uh, panels. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Landlord tenant. Oh, definitely immigration too. Yeah, and actually one landlord tenant person I know who is. I mean, and that, that's just random. This is just randomly people I know um, who are doing. You know their best to uh, do right by their clients and have good solid practices um, and do affordable work for making those decisions. I mean I, I have a, a close friend who I just ran into a few days ago I mentioned I was going to this and she was like be sure that they folks know that after you hit that like seven eight year mark it just becomes so cost prohibitive that lots of people just start dropping off 
And she was like, you know, and she just started naming this person, that person, this person, that person who aren't in charge, right? And it's, it's all people who have dedicated their life in many ways to serve their communities um, who uh, don't have coverage. Um, and certainly, like, I'm really watching the sort of transition career folks at the legal incubator struggling with this exact same issue. Um, and I don't know, once they're in the program, um, if they're gonna make the same decisions when it isn't mandated by us. And, and for real, people are making very serious decisions. And I just wanna highlight also, we've talked about student loan debt, but what we haven't talked about is housing scarcity. Um, and that particularly <coughs> in urban areas, in, um, in urban areas in uh, California, housing has astronomically increased um, the price of it has, and that's a whole other stressor that folks are facing now. If you didn't lock yourself in with a house that you own, you know, 15, 20 years ago, then you were really, really screwed. Um, and so, you know, housing costs rising is a whole other stressor that I'm seeing folks. So I've had six participants of the legal incubator evicted themselves um, in the last year and a half. So, I, you know, they're, they're really struggling with where they're putting their money. Sophia, I just want to follow up and then um, we'll get to this in a second. I just want to follow up on something you said earlier, earlier about how um, sometimes people maybe aren't injured because the cases aren't worth very much. Can you just sort of address that? Because one of, one of the issues that this committee will also have to address is sort of like the, the policy limits. So this is sort of a two-part question. Yeah. Mm. I, I'm yeah. curious if you don't mind if it's not secret how much of a limit you require of your um, incubator participants, and also how much are your typical cases worth if there is such a thing as a typical typical low bono case? Um, I don't have a comment on what the typical worth is of their cases. We require the same base. Uh, we based our requirement on the. Uh, 100, 300, which is the, also the level that's offered through the start, the Strong Start program with Lawyers Mutual, and we we felt that uh, the design team had built the incubator out, which was representatives from all the law schools as well as the Alameda County Bar Association. We felt that that level was reasonable when imagining the kinds of work folks would be doing in terms of low bono work, and the fact that a lot of disputes are limited. When, okay, when uh, you do unbundled legal services, if you do it well with clear disclaimers about what the scope is and how you're doing it, and if you do flat fees, you tend to also be paid up front. There's less controversy over the fee agreements and what's owed and when and how. It sort of, it makes the communication clearer, um, which can be a lot of the cause of uh, problems with clients. Um, and so our, our hope was that we would expect fewer claims if people were doing things the way that we were teaching them to do it. Um, and then in terms of like the value, like I know that my work doing post-conviction work with people in prison, if someone deliberately kills somebody, it's considered a really huge uh, jury award to get a $250,000 settlement with that population because you're dealing with a population that has low levels of education, low employability, likely has like lots of a higher disproportionately likelihood to have disabling conditions and things. So you're not talking about um, the track star from the Yale team or something who whose earning potential is much higher. Um, and that's a travesty and an injustice built into our legal system, and it's true, right? It ends up um, that the kinds of cases that folks are looking at are worth less. Um, with estate planning, for example, if, if you're you know, doing a simple uh, trust really for someone who only has maybe one asset, which is their house. Um, that house now might be worth more, right, than it was 20 years ago for sure. Um, but it's a lot less complex than if you're dealing with a $10 million estate, which would not be a modest means case. Yeah. If you were working with the legislature and had your wish list, can you think of anything that would be a carrot rather than the stick of mandatory insurance, but something that would make it worthwhile for people, have a value to people doing pro bono work and low bono work to purchase insurance, whether it's something the bar could provide, you know, relief from dues or something, but um, free MCLE or with the legislature, statute limitations, uh, limits, anything that outside the box would make it Helpful. Ease the burden for them by providing something else. 
caps uh, on damages, uh, fee, yeah. streamlining <laughs> issues. I, I mean, I, I mean, it, aren't you just getting around the the elephant in the room, which is the cost? Well, that's actually what I'm going at because if you do those things, the cost comes down. I mean, if, for example, there were a shorter statute of limitations, caps on damages and stuff, then it makes it easier for LMIC to provide a cheaper product, you know, so the price goes down. So I'm trying to figure out if there's anything that we haven't talked about yet that makes it more affordable to them. I think a problem with that maybe is that you have then the legislature kind of fixed on how to get around that, whereas the cost is extremely variable in a very short period of time. Um, and so I think the, the potential for the cost changing would greatly outpace um, the rate at which you could change the other incentives to counteract the cost. I can't think of anything as a direct answer to your question. I mean, I do think that sort of outside the box solutions I put, I was trying to think of things that would make it more appealable. And I, I do think I'm really fascinated by Texas's alternative dispute resolution program. And, well, and the free MCLE is what made me think of it. Yeah. I know some programs that I deal with, some insurers, you know, you do get some benefit if you have a rigorous risk management program and so forth. So anything that makes the insurers want to insure you at a lower cost would presumably help the lawyers that you're talking about. So, if it's not doable, never mind. Yeah, I'll tell you what's really advantageous with the free um, MCLE that Lawyers Mutual offers is not that the MCLE is free with the policy, but doing the MCLE actually further reduces the cost of your policy. That's what I'm saying. So, yeah. there's, there's a direct benefit. It's do this and the cost of your policy actually goes down. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and not only that, there's some visibility as to what the policies are going to cost you know, year after year after year through about what you're for or you're fine. Um, so, I, I, I think it, anything else might not be as directly related to cost as, as would really provide an incentive. Um, just to clarify, the cost of a Strong Start program is low because then they are required to do the MCLE that is free to them. So that is built into the premium structure, at least for that program. So I guess the flip side of the coin would be, to your point, if you could build maybe in a credit to the other parts of the book, right. that might reduce premium. I don't know. The actuary decides all that. But I can tell you the, the lawyers in the Strong Start program that have been educated and do take the hours uh, have less claims than the entire book of business that we have. And they, after that six year when it's fully matured, then it just goes down. But they got to get through that sixth year and survive then to, get, to start to get the lower premium. And the cost of the Signal. If I had like a little chime, I would do that. Yeah, too. And, and, and I think I think it was time for Cynthia to be here too. But thank you both very much for coming. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, thank you very, very much. Great job, Tony, on that presentation. Um, we've been going almost two hours here, so I'm, we're going to take a very, very, very short break. And for those of you that have public comment, we'll take that up as soon as we reconvene. I know we sort of went into the discussion time, but I think we also felt that it was foreseeable we might go over. And, and to have discussions like we just had was, for me, very, very valuable to finish that out. So thank you for that. Let's come back in uh, six minutes. Okay, folks. Yeah. All right, thanks for getting back. Uh, we will now go back on line. Tom, good? 
Start it? Okay. All right, so we've got about an hour left, and I do want to have sort of a hard stop right around four, four in, a, in a few minutes or so. So I want to make sure that, you know, that's how we use our last remaining hour here. I want to first start with public comment, give the opportunity to those that are here to make a public comment to do so now. And uh, sir, if you could step up to a microphone and give us your name. It's green, so it looks like it's on. Is it on? Green it work, yeah. And the public comment, sir, is limited to three minutes, so if you could uh, use that time efficiently, that would be very helpful. But thank you for coming, by the way. Let us know who you are. So for those of you who haven't met me in person, you've probably met me on the phone. My name is Brian Roars. I'm general counsel for Lawyers Mutual, and I usually call in and listen on the four subcommittees. So. If you close your eyes, you'll recognize the voice. Um, I just have two comments very quickly to make. Um, the first one is, is um, I wish I could have made the comments earlier, maybe when the people were here, but I, was, I, I wish we would have heard more in regard to the mandatory insurance uh, about the carve-outs. Uh, carve-outs for government employees, general counsel, uh, professors, uh, low bono criminal. My experience with most criminal attorneys in California is they don't have insurance. And, and as part of those carve outs is what do you do in the state of California that they don't have in these other states, which is a firm like Lewis Brisbois that has six offices in the state and has a thousand attorneys. Do you have each one of those attorneys have their own separate $250,000 or $300,000 policy with the premium? Or do you do something else? I can tell you. Um, Anecdotally, the perception I get uh, of my 30 plus years of practice in the state of California is that many small firms and many solo attorneys feel that the state bar is run by the big law firms. And so if they perceive that the big law firms are being treated differently, the Gibson Dunn's, uh, Shepard Mullins, uh, and uh, Lewis Bridgeboys, they will not be happy. Um, my final comment then is in regard to the estimate of the uh, a number of uninsured attorneys in the state. The average size law firm that is insured by Lawyers Mutual is 1.8 attorneys, so we feel that we have a pretty fair and good grasp of the small or solo practices, uh, uh, practice practitioners in the state of California. I think the people from these other states, if they heard uh, the number of just judges that there are in Los Angeles, it's, it's got the most judicial officers in the country. The third highest, second is Chicago, where I'm originally from, the third highest is San Diego County. There's more judges in those two counties, Los Angeles and San Diego, than there probably are practicing attorneys in Boise. So when you start to uh, take out numbers from the 185, 190,000 attorneys, I think you get down to about 25,000 solo practitioners in this state. And if you go at about 35% rate, you're looking at about eight to 9,000 attorneys who don't have insurance. And if you, when you get to the disclosure subcommittee, you will hear that robust disclosure rules drive down those who don't have insurance. The articles in that committee group say that mandatory insurance is not a cure-all, but if you want to not have mandatory, but you want to drive those numbers down of people who don't have insurance, you have a robust disclosure. With that, you could probably reduce it to three or 4,000 attorneys in the state out of 185 or 190,000 who don't have insurance. And so you have to, I think, weigh that, uh, 3,000 not having insurance versus everybody having mandatory, and then all the pressure groups that come in and say why they should have a carve-out and not be subject to mandatory insurance. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian, for those comments. So I think we'll spend the better part of the last hour or so that we're here in open discussion on things that we've heard today. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, Linda, you're going to do your survey thing right now. No, 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 take your time. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, as promised, I wanted to give the preliminary results. And um, after today, I'm expecting that you're going to want more analysis than what I provide. But this is to just give you a taste of what we've got so far. So we sent the survey to 25,000 California attorneys. And this is because we want to sort of uh, minimize survey fatigue. There are a lot of different surveys that are going out. And so we're sort of carving out and not sending to everyone, but 25,000 as a good sample size. We attempted, well, we did exclude inactive attorneys um, and judges, 
to the extent that it was possible, we carved out a government and court appointment, and also attorneys that are in firm sizes greater than 10, or 10 or more. No, I guess greater than 10. It's impossible to do that exactly. We did get a few people who are in government and a few people who are in firms greater than 10, because they, people don't identify themselves as such. We had to look at the name of their firm or the name of the organization that would they worked out to do that. So this is the response that we got. We had about a 6% response rate. Um, and what we wanted to focus on is the, uh, the attorneys who are in private practice. <coughs> what you can see is that um, of the attorneys in private practice, 62% of them are in solo practice, 25% are, are in small firms, two to five attorneys, 5% were in firms of six to 10, and again, we did capture 55 attorneys who are um, in firms that are more than 10. Um, this is the rate of uninsured attorneys that were recorded by firm size. And as you can see, you know, any all the firms that there were 10, more than 10, all of them are, were insured. Um, a small percentage of attorneys in the firm size six to 10, 12% in the two to five, but as you can see, mostly what we're seeing in terms of uninsured attorneys is the solo practitioners. And what we found in this survey was 39%, which is a little bit higher than the numbers that have been generally thought. We did ask people, and this was a question that was thrown in at the last minute that came from the, um, the disclosure subcommittee. We asked people uh, whether, the, those who are insured, we asked them whether the uh, rule, disclosure rule had an impact on the decision to have, to be insured, to get insurance. And 9.5% said that it did have an impact. Hmm. These are the reasons that people said that they aren't insured, and I'll give you a minute to take a look at those. Yes. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to say was that um, none of the questions were mandatory. So once people were in, they could skip any question they wanted to skip. And I'm a very strong believer in no mandatory questions in a survey. Because my experience when I take a survey, if I come across a question I don't want to answer and it requires it, I just shut down the survey. <laughs> so I just, I don't, as a rule, don't ever require um, answers. Um, and then looking at it by firm size, the, the reason People said that they were uninsured, and, and this, I did it with a solo and the two to five attorneys. I didn't show the six to ten because there were so few, but the percentages were somewhat similar. Fewer, obviously, fewer people in those firms work part time. Um, and then one of the questions that we asked was the uh, uh, how much of your pack of your clients, what percentage fall into each of these categories? So for uninsured attorneys, the bulk of their clients are individuals and families. And then the next small businesses. Um, and then the, and the, the next question I asked was uh, uh, whether they provide uh, reduced rate services. And as you can see, more than half of the uninsured attorneys provide reduced cost services, and <laughs> and and the reasons that they reduce their rates mostly are due to client income or they have a personal connection, friend or family. <coughs> but half of them it's because of case type. And again, this was one where they could select more than one answer. <coughs> and these are the types of law that people reported that they provided reduced rate services for. <laughs> and again, people could select more than one answer. Yes. Was, uh, was, we go back to the last, last slide, I just had a quick question. <coughs> um, I can't remember, for this one, was, um, was landlord-tenant one of our options, or? Yes, it was. I think it was real estate um, litigation. Okay, so it didn't, it didn't make the top one. No. Very interesting, thank you. Can we, uh, can we go back one more than this too? So for this one, theoretically, if they said they 51% of the time they um, do reduced rate services, they could do that for like, they could have marked for the three months because of either client income 
them personal connection or case type. And this doesn't mean that 50, when they, they provided services, the fiduciary services 51% of the time. It means 51% of the they respondents do it often. Do it often. Right, okay. Got it. But yes, and they could have checked several in terms so of the reason. Like the three reasons why I do it often, or, the, or maybe they clicked one time and they did it occasionally. Or well, the, I think that the frequency of services, they had to choose one. These two yes. weren't tied together. Right, but I mean, uh, right. Other And, and then another question that was asked was, well, I wanted to see from uninsured attorneys if they have support staff. Because um, what you can see is for the uninsured attorneys who are probably mostly solo practitioners, a lot of them have no support staff. And I don't know, it's something to think about whether that is likely to, uh, or I don't know, might increase the risk of malpractice. What's that? Or vice versa. Right, but but the, the, it's not it's not a one or the other. Right. Could I, be. I, yeah, it's, or conversely indicate lack of funds or right. And then the survey also asked about calendar management and conflict checking systems because those in terms of um, the some of the stuff we read about malpractice, these are two big uh, causes of um, malpractice claims. Problems with calendar management. And then this question of uh, <coughs> you afford, afford to pay for insurance, this slide has a lot of information on it. So the first column shows what the, the, um, the firm's annual revenue that they reported. And the, the number of parentheses is how many people responded to this question with this figure. Because again, not very many people, as you can see, very few people provided this answer about their firm's revenue. Um, and this is only the uninsured, people who said that they are not insured. But what you can see is what you, mostly what people said that they could afford was up to 1,000. <coughs> and then this, I think this was the last question, what, whether you think, oh actually it's not the one the last question, but the last one I think I have on the slide, on the slide is, do you think like, that legal malpractice insurance that should be mandatory? <laughs> and I looked at it by the type of employment people said that they're in. And then for those in private practice, by the firm size. And so you can see there's tremendous variance. So people in firms six to 10, 70% think it should be not mandatory. And solo practitioners, only 35%. And as, as, a, as we learned today, that the six to 10 uh, sized firms, they, they almost all have malpractice insurance. So the people in favor are the people who have it. Well, and the firm okay. pays for it, not you personally. Right. right. It's just the solo lawyer that's got a budget. Mm -hmm. So if there are other, I could, we could cross-tabulate <coughs> any of these questions. And so if, if there's some ideas of things that you want me to look at, different groups that provided different responses, we can do that. I may be remembering this one, but did the survey also include some questions about the times of, the kinds of claims, um, or, you know, whether people have to the, that, so what do we know about the responses to those questions? Very few. I think that what we saw was there were about, um, I think maybe 25, 30 said that there were malpractice, or maybe closer to 50 that said there were malpractice claims against them. Five of them actually said that they had some merit, um, and in terms of, but only a couple, most of them said that they resolved them, and there were only a couple that said that. So it didn't seem like it was sort of statistically significant to do any kind of analysis on that. But I thought it was interesting that there were five people who, who were uninsured who said that there were claims that were valid. Or actually not claims, they were, we asked if they were ever accused. But that doesn't even mean that a claim was filed. But that sort of gets to this issue of how we, you know, 
generate information relative to whether there's victims out there of uninsured lawyers. I, mean, I think that we, we do a good <coughs> job, I think, of trying to mine that, that phenomena somehow. I think that's probably the closest we can tell. Right, well, we do have the survey that we're, we're gonna do the analysis on the survey of clients. And we reached out to no, the right. lawyer referral service programs and asked them to send a survey to people who had contacted them for a legal malpractice issue. Um, and we've gotten, I think, like 85, 90 responses on that. Okay. We also asked the uh, mandatory fee arbitration programs to send out a similar survey. Um, so I'm, we're still waiting on those, and we'll be able to do some analysis and report back on that as well. Okay. But I don't know if anybody sees something that's missing in terms of looking at you know two different factors or three different factors. There's still responses coming in. I looked today, there were three more that came in today. So it's, I think that it's really interesting that we're getting a reasonable number of responses. And I did send out um, some separate comments that people had in response to the survey. I think there was another one that came in today. So. Linda, I, I'm sorry for not recalling this, but did we ask any questions around um, identities of communities served, in other words, if you're a lawyer who's working primarily in for communities of color or for disenfranchised or low part, low income communities, do we have any data on that? We did not. We did not. Okay. So I think this is perhaps a good starting point of the discussion because this is the key issue of whether there's a phenomena out there. We know there's uninsured lawyers. The most recent survey we had in California with just sole practitioners was right around 30% were uninsured. Sole little practitioners, just a, just a one person shop. Um, we saw statistics from other states that sort of suggested that there was something around those same numbers, maybe a little bit higher, maybe a little bit lower. We got a couple of different viewpoints uh, of, of that today. So uh, I, it sounds like maybe this is a good time to discuss your reaction to that. Uh, you know, again, this is not a new phenomenon. These, these numbers have been borne out for a number of years, even if the direct question wasn't asked on prior state bar <coughs> surveys, which we did every two years, two years, every Oh, every five years. Okay, well then. So we've only got a few under under our belt on those, but um, and only the most recent one asked a question about whether there was a, whether they were covered by malpractice insurance. So, but we know we've known that's out there. So, um, and and just before we get off this topic, if you want some different slice of information from Linda that you need for your committee or what it is you're studying, please let her know, and we'll do the best to. Mind. And then will we have some, I mean, at some point the responses are going to stop coming in and we'll have some final yeah. tabulation. This is, you know, as you saw, um, at least with New Jersey, that, that did a formidable uh, study of their own. Of course, they got something like three and a half years to do theirs, just sort of get bouncing along <laughs> the agenda. But uh, in any event, you know, they did, a, they did a, uh, a very comprehensive view, which included an extensive survey. And so these surveys are important. I think I talked about this in you know, some of the opening remarks in our first session, uh, that a survey is a great way to get information. And in all the other iterations of this mandatory legal malpractice insurance issue and disclosure issue and so on, <coughs> um, all along the last 40 years, a survey played a pretty important role in it. A couple of times in the 70s and 80s when it first came up, you know, essentially there was a, the legislation was either vetoed or, or <coughs> went on the back burner uh, because it didn't seem as though the bar had a real appetite for, you know, mandatory legal malpractice insurance for one reason or another. So just fast forwarding to when we present our final <coughs> analysis and recommendations next spring, uh, the survey I think will have a lot of eyeballs and a lot of meaning to it. So make sure you understand what's going on there. I have yeah, a question Kat. about the survey. Yeah. Five thousand. You sent out twenty-five thousand emails. 
Okay. Yeah, we I'm like, spliced it down quite okay. a bit. Yeah. Okay, and you have 1,400 responses, right? Yeah, Which there was about a 6% six six response rate. Which actually, I don't, I don't, you know, I know when you have, you know, random uh, surveys and, and click throughs and sort of that phenomena, you know, the numbers are minuscule on what you can depend on. I don't know, where does 6% come out in terms of a hit rate? You know, I don't. I don't have the context. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, um, well, first of all, I wanted to, the, we've been talking a lot today about all this data and different views and opinions, but I do think we need to thank Linda. Um, I know Randy's already done that, but Linda, um, our group, you were instrumental in helping develop today in addition to this survey. So I think um, we should all, Linda sits there quietly, but uh, her contributions <laughs> can't be um, underestimated. The one thing that occurs to me is that, um, you know, as, as good as, well, you know, frankly, our data isn't very good. You know, we just, we just don't have good data. Um, you know, one, one solid recommendation that a couple of people have been speaking about is to have the state bar revise the, the dues statement so that we start collecting information about people who uh, carry malpractice insurance. I'm licensed in Illinois. Um, we're required to tell the ARDC if we carry insurance. I can't remember what all the questions are, but you have to tell them whether you carry insurance. And so they have like close to, you know, great, well, they have very good statistics on who carries insurance. And I think there's states that even do it better than Illinois. But, um, you know, it seems to me that that's one immediate step that we may want to recommend as a group and that I think the state bar may um, consider doing. Because I think everybody, certainly including myself, um, would love to have even more concrete data. Um, the other thing that just occurred occurs to me as we're, we're throwing out, I, I think Randy, we're in the part where we're just talking about our reactions to today. Yeah, I was yeah. starting with the survey only because we did dealt with that, yeah. but I wanted to go back into everything uh, and however you all want to organize right. that. I was sort of going to take it maybe by group by group or speaker by speaker and, and go through it, but go ahead. Well, my, my overall reaction is this. I, I think it's a virtual impossibility, um, even though we haven't had our November 9th presentation yet, it's a virtual impossibility to turn California into a captive insurer state right off the bat, even if that was desirable. I mean, I just can't think of any way you would possibly do that. So my initial reaction is if, if we were interested in doing this, you'd have to have some type of open market model. My other reaction, though, is that um, I think it's highly unlikely that we would be in the same space as Idaho. I mean, how astounding that like everybody in Idaho was able to get insured, you know, with like no problem. That absolutely will not be the case in California. And I see Glenn and a couple of other people <laughs> nodding. Um, <laughs> if we were to consider um, an open market model, and I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not advocating for a mandatory malpractice insurance because personally I want to wait to hear all the data on all the speakers. But in the event we were to consider that, um, which I, I think is is the model that we would consider if there was any model, we would have to figure out some type of backup system to to ensure that people have the ability to secure insurance at some price, um, or perhaps at a reasonable price. So perhaps there would be some type of captive that would provide uh, insurance to high-risk people at, at some type of reasonable pricing. But of course, then again, how do you pay for that? Who pays for, for it? It's <laughs> Kathy's laughing at that. It, it has to be subsidized. Um, so I, I just, um, I just, you know, I thought the presentations of our speakers were absolutely terrific, but our scale would be very, very, very different than their scale for obvious reasons. So those were um, just my off-the-cuff reactions, which I, I didn't, hadn't even formulated until I personally heard all these speakers today. So that's Heather Rosing's um, initial reaction to spark discussion on this wonderful group. <laughs> Uh, Glenn. Yeah, just to build on that, I, I have kind of the same reaction as you do, Heather, that it's a pretty tall order to try to build a captive program for something the size and complexity of California. But what kind of intrigues me a little bit is this idea of, you know, maybe there is a spot for a captive if we go to a mandatory model, and I don't think the data is all in yet for sure, but that can solve some of the problems of cost potentially or can, you know, provide some sort of stopgap to, to make it a more workable 
you know, measure. And perhaps that's a way that we'll drive the November discussion a little bit so that we're kind of looking at that more seriously than, you know, perhaps something that looks exactly like Oregon. Uh, because you will hear people from Oregon sing the praises of their program because it does do a lot of good things. I mean, it does a lot of good things in terms of risk management, in terms of, you know, quality of data. There's a lot of wonderful things that come out of the Oregon program. But it's an incredibly tall ask for a state like this. So maybe we go somewhere different. Yeah, there's, there's of course, the devil and those damn details uh, yeah, those, about heading a program, just the capitalization of something like that. Oh. It's extraordinary. The infrastructure is also, and I'm not advocating one way or the other. These are not new, necessarily new thoughts on, you know, a, uh, a captive program or a risk retention group or however you want to characterize that. Um, so those are those are significant obstacles. So, and it's and it's good. I think it was good to have this discussion first because it really is a nice segue to a lot of different things, and I want to go into that in a minute. But it also, I think, um, fits in well with the later sort of deeper dive discussion on the on the um, uh, captive program, and perhaps that could be looked at a little bit more creatively with some of the reality in, in mind, uh, and and maybe it just never gets off the ground. I, I don't know. We'll have to see. With any of it, but I think it's good to have this background uh, first. Uh, Kathy, yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, our reaction, I think, generally is that those states are not California and not California for a variety of reasons. You have so many more lawyers, you have so many more metropolitan areas that actually drive up claims. Um, just so this committee knows, we've been asked to provide some data, and we have four years worth of data. So that may be helpful in deciding what a premium would be for the average practitioner, it's not $2,800, it's not the numbers they were using, and the fact that he insures 12 states and the premium he collects is is probably what we collect in a year, tells you something about the risk profile. And there are certain risk profiles that automatically require higher premiums. I mean, securities lawyers, IP lawyers, entertainment lawyers that happen to be sports agents. There's a whole variety of people that practice in California that aren't in Idaho, and she basically said that. So you have to, I think as Brian noted, some carve-outs, and you have to look at really what the numbers are going to be in California. And I think uh, I think we asked Oregon if that model was really workable in California, and they said absolutely not. So when they come, you can ask them that question. Chris, if he, he doesn't insure lawyers in California, and there's a reason for that. So. We're going to give you some stats that really are more realistic in terms of what premiums would look like. And if we had a flat premium, say at a captive level, what that would be. And we'll also give you some information on the higher end claims, because a captive carrier would have to charge a whole lot of money uh, to, if, if we're having an, uh, you know, basically an uninsured kind of lawyer pool, that carriers would charge a whole lot of money to insure those lawyers, simply because lawyers cost a lot of money to defend their claims and they cost a lot of money. If, if they do have liability and there's a frequency issue or a severity issue, they're going to cost a lot of money. Yeah, so it's not obviously just the fact that California has a lot more numbers. It's the risk profile. The risk profile is completely different. Yes. And there is no, I think earlier Judge Colhane referred to it, there is no California lawyer. Lawyers made up by a multiple ethnicity, multiple areas of practice. We have, you know, you've got the whole ITEC boom and the IDOT move boom in San Jose, whereas in San Diego you have immigration booming because of its location. And two different areas of practice, different risk profiles, nonetheless all in the same pool of insurers. Kathy? Um, it's a great, great bunch of presentations. Congratulations to everybody who put that together. Really helpful and interesting today. Um, um, several random thoughts. I'll try to organize them quickly here. Okay. One before I forget. Here's one thing I'm struggling with, and maybe people can help educate me. It's uh, when we look at the aggregate numbers of attorneys in California who do have no practice insurance. Um, we're still looking at roughly 80 percent. Some, you know, 80. So clearly, in our current open market system in California, we have had the ability to. Um, insure those lawyers, and, there, and, and presumably a lot of the examples that you just gave, Kathy, that we already insure some, a lot of those kind of people. And so I, I, I guess I struggle a little bit with we create this um, uh, 
and the concern that, oh, you know, we have, we're to have mandatory insurance, then we'd have to figure all this out. And if I understand the way things currently work, we've already figured it out to a large extent, which is why I think things like the survey about who are the attorneys who have chosen or can't get you know, practice insurance, because they're the only unknown factor here. I mean, that, right, because they're not insured. So, but for the most part, we have managed this. Um, so I, that's just a thing I struggle with, which is that we I thought this would be such a big deal to suddenly insure all these lawyers. We already are insuring 80% of them, it seems to me. Um, I'm going to shift gears and just rattle off my random thoughts, and I'm happy to be better educated here. Um, one thing that jumped out at me, especially listening to New Jersey and Nevada, um, is the role of um, our State Department of Insurance. Because Nevada and, and New Jersey had very different experiences, but in both of the, their presentations, they talked about the um, gaps, to some extent, and fully understanding the breadth and depth and the details and the cost and the claims data and all that, because they're, um, I believe New Jersey said that the insurers were not regulated by the state of New Jersey. Um, Nevada, it was regulated, um, but that somehow that, um, this will be here in his presentation, that hadn't, the Department of Insurance, whatever it looks like in Nevada, hadn't been leveraged to some extent to help get us some of the data that we need. So one of the things that I would like to suggest that we do, California does regulate malpractice insurance insurers. I've been in touch informally um, with that office. I've worked with them over the years on various things. And I think that they would welcome a letter from this working group asking them to provide information. How many carriers are there? What's the claims data that they can share with us? Um, uh, those kinds of things. And so I want to make sure that we don't lose, you know, at this early stage of developing information, that we don't lose the opportunity to reach out to our own Department of Insurance, who, as I said, have indicated they would respond favorably to an inquiry from from the group. Um, and then my last, my, my last thought that, that occurs to me whenever I hear a discussion of the disclosure requirements is, is to posit the question, what is the purpose of the disclosure? Is it to motivate the attorney to get insurance? Or is the purpose of the disclosure to actually provide meaningful information to a client? And a lot of the discussion in the data, some of the data that we have talks about um, that disclosure requirement did improve the rates of insurance. So we know that's a, we know that's a, a result of disclosure. But for me, um, I think it's equally important to look at the disclosure requirement as a tool for informing the client that they're about to make an important decision um, that may impact um, uh, the the, the, the ultimate, you know, accommodation of whatever their issue and problem is, and be clear with them that there's that there's access to some redress if something goes wrong. And the focus group that Nevada shared was fascinating. I mean, to me, that's exactly what we what we think intuitively that we know, which is consumers don't understand this stuff. They don't. They, they're not going to read those disclosures. They don't understand them when they do read them. Um, they're not going to go look online. The, the group that we're talking about, and so. Um, Nevada's um, presentation that talked about consumers in that focus group actually thinking it would be a bad thing if, um, if their lawyers had no practice insurance because it must be an indicator that something could go wrong or, or that they're bad insurance. That was fascinating to me. So what it does is, you know, as we try to scrape together um, disparate and, and um, not entirely um, complete data, um, for me, that confirmed my own instinct as a, as a consumer advocate, um, that consumers don't understand this. And so, and we, as we do our work, I think that we need to answer that question. If, and whoever the disclosure group people are, is the purpose to get guys and ladies to sign up, or is it genuinely to inform consumers? And we need to know what the purpose is. And if it's to inform consumers, you know, I'm going to be hard to convince that it um, is useful. I don't think consumers get it, they don't understand it, they don't read things like that, they don't know what they mean anyway. But, but maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe the real purpose is to get 
lawyers to sign up, and there seems to be some indication that it's successful, if that, if that is the purpose. Thank you for tolerating my random stream of consciousness. No, all, <laughs> all, all great thoughts. Um, and just one on the statistics, you, you mentioned 80%. You know, that number may be more like 70% and maybe more like 60% if you believe the 39% that we saw on the uh, the sole practitioners without insurance on the on the recent survey, and that's again why I say these numbers are going to carry carry some weight if they continue to be consistent with that. That's going to be seen as in whoever it is that's looking at this down the road as a as a verification that there's this phenomena is real and has been sustained for a number of years. Huh? I think first of all, I think I think we need to be careful with numbers in general. Mm -hmm. Offset the costs of 
those expensive attorneys to ensure at the same time that the insurance person is going to be Yeah, I think that was one of my important takeaways from the last presentation is that you know this may take a little bit more of an imaginative approach maybe that maybe the market bears those costs and uh, uh, especially if you're a captive model, if there's a way to you know keep legal service costs down or at least recognize that uh, there's a benefit to, to insurance options that would be available to them that suit both needs. And I think that was really poignant when, um, is it Robert or Bob Hill from New Jersey, and he, he made that point pretty clearly that it seemed to him that it was, it was those industry attorneys of color and the, those serving at-risk populations that were going to be harmed by, or be by by mandating insurance. And I just think it's really important for us to really get real hard data. Who is it and how many is it who are not insured? And, um, you know, I think Heather's idea was perfect. If we put it on the, if we put it on our dues list, then we'll know where do they live? <laughs> you know, what is their practice area? We know, we know a lot of things if they're not insured. And just a zip code alone would tell us a lot. Well, that's, uh, that's obviously the, the, the struggle, the shortcoming of, of surveys or, or, any, or in any, you know, attempt to collect bona fide information is, uh, is that, you know, you want to you have the most accurate and updated information, you know, something that goes along with the, with the uh, dues bill like it does in other states and say, are you insured or not? You know, and it's mandatory that you answer this. Obviously, that's going to be pretty accurate information. Um, so, so just just to just to nudge the dead horse a little bit, not necessarily beat it. Um, I'm going to preface my comment by saying I barely passed statistics in undergrad, <laughs> um, and I, I I would prefer to hear from the professional statistic, statisticians as to their methodology and how or why it works or doesn't work than all of us are expecting all due respect to, to Connie, right? Because you went from saying we can't rely on this, you know, on this survey to, to making a generaliz generalization based on the one person who backed up their credit card and um, forego their medical insurance, right? So I think we have to be really careful when we're talking about the work that, that the statisticians have done with the survey to figure out, okay, well, did they pick 25,000 people for a reason and then of that 25,000 is the 6% statistic, you know, does that really mean something? So that should be easy enough for us to, and well, no it wouldn't require a meeting necessarily, it might even just be an email, like, here's my methodology and here's how it stacks up against other generally accepted, you know, methodologies for surveys. There's also a difference between the statistics side of it and the social science side of it, right? I mean, so there's what's statistically significant and there's whether a question was crafted with all the social science behind it to know that you're not accidentally skewing the result. So, yes, I agree the methodology would be interesting. It, it seems like we did craft those questions kind of um, yeah. internally. No, no. But, I mean, we do have to be a little careful that the questions were phrased in a good way. And right. I, I mean, the PhD. I don't know whether the PhDs were in that side of it or the <coughs> numbers side of it, because there are two pieces of it. Yep. Yeah. I mean, with any question, you have to say, well, is this a question that's going to be apt uh, to getting somebody responding to it in a, in a positive way, or is it going to, in other words, the statistics going to be. Uh, unreliable because what what you're getting is people for in this circumstance who want to say I don't have insurance and, and it's a badge of honor and I'm proud not to have it because I'm a libertarian or whatever and so you're getting a, a higher incidence of those hits rather than which I wouldn't think would be the case necessarily versus you know somebody who's going to say I don't want to answer that question at all. Well even the order in which they appear sure. is important because sometimes they could if questions come first that turn you off, maybe you don't finish the survey, but other questions, I mean, it's pretty complicated, I think. Right. I, and, what, and, and I want to get everybody have a chance to weigh in this. What, where I sort of anticipated this conversation to go and maybe a way where we end up today <laughs> at 4 o'clock is I'm going to ask two questions. That is, do you think that there's a, a problem here? And 
that can start with, do we have lots of uninsured lawyers in California, and is that creating a circumstance where we have this undesirable result of there are victims of uninsured lawyers out there? And, and that, I think, probably sits at the heart of all these questions. Probably the first question the Board of Governors of the legislature can ask is, what are we responding to? What's the issue here? And, and I think they may think that there's a big issue here, but I think that somebody put me in front of them tomorrow, they say, what are, are we just you know, sort of chasing a non-existent problem here or not? So I, I'd love to hear from everybody on, on that, whether today or as a you know, sort of a series of, of uh, thoughts about, about that, because that's, that's, to me, the heart of the issue. So anyway, other, uh, Judge. Well, I have three, hopefully, short things. Uh, one, uh, have we exhausted all the possibilities of going back to the actuary to get that detailed survey from 1987 that Judge Coleman mentioned. Have you read an actuarial report? No. <laughs> I've read some in the past, but I mean, I'm, I'm joking. No, it's, I know. It's an ongoing but, uh, criticism. But I mean, three years of data looking at California, you know, and I mean, the thing about the survey, I certainly don't have yeah. a statistical background, but we do have one, good people doing it. Two, it doesn't sound very different than what the 1987 survey found. And is anybody really surprised by the numbers? I mean, I, I didn't hear anything shocking about that. Of course, there are a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of lawyers in California. It would be surprising that there weren't a fair number of uninsured solos, given not only what we found in 87, but what other states have found. We have been second, chasing this mythical beast for 20 or 30 years as to how do we how do we capture the accurate information? But I don't think this whole exercise really has quantified the harm. I mean, we're all assuming, and it's probably true, but that uninsured lawyers are causing harm more than insured lawyers are. And uh, it may not be an unreasonable assumption given solos have more claims than uh, others, and there are some areas like family law and estate planning that are especially high risk where you get a lot of one-time clients. Um, but uh, do we really know how much harm is being caused? I mean, I think that was the point of the 87 exercise about unpaid judgments. Uh, and a captive may be good or maybe not, but it seems like there are a lot of very indirect ways to try and solve a problem that we haven't really quantified what it is. And I don't know if the problem's only low-income clients or middle-income or even higher income, too, from this group of people. Because a number of the solo, uh, I think larger firm clients tend to be more repeaters of uh, their general history than people going to see a lawyer for the first time. And that may be the overall biggest target group that's at risk. Yeah. Heather. I think your comments are a great one, a great comments, Judge Perkins. And I just, I guess I'll share, since we don't have any data on the harm, I'll share my anecdotal overview. Um, you know, Randy and I and Glenn have, um, practiced in this space for decades. Um, so, you know, it may be that we have the best data out there just because we've seen it. So this, you can take it or leave it because it's anecdotal only, but I will, I've seen a lot of uninsured lawyers and I'll, I'll share what I've seen in, in an overview. And I don't think the insurers see it as much as we see it because the uninsured lawyers come to us. They come to people like Glenn and me and Randy for representation if they're sued. And in my experience, they fall into two categories. There are people who are, um, they may have, they're always small firm solo practitioners, always. They may be, um, not always, 95 to 98% of the time. There are certain instances in which um, larger law firms have gaps in coverage due to a poor management of their malpractice policies. But generally, small firm solo practitioners, category one are people who tend to have, again, more sophisticated, organized practices, and they've made a calculated decision 
that they do, they do not want to carry malpractice insurance because of the low uh, risk of their particular practice area and the financial analysis. They actually add up what they would spend on premiums and decide that it would be cheaper to defend that one claim when that one claim comes during their career. And those people tend to be able to um, hire somebody like me, Glenn, or Randy, and they probably have the ability to engage in a settlement. Uh, the other category of uninsured lawyers, which is much more prevalent in my, um, at least in my experience, is the small firm solo practitioner who is struggling with his or her practice, and they don't have the money to pay the premium. Um, that is why they don't carry malpractice insurance. And oftentimes, the, that inability to pay the premium is accompanied by a certain level of disorganization in the practice. Um, and these people will be unable to afford a defense, and they will be unable to pay a judgment because they couldn't even pay a couple of thousand dollars for malpractice insurance. Um, and then I would say out of that body of people uh, who don't carry it, um, I've seen the claims against them. And you know, in my experience, 50% of all the malpractice claims are pure frivolity in California, pure, unadulterated frivolity. Um, and probably 25%, and I see Glenn nodding, you know, I'm sure anybody who practices in this area would, would have similar statistics, but probably 25% have some merit to them. So, you know, you're talking about, you know, at least 25% of the claims against this uninsured demographic that, that have merit. And uh, those particular consumers won't be able to recover for the malpractice. So if there is a problem, that's where the problem lies, in my experience. So what is that? You could do some, some rough math, um, you know, based on the statistics presented to us by Chris, you know, 17,000 uninsured small firm solo practitioners. Uh, how many are you going to get with claims? What is that 25%? It's probably not an outrageous number, in my opinion. There probably aren't a whole lot of people with meritorious malpractice claims who face this uninsured lawyer who is unable to satisfy a judgment. Um, but when it happens, I've seen it, it's, it's pretty devastating on these people. So, you know, the other way to look at it, um, and again, I'm not espousing mandatory malpractice insurance to be sure at this point, but just discussing it. The other way to look at it is just a public confidence issue, um, you know, regardless of the enormity of the problem, whether carrying malpractice insurance is, is, instills confidence in the public that retains services especially in light of the fact that the vast majority of the public seems to think it's already mandatory. So those are some, you know, my anecdotal observations for your consideration. I'm, I'm glad you added that second point because I didn't want to get caught up in the notion that, you know, we, the, the problem is only that we've got a bunch of victims out there and people that aren't getting compensated for lawyers failing to comply with the standard of care because, you know, sort of the, the, the higher view of that is, is there's a there's a greater good argument in there someplace, and there's a there's some honor to the profession that we step up and we perceive in a positive way. I don't I hesitate to call those intangibles, but those are things that are less directly related to, you know, we want to make sure that people are compensated when a lawyer screws up. There's that part of it. I think there's there's a lot of other reasons why the profession would look at this problem and say, we need to dress ourselves in the right way. So I, I throw that out there because I didn't want to get too focused on the problem being, you know, victims. So, go ahead. So you having said that, I'm going to go immediately back to victim. Just to throw you a curveball. <laughs> okay. And one of the things I find interesting about this discussion is if you have something like, you know, no replacement cost advice for homeowners and their homes burned down, you have consumer organizations that are pretty active saying, you know, look at all these victims, look at all the problems that have been generated by this. Do we have any evidence of that at all? Do we have anybody out there in the consumer community saying there are too many uninsured lawyers, look at these judgments that never got satisfied? Has there ever been any sort of movement that we've ever been able to track? I think the answer to this is going to be no, but, you know, in a lot of other venues like insurance and, and there certainly are consumer movements about perceived problems, and I just wonder if we mind that piece of the equation. Well, that, I think that's that's one of the big pieces that we, we perhaps each of us need, and maybe as a group ultimately need to think about how we identify that. I mean, another viewpoint is 
Well, we're at a relatively clear sailing now. You know, there's not a bunch of, you know, nuns that have been, you know, that were annihilated in the crosswalk and then their lawyer committed malpractice and that hits the headlines uh, of the newspaper and we all look like a bunch of thugs. Uh, so stay ahead of that. I and mean, look what happened to the insurance agents and brokers that sold policies that were represented to cover the Oakland fires, including your house, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, appraisers that were put at the heart of the financial crisis of 2008. You know, so one would think that there might be some merit to staying ahead of that issue uh, while while the seas are, are calm. Would be one one viewpoint. Ruben, do we know if the state bar collects any data? on the disciplinary side that could be informative to this discussion? Um, because we've, we've got years and years of that stuff, right? Mm. Libby Katz have given us some data on our committee about uh, Business and Professions Code 6086. Could you share that, Linda, with the group? About? About how carriers have to report claims that are being tendered and uninsured judgments are supposed to be recorded by the court and the lawyers. And they're not. And, they're and not. she has no statistics. <laughs> they're not reporting. Report. And I, asked, and I asked our Office of Trial Counsel if there's data about when people make complaints, if that includes um, issues about malpractice in terms of, well, if, if it includes issues of malpractice. Right. And they, when someone, when someone files a complaint against an attorney and it really is essentially a malpractice issue, it's not pursued by our Office of Chief Trial Counsel, they don't take statistics on that, on that level of the reason for it the case not being um, pursued. pursued. They don't say it was it's about practice. And they basically and say that there's no basis for disciplinary action. But separate and apart is the statutory scheme of 6086 where carriers report malpractice claims. So there's another part where courts are supposed to report uh, that. And then lawyers are supposed to report that. And she, gave, I think she said there was like three from there the were, courts. There were 253, I think, last year reports from insurers of malpractice. Yeah, because we're claim. required to report them. But in the past, I think since 2000, how long have I been mm -hmm. to, uh, going back to at least 2013, there are zero reports from attorneys about uh, And three from the board. Three from the board. Yes. Right. So I, I the 253 from insurers would be ones where they were insured that they were excluded? No, no it's just filed. reporting of claims. We give them border road claims. Oh, I thought claims. you were saying um, uninsured. Okay. No, it's, it's yeah. actual claims against lawyers, but nothing is done with that information. And then if you are if you have an unsatisfied judgment, I guess you're supposed to report it under 6086. They have zero reports from lawyers. And then the courts are supposed to report, uh, I think it's unsatisfied judgments under 6086. And I think you told us there were three reports from the court. I, I think it's beyond unsatisfied judgments. Isn't it, isn't it an uh, uninsured attorney settles you're supposed to voluntarily report? I believe that's the lawyer supposed to report that. Yeah. Well, that's a mandatory. And, yeah, that's a mandatory. And zero people have done that. It's and and clearly that happens all the time. So there's, there's a mechanism, but no one's reporting it. I don't know what they do, what, what the stats you do have. But yeah, I think that this is sort of, you know, Glenn, to your question about where is the hue and cry from the public interest community and the consumer community, well, I think one of the things that you had, you know, we've discovered here in these discussions is that there's lots of potential um, sources of a lot of potentially valuable information, and it seems like a lot of those don't work very well. And so, um, we, you know, and so whether or not, and I know that's not really the focus of this group, but maybe, you know, maybe you probably ought to look at the issue that you're raising. You know, is there something that constructive that we can suggest that will generate the kinds of reports from courts and attorneys that are supposed to be reported? And I'll just quickly mention this. I know you want to hear from everybody, but one of the things I've done over the last couple of months is I've reached out to some of the kind of traditional public interest groups and consumer organizations. And what I found, um, and this was not a surprise, um, is that th this is just not an issue that they've taken a look at. It's not that they think it's not a problem. It's an issue that, you know, they're dealing with health care coverage right now and, you know, other issues and organizations prioritize that. I went specifically to some organizations like BedSetic as an example, because I thought, who, who are the organizations that have clients that could be potentially a victim? So we're trying to figure out, is there a victim population or not? And what the response I got was, um, well, we don't have time to engage on that 
we're too busy being in court with our clients. They're client services organizations. And so um, I'm going to continue to nudge around a little bit. But I, I also want to add that some of the great scholarly articles that Linda sent around very early on in our, our discussions, um, um, several of them talked about exactly what we're talking about here today, the difficulty at getting a, an empirical data sort of assessment of this problem, including the number and the, and the, the dollar amount of injury to consumers. The articles that, you know, these were the law school, law legal journal articles, they said to a one that one of the biggest gaps in this discussion is that we don't have adequate input from the public. It doesn't mean there's not a problem. There might not be, but it doesn't mean there isn't a problem. It happens to be a sector of the public interest advocacy community that hasn't um, been developed to focus on this particular potential issue. And maybe they're just waiting for the ones to run down the crosswalk, but I, I <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Um, let me let me make a couple of observations and then, then we'll wrap up. Um, the uh, reference to the articles is great because there are there are articles that are written that uh, I think they probably all observe in one way or another. It's really hard. Thanks, Lisa. Really hard to thanks, Kat. Really hard to recreate or find the statistics. But you know, there's also a lot of other maybe even sort of philosophical reasons why. This is a this is something where there's a need to, to resolve it because clearly something is going on out there. My personal view, it would, I sort of struggle with the idea. Our opening uh, few pages on the report was, yeah, we really didn't really find anything, so you know, we're, we're, you know, please end here and skip right to the end. Uh, we're not going to do that, and, and I and I sort of throw out there, along with a couple other points on speakers for the future, I, and I can't recall all the authors. I read all those articles, and, and some were excellent, really well done uh, by top academics studying this phenomenon and what, what it should be. Um, and so I urge you to, to take a look at those. Maybe there's a speaker that could come and, 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 and talk to us about those other reasons why this is uh, something that we should be tackling. We're charged to tackle it, but I just don't want to have too narrow a viewpoint of focusing on a bunch of statistics about you know, we couldn't really find the problem, so we gave up. Right. It's not exactly what we're doing, obviously. Uh, and then a couple other thoughts on, because they came up today, there were excellent, excellent points on future speakers. One would be uh, the folks from Discipline. Now, when I ran Copley, we had Discipline come with probably once a year, once every couple of years, just to report, because there's such a great overlap. Now, you know, making that discussion meaningful is, is going to be up to the group who sponsors that speaker, uh, but there's great statistics out there and wonderful people within the state bar who actually know this area really, really well. Linda's a great resource for that. And the other one outside the state bar is the, is the Department of Insurance, which I, I, you mentioned. There is no question in my mind we need to have somebody sitting here saying, this is what we're doing, just want to let you know. Uh, and they would say, all right, well, I'm glad you asked because we are obviously going to be part of this at some point if it goes any further. So I throw those out there as ideas not necessarily attached to any group, but maybe these are things that are cross-disciplinary and would relate to everybody. Um, and then I, I wanted to uh, also observe that there's going to be perhaps at least some thought given to the idea of what's our community outreach. We heard others do that now when you're Idaho and you can you know, you can send out a text message that hits every lawyer in the state and, you know, they show up and you can have a nice conversation. That's great. We can't do that in California. So whatever our community, meaning maybe licensee, member, outreach, um, is, is I think, going to be an important part of what we do. Maybe not now when we're sort of in the early stages of this, but when we get into the fall and we start focusing on, especially those of you that are sort of tethered to a particular group, bar associations or small solo and so on, I think there needs to be some um, connection, some some um, engagement with, with those folks, uh, and that, that's going to be a significant issue. Somebody mentioned jury consultants today. I, I don't know about that one, but you know, <laughs> the, the idea of uh, retention of a jury consultant to, and they're great, and, and it's interesting that, that uh, was it you, Chris? I'm, I can't recall. Talking about, no, it was, uh, it was Gene. Okay, we talked about that interesting idea, and there maybe needs to be uh, a uh, further refinement of, of surveys, or maybe even surveys that need to be done around your committee's particular topics. 
Um, and so I wanted to throw that out there in, in food for thought. A couple of takeaways from today. There is great overlap between all of these. I'm really glad we started with the, the open market model in this, primarily because it was organized really well. We had relevant speakers. That's the way you do it. Um, so it's a great way to get us kicked off. Thanks for that, Heather. Uh, and then you can see once we get into it how these issues bleed into each other mandatory insurance versus uh, disclosure. Thanks, Judge. Uh, and uh, uh, so they all overlap. It'll be up to me or us or everybody to meld that together and put it into a cohesive report at the end of the day. Uh, and then I think you also realize that this is what happens here. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Most of our work is going to be done in the, in the off hours in between sessions and so on. So I think, again, this is a great way to kick it off because you can see just by what you experienced here today, that a lot of the work is done between the meetings and then here it's played out and we use our brain power to process all of that. So uh, those were my takeaways from, from the day. And with that, I think we're at uh, 404. Uh, that's exactly where I wanted to end. I didn't want to cut anybody off. Anything else that anybody wanted to say as a closing remark or an observation or a thought to carry home or a, a funny joke? <laughs> Other than Glenn's law practice, so, you know, you know, you know <laughs> or that Northern California, Southern California claims thing. We we'll do. leave that one alone. Yeah. Uh, Linda, anything else before I close up? All right, uh, folks. Just a reminder that uh, next meeting, July 9th in LA, correct? Uh, in Los Angeles, uh, the adequacy and availability ranges of coverage committee will be speaking. And uh, so again, engage with Linda, I, both of us. Uh, Oh, okay. We have a commitment on the January, uh, the July 9th uh, speaker, uh, Robert Feldman, uh, from the Center of Public Interest for Law, coming to do the July 9th meeting. So there you go. So that's a good one. Perfect. Right on time. All right. Thanks, everybody. I know you got plenty to get. Thanks. 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 Th